Chapter 176. Another Enemy. Part 4. I'll help you find my father's legacies. Atain had lived for a long period of time, and as he wandered the world, he left behind traces of himself. In the plane of darkness, they considered these marks to be holy, and they desperately tried to acquire them. At that time, I during the time when my wife died, I had already achieved something big. However, I became a fugitive before I could give my report. What did you achieve? I found my father's secret lab. That is most definitely a big deal. Azel was surprised. It wasn't uncommon for a magician to create a secret lab. The secret lab was hidden even from allies. Such locations possessed powerful defensive system, and they remained in existence even after the death of the magician. Many of the ruins Azel had discovered were of this variety. When we searched his castle for hints on how to dispel the curse, we found nothing. Maybe, the data was placed within this secret lab. After the Dragon Demon War had ended, Carlos constantly worked to find a way to dispel Azel's curse. He searched Atain's resident and lab. He tried to find clues regarding the curse, but in the end, the search had been fruitless. It was plausible that Atain had placed his important documents in a secret lab, where not even his allies knew about it. Sybane continued to speak. I'm not sure how my father was able to use that place during the war. He probably used the Great Darkness. It probably allowed him to use the lab irregardless of where his body was. That is my guess. I want to say that it sounds impossible, but, if it is my father, you think he could pull it off? Yes. Aside from his battle capabilities, Atain could seemingly do everything. Both the allied forces of the humans and the Dragon Demon King's army believed this to be true. It was the reason why the Dragon Demon King became deified after his death. Sybane spoke. Anyways, my father left behind a diary. He had recorded it a week before he met his end at the Dragonhorn Fortress. The content of the diary became the decisive factor that pushed Sybane to give up on everything. Sybane saw despair inside a Tyne's diary. My father didn't love us. At the same time, his love for us was boundless. Is this a riddle? No. I'm just telling you the truth as it is. There are two divergent opinions within the plane of darkness in regards to the death of my father. I heard it from Laura. After Atain started the Dragon Demon War, it was said that he realized he had made the wrong choice. However, it was already too late to turn back. By dying against me, he gained a chance to correct the wrong. His intent was interpreted liberally by his followers. What if that's the truth? Sybane asked him the question. Azul's expression turned peculiar. Do you really think that is an appropriate question to ask me? No, this is exactly why I'm asking you that question. You were the last one to fight my father, and you were the one that ended his life. Him. Azel thought for a brief moment before he spoke. It sounds like pure nonsense. At the very least, I don't think Atain went into the fight wanting to lose. If that was true, I would have won much more easily. Is that so? At the very least, you don't think father went into the battle thinking about abandoning us. Even after hearing my answer, it seems you haven't changed the overall premise of your view. At Azel's question, Sybane nodded his head. Azel, do you know the ideals that had led my father to create the Dragon Demon Army? Do you know why he started the Dragon Demon War? I have a rough idea. Before the Dragon Demon War started, the Dragon Demons were affiliated with any human nations. They were usually autonomous powers. Some opposed the human nations, and others took root in locations where they were free of human influence. Atain needed a very long time before he was able to ascend into the Dragon Demon King's seat with the Dragon Demon Generals. The Dragon Demon War had lasted for a long time, but the preparation leading up to that war was several times longer. At times, Atain spoke about his ideals to persuade his opponents. At times, he used his martial abilities to subjugate his opponents. Then there were times when he gained support by trading away secret magic techniques. On other occasions, he solved problems present in his opponent's life. He was able to create an enormous cooperation system. The marriage to my mother and my birth was part of that process. It was akin to what the ruling class of the humans did. He brought in allies by establishing blood ties. 
This was how Atane was able to form the Dragon Demon King's army. He did it, because he needed power to fight and conquer the world. He first needed the control of the world to create the ideal world. Everything was based on his belief in the Dragon Demon race. It was the belief that Dragon Demons would be able to become better rulers than humans. It was true that Dragon Demons possessed powerful body and Dragon Demon magic. They possessed higher intelligence and longer lifespan. From a human's perspective, Dragon Demons were closest to being the ideal being. Atain thought the same, and he believed in the potential of the Dragon Demon race. Dragon Demons are born with great inborn abilities, and on average, they possess much more intelligence than humans. That is why they will be able to control their desires in the pursuit of the ideal state. Before the Dragon Demon War, the Dragon Demons were dispersed all over the world. Tribal societies were the limit of social organization created by TGE Dragon Demons. If the gathering of Dragon Demons were large, they governed over the humans as the ruling class. They possessed longevity and ability. It was inevitable that these characteristics were valued in small societies. Moreover, the dragon demons weren't that much different from the human rulers in such a society. The humans trusted the dragon demons since they were superior beings. The dragon demons expected the humans to work for them as a given right. During the dragon demon war, the attitude of the dragon demons in Demon King's army wasn't influenced by Atain. It arose from a pre-existing mindset. Atain had trusted in the dragon demons after seeing how they behaved. It was, because he had hoped that the members of his race had the potential to act based on reason. However, my father despaired as he conducted the dragon demon war. Maybe it started before the war started. He taught his allies about his ideals. However, they didn't change. Of course, some understood and accepted what Atain was saying. However, if one looked at it from a macro view, most members used his words to justify their actions. In truth, most of their behaviors and actions hadn't changed at all. When I read the contents of my father's diary, it was clear that he didn't expect anything from us. He realized that he had been wrong in believing that dragon demons had the potential to act in a rational and reasonable manner. When he reached this conclusion, he started searching for another solution. Dragon demons were the same as humans. They were both limited by the same intrinsic flaws. Even if they possessed better physique and intellect, it didn't make the character of the dragon demons. They were the progeny between dragons and humans. However, their thought process was way too similar to humans. Azel furrowed his brows as he asked his question. The story is getting long. So what was his conclusion? In truth, I'm not too interested in hearing about the hopes and despair of an idealist like Atain. Since you are acquainted with him, I thought you would be curious. That might be true. However, I'm not curious about Atain's thoughts and feelings. I just want information that'll allow me to predict his future moves. A magician or a historian would have been burning to hear this story, but Azel was apathetic. I heard such stories as I traveled here. Shit. So what? He had to avoid and block the imminent flood that was coming towards him. Everyone else seemed to be focused on eliminating the flood that might happen in the future. Why do people like viewing things in the macro view? Azel spoke. Let me try to summarize it. Atain was. He tried to create an ideal society by conquering the world. He realized it was an absolutely stupid idea, so he started preparing another plan. When he revives, he'll carry out the plan he had prepared. Am I correct? Moreover, the information you are going to give me is a Tyne's plan. You are good at summarizing information. You are correct. Just tell me the plan. Azel, do you believe humans can build the characters of other humans? Why are you deflecting again? Azel became irritated, but Sybane remained calm. I need to tell you this story. All right, I'll try to summon a little bit more patience. The answer to that question. I believe it is possible to do it individually, but I don't think it can be done to the entirety of humanity. That is what I'm trying to get at. Humans do not trust each other. This was why laws were put in place and there are mechanisms to protect those laws. People can be confident in such a system if there is a power that can enforce such laws. However, 
People used weak points in such a system to bring about all kinds of wickedness. Are you trying to describe the base nature of humans? I don't like it, but I'll agree with you for now. So what does that have to do with the story you were going to tell me? In the end, father thought dragon demons were like humans. Him, he needed to make a method that'll enforce his ideal system. So, Azel scratched his head. You aren't talking about normal policy and laws, right? That's right. I don't know the exact details, but father had been preparing a method that would enforce the world to follow the ideal system he came up with. Azel was at a loss for words. The character of the individual members didn't matter. This method would force everyone to follow laws set by Atene. Is that really possible? This is beyond crazy. This is something that can only be thought up by a madman. It might be possible if one was talking about an individual or a small group. It required a lot of surveillance and coercion. He wanted to pull this off against the whole world. How is that possible? It was absolutely impossible. However, the one that wanted to solve this problem was Atain. Cybern spoke. I think it is absolutely impossible. But if it is my father. You are having the same thoughts as me. Right. We are of like mind then. I'm leaning towards the opinion that it'll be possible for my father to pull it off. The evidence is in the records left behind in my father's diary. What is it? The being that re-established the relationship between the humans and the dragons was him. It was my father. For a brief moment, Azel was struck dumb. Sybane had a bitter smile on his face as he spoke. Well, can you understand why I think it is possible for my father to pull this off? Chapter 177. Another Enemy. Part 5. It was a night where the cloudy sky obscured the moonlight. Reishu stood on top of the cliff, and he was facing the wind blowing in from the ocean. His gaze was fixed on a point beyond the dark ocean. He had been standing there for an hour. It was as if he was meditating. Azel approached him. What are you doing? Do you think the world is different across the ocean? I was fantasizing about it. Rishu didn't show any signs of surprise. He turned around as he answered Azel. When Rishu fully turned around, Azel spoke. I'm sure it is the same as this place. It is a world where humans live. There might not be any humans living there. Then it is an animal kingdom. I guess so. Rishu snickered. Azel asked him a question. How are the two of them progressing? It had already been over a month since Chiron and Leticia had started learning the dragon soul from Rishu. While the two of them were going through enormous amount of hardship, it wasn't as if the other members of the party had been playing around. Laura and Euron exchanged techniques with the residents of the forest. On top of that, they brainstormed ways to increase their skills through the conversations they had with Alberton. Azel took inventory of the powers he regained, and he trained on how to best use these powers. They're about here. Rishu pointed towards his neck. Azel spoke. Are they still at the brink? They've been at that state for the past week. They are strong in terms of dragon demon magic, and they are quite skilled in manipulating it too. It'll happen soon, whether they can awaken the dragon's soul or not. It all starts from there. I see. Why are you so hesitant? Did you hear something? Rishu ignored the context of the conversation as he suddenly threw out a question. Azel became silent. Rishu once again looked towards the night ocean, and he started to speak words that had nothing to do with the questions he asked. I don't know how it looks like from your perspective, but you are like a remnant of a very old memories for me. It was as if you were frozen and plucked out of that era. I am awestruck every time I see you. You probably don't know this. You don't know how surprised I was when I saw you. Still, I can relate. As a dragon demon, I've gone into a long hibernation before. In the past 220 years, I've only hibernated once. I slept for 20 years. The world changed a lot in that time. The fact that I lost the chance to see the change almost filled me with resentment. You are almost the same as your past self, as L. However, I've changed. Even I think I've changed into a completely different person. You really have changed. Azel let out a sigh. After coming to this place, he hadn't conversed much with Rishu. The emotion he felt towards Rishu was much more complicated than the emotions he felt for Sybane. His era had become the distant past, 
and he was happy to find someone that remembered him for who he was in the past. However, at the same time, Rishu made him uncomfortable, since his presence hammered home the fact that time had passed. From Azul's perspective, Rishu had been a friend that he had deep insight into. However, the current Rishu wasn't the one he remembered, and Azel couldn't tell what he was thinking now. Rishu spoke. However, it seems you came here to talk about a more difficult subject. Did you develop an ability to read the mind of others? After teaching so many people, I'm able to get a measure of their thoughts. Geez, Azel couldn't help but laugh. As expected, this wasn't the Rishu he knew. Rishu spoke. If you are having a hard time getting your words out, you can talk to me at a later time. At the very least, you have some time left before you have to leave this place. No, once I start putting this off, I'll keep putting it off indefinitely. I'll just speak. Speak. Rishu, are you my enemy? Azel firmed his resolve, and he threw his question out there. Rishu became silent. The night ocean produced sounds of waves, and it was the only sound that broke the silence. After being silent for a long time, Rishu let out a bitter laugh as he asked the question. Why do you think that? It isn't something I came up with. Then who? Saibane said so. He said you might be my enemy. He did. Why would he think that? Rishu was puzzled. However, Rishu wasn't denying Azel's words either. Azel spoke. He said he found a Tyne's secret lab. A Tyne's diary was there. So that's how it is. However, the diary should deal with events before the Dragon Demon War. The fact that Atain made an offer to you was in there. Saibane had provided two pieces of information. I believe Rishu Nim is working with my father. He had a hard time believing in that story. However, he felt too uneasy at the prospect of not checking up on the information. He had to see if the information was true. That was why he had firmed his resolve, and he came here to ask Rishu about it. Moreover, you shouldn't underestimate Saibane. I mocked him by calling him the Simpleton Prince, but he is the son of Atain. Saibane was one of the top high-ranking magicians within the Dragon Demon King's army. He had also possessed one of the highest-ranked dragon weapon called the Book of Darkness. The only reason why he was called the Simpleton Prince was the fact that he couldn't translate his prodigious talent into victories on the battlefield. Azel spoke. Saibane found out that you were connected to the Great Darkness. He used this fact as basis to guess that you've accepted a Tyne's offer. I see. I did underestimate him too much. When did it start? Azel's face hardened as he asked the question. He could tell by Rishu's reaction that Saibane's information was correct. Rishu sighed. If I'm to be precise, I accepted an alliance around 50 years ago. Therefore, it was around the end of the Great Darkness. Atain is dead. He is supposed to revive in the future. So how were you able to make an alliance? Did you really think Atain could do nothing until he's revived? It was a story of deep import. Azel felt his chest constrict. Rishu spoke. I can't give you the details of the alliance, but him. Could you retract your killing intent for now, Azel? It is true that there is a high probability that I might become your enemy. You struck an alliance with Atain. How could you not be my enemy? What if Atain has no intent on joining with those that deified him? What if he has no plan on fighting against humanity? At his words, Azel was momentarily at a loss for words. He had never thought about this possibility. When the dragon demon king Atain was revived, he had naturally assumed Atain would lead the remnant of his army. Azel had assumed Atain would bring about misfortune to the world. Rishu shrugged his shoulders. It isn't as if I know the entirety of Atain's plan. Moreover, I cannot tell you the parts one know either. However, if we do become enemies, it would only be after Atain is revived. We won't know until Atain makes his move. Am I not right? Him. I'll say this as your friend. I won't be your enemy before Atain is revived. I won't do anything that will harm you. At his words, Azel looked in Rishu's eyes. From within the darkness, Azel could see Rishu look at him with plaintive eyes. For a long time, silence flowed between them. Azel met Rishu's eyes as he pushed down his surging emotions. Azel shook his head from side to side. All right, I'll trust you. Thank you. Speak. 
Why did you make such a choice? That is. Rishu let out a bitter laugh as he spoke. The world treats well those that are greedy and evil. On the other hand, they are cruel to those that are selfless and good. Atain knew that I would leave this forest to learn about humans, so he gave me an offer. He said he would create a world where the powerless and good people could live happily. At the time, Rishu couldn't comprehend what he was talking about. Atain had beaten him, so why was he spouting such nonsense? However, Atain had not been speaking to the present Rishu. He was making an offer to Rishu in the future. It didn't matter how long it took. Atain knew there would come a day when Resu would understand his words. When he despaired at the world created by the humans, he would come to Atain for help. That time came. When the great darkness arrived, Rishu had been wandering the world. It truly was a horrible era. Everything that humans believed to be of worth was destroyed. The world was filled with fear and despair instead of trust, love and hope. Do you know who Sage Bayon is? Of course. When Bayon's name was suddenly brought up, Azel was taken aback. Why was Rishu bringing up that name? How much do you know about him? Azel put together what he saw from the history books with the stories he heard from Chiron to answer Rishu's question. When he heard Azel's story, Rishu spoke with a dark expression on his face. I see. I never knew Chiron and Bayon were connected in that way. Rishu let out a bitter laugh. He had no idea Chiron was the Duke of Taranto's. This was why he had no idea there had been a tie between Bayon and Chiron. Bayon was a truly amazing person. For a while, I watched over him. Bayon traveled to extremely dangerous regions to find a cure for the plague brought on by the Great Darkness. This was why Rishu had traveled with Bayon to protect him. When the medical association was established, I thought he no longer needed my services. That is why I left him. After ten years, I found out that he was assassinated. He was assassinated. Officially, he went missing when the medical association was starting to run smoothly. In truth, he was assassinated. The temple sent assassins after him. Azel was struck dumb. Bayon had put his life on the line to save humanity from despair. He had saved them, yet they used such a disgusting method to kill Bayon. It was an unforgivable act. However, the general population were clueless of this fact. They didn't know that the priests hated Bayon for taking their power away from them. They were worshippers of God, yet they committed the heinous act. The power held by the temples bottomed out when the great darkness came. The monopoly on the healing arts by the temples were broken by Bayon, and the medial association was established. Instead of priests, healers were being educated. There were no paths available for the priests to regain their former power and authority. The high-ranking priests, who once held the world in their hands, harbored hatred for Bayon. It was an extremely crooked grudge. They held hatred for Bayon every time they looked at their own downfall. In the end, it resulted in the assassination of Bayon. That incident spurred me on to accept Atain's offer of alliance. When he found out the truth behind Bayon's death, Rishu became grief-stricken. He had never felt such grief before. He had witnessed too many humans repay good with evil. If one strove to be good in life, it didn't mean it would bring happiness. If one lived an evil life, it didn't mean one would live a life of misfortune. The world was fundamentally wrong. However, he had no idea how to fix such a world. I thought, maybe, Atain had a solution, and Atain already had an answer prepared for me. What was the solution? I cannot say. When Atain revives, you will find out. Him. Azel thought about bringing up the information he heard from Saibane in an attempt to press Rishu for more information. However, he realized his attempt would be fruitless. All right, thanks for the story. I'll delay dealing with our relationship. Are you going to continue training Chiron and Leticia in developing the dragon soul? Will you watch over them? Of course. Once I taken in a pupil, I take responsibility. I'll trust you. After speaking those words, Azel turned around. A bitter smile appeared on Rishu's lips as he watched Azel's back. Chapter 178. The End of the Wait. Part 1. Regus was taken aback. What the hell is this? He had never seen this place before. He had no idea why he was here. 
He had no memories that could give context to what he was seeing. Did someone manipulate my mind? Could someone who could do that to him really exist? Soon, he decided to give up on such train of thought. He hated thinking about complicated thoughts. If he found something he didn't like, he would just smash it. Rain was falling hard outside, and the old door swayed back and forth in the dark room. It produced a harsh sound to the ears. Regus could see through the darkness as if it was daytime. The sight in front of his eyes was horrifying. The humans, who had been alive and talking only moments before, had turned into gruesome corpses. None of the corpses were whole, and an incredible amount of blood had painted the interior of the building. In the midst of this scene, a girl was collapsed on the ground. She was letting out a tortured moan. Regus had approached her before he knew it, and at the same time, he realized one thing. Is this a dream? He wasn't there. His body wasn't present. He could only watch the scene from a certain point of view. Was he under the influence of a magic that caused hallucination? Or maybe he was having a bad dream? The girl continued to be in pain. Regus realized that the girl was dying. She was the only one alive in this horrible scene, but that distinction would become useless soon. Her body wouldn't be able to survive its mangled state. I was a step too late. So this is the reason why I regained consciousness. At that moment, he suddenly heard a calm voice. Regus flinched in surprise. It wasn't, because he hadn't been able to sense the owner of the voice approaching them. This person hadn't tried to hide his presence, so Regus was able to hear his approaching footsteps in the hallway. The part that made Regus surprised was the voice itself. Atain. It was the voice of a man that he couldn't forget even in a dream. Soon, the man revealed himself. He was camouflaged as a human. His horns, ears and dragon demon stone was hidden with magic. However, Regus recognized him. His long black hair looked as if it was made out of jade. His eyes had a faraway look, and his face was blank. The man was Atain. Who? The girl gasped in pain as she asked the question. She raised her head from the ground, and her pupils weren't focused. Atain spoke. We've met a long time ago. I'm Atain, the dragon demon king. That is what they call me now. How? It was unclear as to what the girl was asking. However, Atain immediately understood what she was asking. I heard what happened to your tribe. Afterwards, I set up a detection magic to capture the moment you awakened. Did you perhaps put this over the entire continent? That's right. Ah ha ha. You really are an absurd person. I hear that quite often. Atain spoke indifferently. He had a vacant look, so he didn't reveal any of his emotions. It was hard to guess what he was thinking. Atain spoke. Still, it is fortunate that my technique wasn't a complete failure. If you died before I found you in your awakened state, even I would not have been able to find you afterwards. Why? It is because I need you. Atain brought up a finger infused with his magical energy. He pressed his finger against her forehead, and she spoke her name. It was a name she hadn't known in this life. He spoke her true name. Kealia. Him. Regus raised his head in surprise. When Atain called out Kealia's name, his consciousness was brought back to the present. He realized he was walking down the cold corridor of the dragon demon palace. What's wrong? An old dragon demon was walking next to him. It was Chains, who had been Regus's lieutenant during the dragon demon war. Regus raised his hand, and he covered his face. There was only his skull there. How long have I been out? You were walking with me. Chains had no idea what Regus was talking about. Regus spoke in a baffled manner. It seems I was daydreaming. Daydreaming. It seems something like that can happen even with this body. That is why. In mid-sentence, his surrounding became dark. The change made him suspicious as to whether he was having another dream, but he became confident that this incident was occurring in reality. I bet Chains will be bewildered. He can be bewildered for all I care. Kealia's ghost-like figure appeared in front of him. She had copied the Vitten's maze to separate Regus into a secluded space. You are very mean. What was that? Kealia. Opa peeked into my dream. You violated a girl's privacy. You are a pervert. That isn't fair. I had no desire to do that. It doesn't matter if it was intentional or not. In such a situation, 
you have to shut up and apologize. I feel extremely wronged by the accusation, but I'll do as you say. I'm sorry. There wasn't a hint of sincerity in his apology, so Kealia snorted. All right, we both have roots in the great darkness, and since I'm staying close to Opa, it seems we became connected like this. I see. So that was your memory. Correct. It was the memory of you meeting the king. However, you were. She hadn't been a dragon demon. She had been dying as a human girl. In Regus's opinion, she hadn't been disguising herself with magic. She really had the body of a human. I was human. How? Until the king came looking for me, I lived as a human. I'm having a hard time understanding this. You already know what kind of being I am. You were the head of your clan until you became engaged to the king. You used a secret technique to continue your existence from your past life. This secret technique was crucial in developing the technique that revived Almeric and me. Kealia's tribe were unsociable. They created their society in a perilous land, and they had lived for a thousand years in a closed society. The tribe was started by a first-generation dragon demon, and the dragon demon had created the secret art of transmigration. One could live beyond their allotted lifespan. This magic made him practically immortal. Kealia had been worshipped as the goddess of this tribe. This was Kealia's identity. When she felt her life nearing its end, she performed a ritual to be reborn as her own descendant. However, it was hard to differentiate which descendant she was transmigrated into. It required time and opportunity for her to awaken from her transmigration. Even if the secret technique could allow me to pursue immortality, it wasn't perfect. After several transmigration, small problems started to pop up. There were omissions to her memories, or she had some mental problem. There was a time when a curse made her suffer from ill health. It shortened her lifespan. The soul is influenced by the body more so than people think. If one is reborn as a new existence several dozen times over the long years, the quality of the original soul degrades. Small breakdown starts to happen, and crucial problem starts to occur. What kind of problem? I became two people. Him, I was supposed to awaken as a single entity, but I was awakened in two people. She awakened within siblings, who were identical. It was Kealia and her twin brother Kadika. The divinity the tribe had absolutely believed in started to break down at that point. The tribe was divided into those that advocated for me, and those that advocated for Kadika. Both sides fought each other. Moreover, Kadika and I loved each other, but at the same time, we hated each other. Before the awakening, Kealia and Kadika were twins that had boundless love for each other. However, after the awakening, their hatred for each other became boundless. It wasn't the influence of the other people around them. Her soul had been split into two, and the two siblings were in pain when they realized that their own uniqueness was undermined by each other's presence. We knew it by instinct. The only way to escape this torment was to kill the other. There could be only one. The tribe broke into two, and they fought. It spurred a co-destruction. Before my last moment came, I started the ritual for transmigration. However, it was unstable. I didn't have the luxury to prepare the whole ritual. She had lived for a very long time through transmigration, but her existence came to an end with Kealia and Kadika. That was what everyone had thought. However, Atain was of a different mind. The king knew my ritual was incomplete, but he thought there was a possibility of it succeeding. This was why he had done something ridiculous. He placed a detection magic over the entire continent. It would alert him the moment I awakened again. He had done this while he was conducting a war against the whole world. Kealia had been unaware of his efforts. She had lived her life after being transmigrated into a human girl. I was treated with contempt as a cursed child. In the end, a bitter smile appeared on her lips. She had died at the hands of the humans she had trusted. After she was transmigrated into a human, she had lived an unassuming life. She lived in a city where there was an institution that trained magicians. The magicians were very closed in terms of teaching their secret techniques. However, they had no choice but to open themselves when an enemy of humanity had appeared. 
They couldn't discriminate in their teachings when faced with the threat of the Dragon Demon King's army. However, the war continued to deteriorate, and the magicians had nowhere to run away. Their city was put under siege. Since the city had many magicians, they were able to mount a fierce defense, and they planned on holding out for the day when they would get rescued. However, in several days' time, their enemies poisoned the lake. The city was sealed up, and the only source of water was the lake. This drove the residents of the city into despair. They had thought the city was safe. When this flimsy belief was destroyed, it dawned on them that their deaths were imminent. The humans lost all sense of reason. The teenage magicians, who had studied under the same teacher as her, subdued and violated her. She had been someone with no background. It was horrendous, but their actions served as a catalyst that had awakened her. Him. Ragus felt awkward, so he scratched at his helmeted head. Then he realized his gesture was meaningless, so he awkwardly asked his next question. You met the king when you were about to lose your life as a human. What happened afterwards? He didn't know how he should console her, so he chose to ignore the whole thing. At Ragus' question, Kealia let out a laugh. What's so funny? It just is. As expected, Opa is cute. Him. When Ragus first met Kealia, she was already a dragon demon girl. If she had died and transmigrated during that time period, the timeline didn't match. Moreover, she had been at the brink of death, so she couldn't have made preparations for her ritual. The king had made preparations a long time ago in an attempt to persuade me. If it's the king, he would be able to do it. Is there really a secret technique that allows a human to be made into a dragon demon? No. Such a technique doesn't exist. At the very least, it doesn't exist as far as I know. So how did he do it? Chapter 179. The End of the Wait. Part 2. The king had prepared a vessel that had lost its soul. He regenerated the body that was killed in the fight against Kadika. If I taught him the secret art of transmigration, he said he would make improvements on the technique. He would return my soul to my previous body. That was the king's offer. So it really is a technique that can revive the dead. It is. This can be used on those that died a long time ago. Wait a moment. Ragus tilted his head in puzzlement. I'm pretty sure you said. Your tribe rules dictated that any information regarding the technique can only be exchanged between man and wife. That is why the king proposed to you. That's right. Your story doesn't add up. I am the tribe, and I am its law. That is why I made up that rule on the spot, and I used it as an excuse to make the king propose to me. Ragus looked at her in a dumbfounded manner. He started talking about his ideal world in front of a dying person. He talked about needing my secret technique to achieve this goal. He tried so hard to convince me that I should live and share in his ideal. He was so lovable at that moment. If I was going to live again, I thought I would like to tightly hold on to him. Ha! Ragus's shoulders slumped as if air had gone out of him. Kealia had dreamy eyes as she looked up into the air. She spoke. Opa knows what happened afterwards. While living as a human girl, she had lost faith in humanity. This was why she had accepted a Tyne's offer. On top of that, she went around gathering the scattered remnants of her tribe. They had thought she was dead, yet the leader of their tribe had appeared right in front of them. She had come back from dead. They sang her praises as if she was the second coming. Her tribe joined the Dragon Demon King's army. I believe Sir Almeric and my body was revived using the improved technique. Currently, the king is using the very same technique to recover his body. It should be noted that it took him a long time to restore our bodies. In his case, the remnants of his body wasn't left behind, and he had to restore his body at an entirely different location. Of course, it isn't an easy task. He learned the secret art of transmigration from you, yet he chose this method to revive himself. Is that right? Yes. Well, it was always hard to discern what the king was thinking. He probably has his own reasons for doing so. Everything he thinks up is so magnificently large in scale. It is hard to understand his actions if one is too close to him. I think this falls in the same category. Kealia continued to tilt her head in puzzlement as if she couldn't understand a Tyne's decision. Ragus, 
who had been looking at her, asked a question. What was your relationship with Azel? That is, at his words, Kealia had a complicated smile on her face as she spoke. He saved me from a certain death by the hands of humans. He also told me that it was all right for me to treasure myself more as I live my life. She closed her eyes as she remembered her old memories. The dragon weapons were constructed over a long time. Each dragon weapon was a unique tool, and one had to go through a painstaking process to make the dragon weapon. On the other hand, one awakened a dragon soul. It didn't require a long process. It was a matter of if you can do it or not. The process of awakening the dragon soul was like having a conversation with oneself. There was an essence infused within an individual's dragon demon magic. The essence originated from a dragon. This power allowed one to forcefully control nature through one's will. Dragon demon magic was a fusion of human wisdom and the power of the dragon, which had control over nature. The fusion allowed dragon demon magic to possess strength and versatility. When one learned the dragon soul technique, it awakened the will of the dragon, which was the basis for the dragon demon magic. This was why the familiar could move at an instinctual level. It was like breathing. The dragon soul allowed the familiar to escape the control of the dragon demon magic, and it could move through its own free will. This was when the true conversation started. A being that was a clone and a sworn brother was born. The owner of the dragon demon magic had to put one's life on the line to start a conversation with this being. One had to use one's will, the techniques that governed the dragon demon magic and one's stamina to guide the being that was capable of communication. This was how the will of the dragon demon magic transformed into a dragon soul. Who? A gale swirled around the region. The trees shook as if they were about to be broken. Leaves and grass flew into the air. Rishu stood in the middle of this gale as his bluish-white hair whipped crazily around him. If you don't put it to sleep, you'll become exhausted soon. I know. The one to answer was Chiron. His black hair remained calm within the gale. It was an unreal sight, yet the reason for this phenomena was clear. He had caused the gale. It was as if he was standing within the eye of the storm. The place he stood was the only location that had escaped the effects of the gale. Moreover, a green dragon was moving at the heart of winds. So this is what it feels like. Chiron mumbled to himself. He had awakened his dragon soul. He could feel it. The dragon demon magic flowing through his energy pulse was moving, and it had a will of its own. An unknown being had been born within him. It felt as if he was looking into a mirror after not seeing himself for a very long time. The image within the mirror was extremely familiar, yet at the same time, it was unfamiliar. Chiron's dragon soul possessed power that was reminiscent of a storm dragon. Originally, his power hadn't dealt with any specific properties. However, this fact hadn't been a detriment in him learning how to control his newly gained abilities. He was used to dealing with powers possessing a variety of properties through the dragon arts. When the gale subsided, Rishu grinned. I thought it would take you much longer than Leticia. However, you were only two days late. Why did you think that? Leticia had awakened her dragon soul two days ago. Chiron realized he had fallen behind her, and this fact had vexed him. This was why he had pushed himself to the limit and he was finally able to awaken his dragon soul on this day. Rishu answered him, You hadn't known your own essence. Essence. Leticia possesses the essence of a frost dragon. Leticia didn't have this knowledge. However, she used the power of frost even when she was using the dragon arts. She knew at an instinctual level as to where her abilities had arisen from. Ah, so that's what you meant by those words. Chiron understood what Rishu was trying to say. Whether it was a dragon demon or a dragon magian, they had an origin in a dragon. Their ancestors were the first generation dragon demons, and they were born from the fusion of a dragon and a demon. Their essence was dependent on the dragon that had fused with the demon. In the case of Chiron, he had the essence of a storm dragon. He hadn't known this until he had awakened his dragon soul. Suddenly, Chiron asked him a question. Rishu, do you know Leticia's past? I do. Why? Something is a bit off. What is it? If it is as you've said, Leticia's essence is inherited from Almeric, right? 
So why does she have the essence of a frost dragon? Almeric's dragon weapon was the storm's scream. It had dominion over thunder. Wasn't that power totally unrelated to the power of frost? Rishu let out a bitter laugh. In the case of Leticia, her birth process was special. A variety of bloodlines had mixed over the generations to create her. That is why she had no idea what her essence was. I see. It makes sense since she is a dragon magian. What about your parents, Chiron? I'm not sure. They were both dragon demons, but I have no idea what abilities they possessed. I sense a story there. Both your parents were dragon demons. It is rare to see such an occurrence in human society. That's right. It was only possible, because it was within several generations of the dragon demon war. The number of dragon demons living within human society was low. This was why it was rare for dragon demons to marry each other. It was more common to see a dragon demon marry a dragon magian or a human. However, dragon demons' blood were thicker than human blood. If a dragon demon mated with a human, their offspring would be a dragon magian. A union between dragon magians produced a dragon magian. It was the same for a union between a dragon magian and a human. As dragon magians continue to copulate with humans in each successive generation, it took a very long time for their blood to become diluted. It took a very long time for their descendants to become wholly human. On the other hand, a union between a dragon demon and a dragon magian produced a dragon demon. The sex or the purity of the dragon magian didn't matter. The partner just had to be a dragon magian. A union between a dragon demon and a dragon magian always produced a dragon demon. This was why there were so many dragon demons in this world, despite there not being too many first-generation dragon demons. Suddenly, Rishu spoke. However, I'm a bit surprised that you are attempting this right now. Aren't you worried? Your perturbed heart may pose a potential risk. That is why I wanted you to wait for the end result. I want to ask you the same question. Aren't you worried about her? I am worried, but she chose this fight. I just have accept whatever result that comes out from it. Him, as expected of Leticia's teacher, he looked sentimental on the outside, but he was bone chillingly cold in accepting matters of life and death. Chiron put his dragon soul to sleep, then he turned to look into the distance. The gale had died down, and he could hear the deafening roar in the distance. He was several kilometers away, but it was apparent that a fierce battle was ongoing at that moment. My comrade put her life on the line to attempt this. The desire of not wanting to lose to her has become stronger. That is why I'm going to do it. You really hate losing. Rishu laughed as if he found it amusing. Leticia was fighting in the distance. She had completed her dragon soul two days ago, and she had received permission to carry out the dragon slayer's ritual from Alberton. The fact that she was lacking power had been made apparent in her fight with Almeric. She had gained the dragon soul, but she knew she needed a bigger power for her upcoming fights. If I die here, it means I would have died in the future. After saying those words, she made her decision to attempt the dragon slayer's ritual. I trust in the fact that you aren't an idiotic woman. You won't die after saying such words. I believe in you, Leticia. Chiron silently sent his feeling of support towards her. As the light lessened, Leticia slowly opened her eyes. She had been victorious in the dragon slayer's ritual. The frost dragon had given everything of itself to the victor. After fighting desperately for several hours, Leticia had reached her limit. However, her entire body was surprisingly filled with energy. Moreover, she could feel an enormous unrefined power within her. It was a power that she had been unable to make her own. So this is what it feels like. Leticia mumbled to herself. Azul's explanation had been vague, but she was now able to understand what he had been talking about. She just had to refine this power, and she would be able to repeat this process. She was sure she would be able to exceed Almeric using this process. Clap, 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 clap. As she was savoring this feeling, Leticia heard the sound of clapping. It broke her reverie. Congratulations. It was Azel. He had attended the Dragon Slayer's ritual as an observer. Leticia spoke. My preparation is complete. I want to take more time to be able to attempt another Dragon Slayer's ritual, but I'm assuming we don't have the luxury to stay here any longer. 
probably not. It was hard to gather information from within the forest. Alberton had a general idea of what was happening across the continent, but he had shown no inclination in departing this knowledge to Azel's party. Even if they didn't have any information, they knew they didn't have the time to continue their training. The keepers of the prophecy had been the governing body of the guardian shadows. They were no more. This probably meant the plane of darkness would have stepped up their level of activity. Azel's party had remained here, despite knowing this fact. They had determined that the dragon's soul was needed in the upcoming fights. Since Chiron and Leticia had gained the dragon soul, their stay in the forest had come to an end. Suddenly, Leticia asked him a question. Chapter 180. The End of the Wait. Part 3. Suddenly, Leticia asked him a question. Did you resolve your indecision? Maybe. Azel let out a bitter laugh. He hadn't told his associates about Rishu partnering up with Atain. He hadn't wanted to break the concentration of his associates when they were learning the dragon's soul from Rishu. Leticia was able to read the indecision in Azel's attitude. However, his feelings regarding Rishu was different from what she was reading from him. Azel looked far into the distance as he mumbled to himself. A lot has changed. A lot of stuff. His gaze headed towards the mountain peak of Laos. His old friend Carlos was there. They had been such close friends that they would have given their lives for each other. He couldn't say for certain that Carlos was still alive, but a part of him existed in this world. Carlos had been waiting for him, and this fact was touching. At the same time, Carlos had suffered under hardships over the long years, and Azel was afraid to witness what changes those hardships had brought about in Carlos. He had been shocked when he saw the changes that had occurred within Rishu. The shock he would feel at meeting Carlos wouldn't hold a candle to the shock he felt for Rishu. He had a gut feeling that this would be the case, so he considered himself fortunate for being able to spend some time inside the forest. It allowed him to put off the meeting. However, his time here was at an end. Azel wanted to meet Carlos, but at the same time, he desperately didn't want to meet him either. These two realities was about to clash against each other. Azel spoke. It has always been like this. It doesn't matter if I'm ready or not. If I have to do something, I just have to face it. I don't think that's how it should be. What do you mean? Azel was puzzled by the point Leticia was trying to make. She spoke. If the man named Carlos is truly your precious friend, shouldn't you treat him with honor? He went through all kinds of pain to wait for you. It would be a discourtesy to show up in front of him without a firm resolve. Azel had a stupid expression on his face. It was as if he had been punched in the face. For a long while, he wasn't able to speak then his lips started to twitch. Soon, he was letting out an unburdened laughter. You were right. It really is like that. Carlos had done so much for him. He even worried about Azel, who would be awoken long after his death. He had made so much arrangements for Azel, because he had been worried about Azel. That is why it didn't matter how much Carlos had changed. It was his duty to face Carlos face to face. Thank you. I'll consider this debt paid against what you have taught me. Leticia snorted as she left. Azel's party left for the mountain peak of Laos. It was four days after Leticia had conducted the Dragon Slayer's ritual. Leticia had used those four days to get a handle on the power she had acquired in the Dragon Slayer's ritual. She also learned the basic uses of the dragon soul with Chiron. On the day of their departure, Leticia went to see Rishu before the sun came up. Rishu had told her that he wouldn't be seeing her off. What's up? Rishu asked the question as if he had known she would visit him. Leticia didn't speak for a long time as she looked at him. I heard it from Azel. What did he say? He said you might become our enemy. I guess he really told you. Rishu let out a bitter laugh. In truth, he never thought Azel would hold back the truth from his colleagues. If a truth like this was kept secret, there were advantages and disadvantages that came with such a decision. If they were to meet Rishu as an enemy in the future, it would shock them. It was better to tell them at an earlier date, so they could prepare themselves for the fight. Leticia spoke. Is that the reason why you and Azel didn't reveal your true powers? Yes. While they resided in the Alberton forest, Rishu and Azel hadn't revealed their true capabilities. 
Even when Azel released his magical energy in front of Laura, he had left plenty of power left in reserve. Rishu queried her. Do you resent me? We aren't enemies yet. Not yet. Leticia's eyes were cold. However, Rishu could read the complicated emotions that was being suppressed deep down within her. She spoke. If a time comes when we meet again as enemies, I won't resent you. It is the same now as in old times. I will be thankful to you. Leticia, I'll just tell you this one thing. Leticia raised her hand to cut off what Rishu was about to say. When the time comes, I'll be the one to take your life. You seem to have a deep connection with Azel, but I won't yield the opportunity to him. Either you die or I die. We must settle this between us. Leticia displayed a mighty determination. Rishu smiled as he looked into her eyes. I never taught you to be like that. You taught me not to obsess about one-on-one -on -one battles. You told me to be willing to get help from my comrades to achieve victory at all cost. It didn't matter what kind of situation Leticia faced. She set her priorities before she acted. She didn't get caught up with emotions, and she minimized the chaos that arose within a battle. These general principles had been taught to her by Rishu, and it was the reason why she was able to survive the fight against the Plane of Darkness. However, she had changed a little bit after she acquired comrades. While she continued to pursue her own safety above all else, there were things that were more important to her than the prospect of future fights now. I'll probably do as you advised. You might think it cowardly, but I'll find the best plan to end you. Leticia didn't deny it. The fight with Rishu was her responsibility, but she wouldn't hesitate to borrow the power of others to win against him. She was aware of the difference in power. She would never be able to win against Rishu in a one-on-one -on -one battle. Rishu spoke. It seems I hadn't taught you in vain. You are a bad teacher. Why? You taught your student to act in a certain way, yet you won't follow your own teachings. Leticia was well aware of Rishu's personality. Rishu had drilled into Leticia that she had to prioritize survival and victory above all else. However, Rishu moved within a different set of rules. Rishu shrugged his shoulders. I have no rebuttal to that point. If you do become my enemy, I don't want you to die in an unknown place. At the very least, don't get killed by some random person. I'll try not to. Good. After she told him what she had to say, Leticia unhesitatingly turned her body away from him. As she moved away from him, Rishu suddenly called out to her. Leticia. Leticia stopped walking. However, she didn't turn around. It was good to see you again. Hong. Leticia snorted as she moved into the distance. However, her expression was crumpled from the pain she was feeling. It was a long ways away from the mountain peak of Laos. The Alberton forest was vast, and the Atazan mountain range separated the Alberton forest and the plain of darkness. It was a natural barrier. The mountain range was enormous and perilous. All kinds of danger lurked within the mountain range. On the day of his departure, Alberton asked Azel a question when he came to say farewell to Alberton. You refuse to ask me the question. What are you talking about? I'm talking about the deal I made with Carlos. Carlos had taught Alberton a technique of massive value. Azel's party was taught the dragon soul technique in return. Carlos resided in the vast and perilous land. He worked towards ending the unresolved fight of his era, and he prepared for the future when Azel would awaken from his sleep. Of course, Azel was curious about the content of the deal. Dragon Soul was a surprising technique. In an era where the world had even forgotten about the Dragon Slayer's ritual, this technique was unbelievably valuable. Azel had realized the need to strengthen his party members, and this technique had been like a rain during a famine. Azel could have transferred his dragon weapons to his allies, but it would have lessened his own powers in the process. Did Carlos really predict all of this? Or, no, he just took all possible steps within his power. It was the same during the Dragon Demon War. Carlos didn't have the ability to look into the future, unlike the legendary sage in the legends. However, Carlos had decided to prepare for all the possibilities of the future he could think up. Aside from the plans Azel had come across, there were probably countless arrangements that was unknown to him. Azel had been able to stumble across a couple of these arrangements by pure luck. 
I am curious. However, I want to hear it from him. It seems you've made up your mind. A woman gave me an advice that I should be more courteous to my friend. Azel let out a bitter laugh as he thought about the words spoken by Leticia. Alberton spoke. The technique taught to me by Carlos was a curse. Curse. Azel's eyes widened. He hadn't expected this answer. Alberton raised his claw to point at Azel. It was the curse placed on you by Atain. Why would you want? Why did Atain put a curse on you? Did you ever think about the reasons behind his action? I got in the way of his ambitions, and he probably wanted to take revenge against the person who took his life. Do you really think Atain would act based on such reasons? The most obvious answer was shot down. He wanted to deny Alberton's words, but a part of him agreed with his words. Alberton enjoyed the confused reaction of Azel. He spoke. After being preoccupied with this question over the years, he finally found out the reason behind Atain's actions. Moreover, he passed on the curse that he had been able to analyze. What was the reason behind Atain's action? You can hear it from Carlos. It'll be a great conversation starter for friends that hadn't met for a long time. As always, you are quite perverse. Isn't it the joy of being old? Azel sighed as he spoke. Alberton let out a sly smile. It was almost unbelievable that a dragon could make such an expression. Azel lowered his head after he witnessed the dragon's expressive face. Thank you for your kindness. If you live to acquire the answer, I want you to come back. I want you tell me the answer you acquired. Which answer are you talking about? You'll have to find that out for yourself too. If I feel like it, I'll do so. Alberton snorted at Alberton's mischievous words. Azul's party moved quickly. For the past two days, they moved with plenty of energy left in reserve. However, they started moving like the wind on the fourth day when they entered the Atazan mountain range. Ooh, this place is no joke. Euron had flown into the air, and he had been buffeted by the turbulent winds. Euron shook from the cold as he hugged himself. Was it because they were getting closer to the plane of darkness? The temperature at the Atazan mountain range was quite cold, and there was a bite to the winds. Euron was unable to fly above a certain altitude. It seems we won't be able travel in comfort. We'll have move along this mountain range. The Atazan mountain range didn't have any paths that looked traversable by humans. If the members of Azul's party hadn't possessed superhuman abilities, they would have labored to even make it to the entrance of the mountain range. Azel spoke. I can see why this place is called the natural barrier between the plain of darkness and the Alberton forest. The Atazan mountain range was enormous and perilous. This was why humans refused to step onto this mountain. According to some rumors, there were dangerous beings that frequented this mountain range. They were beings that were used to such harsh conditions. Laura queried him. Have you been here before? Nope. So how can you say? I'm just saying you guys should be on alert. I was able to give you guys a rough idea on how to prepare for the Alberton Forest. I cannot do that for this place. Ah, wait a moment. In the midst of saying those words, Azel suddenly had a thought. Laura, have you been here before? Yes. Azel's expression was a sight to behold. When his companions started to snicker, he cleared his throat. Chapter 181. The End of the Wait. Part 4. Azel's expression was a sight to behold. When his companions started to snicker, he cleared his throat. Hum hum. You should have told me sooner. You stepped forward like a know-it-all before I could speak to you. You also like to get the first word in. He was at a loss for words. Azel quietly lowered his head. Since you've experienced being here, please give me advice. I'm not familiar with this region. We came deep into this mountain range for training and reconnaissance. However, we never crossed over to this place. It was to be expected. The Atazan mountain range was unusually vast. If she had entered from the side of the plane of darkness, she would have needed to travel a great distance to reach this point. Azel queried her. Do you think we have enough supplies? I believe we'll be okay. However, we should start catching animals we come across to prepare in advance. Him. They were in the seventh month of the calendar. It was still summer, so the climate wasn't cold. However, the temperature within Atazan mountain range was noticeably lower than the Alberton forest. 
As they entered deeper into the mountain range, it would get worse. Chiron spoke. Thankfully we have guides. I guess so. The guardian shadows had accompanied Azul's party to the Alberton forest, and they were still present. They were actually leading the way from the front. From the perspective of Azul's party, it was a fortunate turn of events. Euron looked at his surroundings as he spoke. Are their numbers growing again? It was as he said. The number of guardian shadows was growing. The terrain was so rough that one could only count a limited number of guardian shadows with the naked eye. Still, they were pretty open in letting their presence known, so Azul's party knew that their numbers were increasing. Soon, the sound of battle could be heard in the distance. Ooh, oh, the sounds of fierce roars, cries and explosions were mixed in together as it echoed. Azul's party realized that the guardian shadows were conducting battles. Chiron furrowed his brows. Are they eliminating potential risk factors for us? I believe so. Azel realized at some point that there were at least 500 guardian shadows, and this was the lowest of his estimates. I'm not sure how dangerous this place is, but we won't have to worry too much unless we encounter a dragon. Still, we have to keep up our fast pace. Chiron pointed out this fact. Naturally, everyone turned to look at Laura. The problem was the Vitten's chalice. Their enemies could track them down by locating the Vitten's chalice. This fact hadn't mattered when they resided within the Alberton forest. However, they should have realized by now that Azul's party was once again on the move. If they were lucky, their enemies would have stationed their troops along Plain of Darkness. This would happen if they thought Azul's party would try to enter into the Plain of Darkness. If they were unlucky, Almeric and Regus will bring their elite forces against us. It is probably the latter. There is a high probability that they are already moving against us. This was why Azul's party had been in a hurry after they left the Alberton forest. They knew that Carlos safe haven was located on the mountain peak of Laos. Laos was closer to the plain of darkness compared to the Alberton forest. If they were unlucky, their enemies might be waiting for them. They had to avoid that possibility. It'll also be a problem once I meet Carlos. He didn't know what state Carlos was in. Moreover, he couldn't predict what he would do once they met. How would Carlos respond if enemies attacked while they were meeting in his safe haven? Was the place capable of defending against attacks? He had too little information. Even if he tried to initiate a conversation with the Guardian Shadows, he didn't think he would gain anything. In the first place, they were short on the ability to converse. They also seemed to know very little. I guess I have no choice, but to go there first. Azel could only resign himself to this possibility. Fortunately, they were moving really fast, because the Guardian Shadows were leading the way. The Guardian Shadows weren't impeded by the terrain, so their speed was faster than Azel's party in the long run. The party only stopped for a three to four hour break whenever they found a suitable location. They moved through night and day. This was possible, because the Guardian Shadows took care of most of the fights. I think there are over 2,000 of them now. Chiron had climbed up to an elevated location, and he was baffled. Azel queried him in a playful manner. Why don't you try to get an accurate count? Who? It has been a while, but it seems you want to act like a teacher again. I'll willingly accept the challenge. Why don't you try it too? Leticia, are you trying to create a contest between your students? Him. Leticia agreed to do the challenge. The two of them closed their eyes, and they expanded their senses. They started discerning the number of guardian shadows present for the competition. Laura spoke. They are doing it inefficiently. Their number is. Oop. She immediately casted her detection magic, and she was able to discern their numbers using magic. Laura was about to tell them the answer, but Azel covered her mouth with his hand. Laura's mouth was sealed, so she glared at Azel with a sullen look. When Azel laughed, she pinched the back of his hand. That was rude. I apologize. Azel lowered his head in a sly manner. Laura snorted. Soon, Leticia opened her eyes as she spoke. At this point in time, there are 2,630 of them. They are slowly growing in number. You already counted all of them. Chiron was taken aback. He had counted only half her number. Azel grinned as he spoke. That is the correct answer. As expected, 
Leticia is good at such tasks. How can this be? Counting people is one of my specialties. Chiron's expression crumpled. He was a knight, and a lord of a large territory. He was quite good at counting large number of people. He was experienced at it, since he had commanded a large number of soldiers. So how did Leticia count so much faster than him? Azel spoke. I've expected this result. Why? Chiron asked as if he couldn't accept Azel's words. Azel gave him an explanation. You aren't proficient in the cloning technique. This isn't the case with Leticia. That is the difference. Are you talking about the ability to do multiple things at the same time? That's right. One's aptitude towards the cloning skill was dependent on one's ability to multitask. Chiron could use the cloning technique, but he could only use it for a brief amount of time. He usually used it to confuse his opponents. He couldn't make his clones have a sense of presence when he moved them in terms of the cloning technique. Azel had reached the pinnacle. He could make numerous clones look as if it was the real one, and he could maintain them for long periods of time. He could also freely change their shapes. The Dance of the Shadows technique could be used when one reached such a level. Basically, he was able to reach a state called incarnation in the dragon arts. He was able to give substance to his clones. This wasn't something one could do even if one's standard of technique was high. Aptitude was a big factor. Spirit Order and Dragon Arts practitioners were divided into two categories. The first category included those that were able to quickly accomplish one task. The second category was those that could juggle many tasks at the same time. Chiron was in the former category. This meant that he was able to create enormous amounts of power in a short amount of time. He was able to create explosive power, and he could wield it with surprising amount of precision. Leticia was in the latter category. She used powers of different attributes to use her cloning technique, and she was able to use various high-level techniques. Suddenly, Chiron spoke. Is that why Rishu doesn't have any profound knowledge of the cloning technique? From what I knew from before, what you say is true. It is still probably true today. Azel could tell by looking at Leticia. She hadn't learned much from Rishu about the cloning technique. The cloning technique she used was from the plane of darkness. She was taught it, because she had been one of the candidates in running to become Almeric's heir. She had steeply increased her proficiency in the cloning technique after she met Azel. Maybe, it is because she is of Almeric's blood. During the Dragon Demon War, Almeric had been the best at using the cloning technique if Azel was taken out of the picture. He was second only to Azel. Chiron grumbled. Shit, I have never been jealous of the cloning technique until I met you. One can't be good at everything. In the plane of darkness, they were moving in a different direction than Azel's party had predicted. It was true that troops were being dispatched, but their destination wasn't the Atazan mountain range. We aren't getting a response. It is worrisome. Is this Alberton's doing? Or is it Carlos Rizester's doing? Almeric felt leery. Within the great darkness, Ainsera could track down the dragon weapons used by the dragon demon generals. Laura was within Azel's party, so they were able to confirm that his party was residing in the Alberton forest. This was all thanks to the Vitans' chalice. Strangely, the precision has been dropping. When Almeric had first shown up, Azel's party had guessed that his ability to track down the Vitans' chalice wasn't very precise. It was true, the other dragon weapons of the dragon demon generals could be tracked down in an accurate manner. However, for some strange reason, the accuracy of finding the Vitan's chalice had always been low. On top of that, there had been one instance where there had been no response from the Vitan's chalice. After its disappearance, it had appeared far from the Alberton forest. There is a possibility that they might have left Laura behind. Hugh, Hugh, Hugh. You've been tucked under like a bear sleeping its winter slumber. You are finally out. Regus didn't care if Almeric was leery or not. He was excited. Azel's party had entered into the Alberton forest. For the past two months, he had suppressed his desire to charge into the forest. It had been hard for him. If Atain hadn't made a non-aggression pact with Alberton, Regus would have already charged into the forest. He would have went there by himself if he had to. Almeric gave Regus a sideway glance as if he found Regus to be pathetic. Are you just going to ignore all my words? 
Of course, I'm listening to what you have to say. I'll leave the privilege of worrying about such details to you. You can worry about it to your heart's content. In the past, didn't you complain about the fact that Ornsaurus and Baldazark had the roles of strategists? You have the right to take on their roles now, so you should be thrilled about it. I knew it was going to be like this, but Almeric massaged his forehead. He had changed a lot, but Rhaegar still remained the same. He was scary in his consistency. It was almost admirable. Will you face Azel this time around? I fought him once, and you fought him once. Isn't it my turn now? Him. All right. I hope you don't get killed. Almeric didn't try to dissuade Ragus. They were colleagues, and both of them were respectful of each other's sense of value. Ragus's voice was full of anticipation. Do you think he's become stronger? He probably is stronger. He might be as strong as his past self. I've seen the recordings. He was really nice. It isn't like you to study up on your opponent. I took a big hit when he wasn't whole. It is the virtue of a man to acknowledge an opponent's power, especially when that person took me down a peg. Ragus shrugged his shoulder. Almeric asked him a question. What's the result from your study? Are you confident you can win against him? Nope. In a battle between men, who cares about winning? We just fight. You are incorrigible. If possible, don't get completely destroyed by him. Your revival will take a long time. Him. The fact that I'm guaranteed to be revived makes it sound cheap. I'll willingly put my life on line even if I only have one. Ragus was an immortal. To be precise, Attain was the backbone of the Great Darkness, and if the Great Darkness remains undiminished, Ragus could always be revived. This was true even if his body was completely destroyed. It just took time for him to revive again. However, there will be a vacuum until you are revived once again. This will work against us in a critical way. What if the king is killed again, while you were gone? You might never be revived again. Then I won't have to see the disgusting sight of you eating meat. Your ill nature makes me want to cling to life, so I can show you the sight of me eating some delicious meat. Almeric snorted. Ragus queried. So what is our course of action? Chapter 182. The End of the Wait. Part 5. Of course, we'll defeat Azel Kazark and his party. I mean, what is your prediction? How do you think they'll move? Your brain might have rotted away, but you are still capable of thought. Why don't you figure it out for yourself? There are others that are better at it than me. Why should I have to do something so tiresome? Tisk tisk. Almeric clicked his tongue. My staff has given me their opinions. As I've said before, they might be trying to deceive us. They might be using Laura as bait to draw us out. Rest of their members might assault the Dragon Demon Palace. Oh, you think he is trying to pierce through to the heart of our base? We have too little information to be sure. However, if we send our main force towards him, a trap might be waiting for us. So what should we do? It makes no great difference one way or the other. Let's attack them, and we can recover the Vitten's chalice. At his words, Ragus chuckled. Good. I love it. It isn't in my personality to camp out here. You probably would have been delighted to go out there by yourself. That image is vivid in my mind. That is why I decided to take the offensive. You know me too well. Since I've gone so far as to take your personality into consideration in our planning, you better not run out there by yourself. I'll do that. I also have to be considerate of the ladies. Ragus shrugged his shoulders. In this operation, only the elites would be put in. In the last battle, they had faced the combined might of Azul's party and the Guardian Shadows. They had learned their lesson. Niberus, Kieran and Jeffers would be included in the elite force. Each of them would be leading the elite forces of their respective families, and they would follow the commands of the two dragon demon generals. Suddenly, Ragus asked him a question. What about your heir? He has a pretty good mindset. It's been worthwhile for me to teach him. You are teaching someone else. Oh ho. I never expected such a day to come. He is my descendant. I'll feel annoyed if people say he is worthless. When Almeric woke up, the Almeric tribe was completely turned on its head. Since they had falsely set forth Jeffa as their heir, the Almeric tribe stripped Jeffers of all his authority. The true powers within the tribe gave all authority to Almeric. 
Jeffers was devastated. The shock had been great when he realized that he had merely been an ignorant puppet. However, Almerich didn't discard Jeffers. Jeffers was his descendant, and he had been the heir while he had been missing. For a while, he got a hold of Jeffers with the aim to train him. If his potential was lacking, he would have given up on him immediately. However, Jeffers hadn't been too bad, and it had been fun teaching him. I have to devise ways to teach him my techniques. He is worth it. It is a fun exercise. Your words makes me want to raise one too. You shouldn't do it. I don't think their bodies can take your ministration. After Azul's party entered the Atazan mountain range, it took them five days to arrive at the mountain peak of Laos. It was thanks to the Guardian Shadows. They guided the party towards terrains that were relatively easy to traverse, and they had eliminated all the threats along the way. If it wasn't for them, they would have been unable to travel at such high speeds through these unknown lands. The mountain peak of Laos. Now that I'm close to it, it really is big. Azel mumbled to himself as he looked at the mountain peak of Laos from afar. There were many grand mountain peaks in the Atazan mountain range. The mountain peaks were so high that it was tough to breathe up there. However, Laos was exceptionally high. The second highest mountain peak in the Atazan mountain range was only half the size of Laos. On a clear day, one was able to see the mountain peak of Laos from the Alberton forest. This was why this place was known to humans, even though no one had tread atop of it. It was a holy mountain peak that linked the earth to the sky. Laos was the name of a giant from an old legend. The people of old believed that a god had been punished to hold up the sky. They believed he was morphed into this very mountain. I can't see the peak now that we are closer to it. How far up do we have to go? When they were far away, they were able to see the mountain peak pierce through the clouds. Now that they were close, it was too too big to take it all in. Laura spoke. It is 17,817 meters. Ha! Huh, if we are going by elevation above sea level, it is 17,817 meters high. How do you know the exact figure? He was taken aback, so he asked the question. Laura explained it to him. There are several ways to measure it, but this recorded value was left behind by the dragon demon king. It has been several hundred years, so the value might differ by several meters. Atain did something so useless. Well, I guess all magicians are like that. Azel was astonished. We have to go up 18 kilometers. He was having a hard time wrapping his head around how high the mountain peak was. Laura pointed out another fact. The figure was made in reference to the sea level. The mountain peak is probably lower than what you have in mind. You are talking about 18 kilometers becoming 17 kilometers. I'm not sure there is much of a difference. Laura brought up another point to the grumbling Azel. It is a big difference, especially since we have to climb it. Ha! Huh, we've crossed couple mountain peaks coming here, and we already had a hard time breathing on top of these mountains. You are implying that the mountain peak of Laos might not have an environment capable of supporting humans. Laura nodded her head. Azel furrowed his brows. It definitely isn't an altitude one can climb using flight magic. Him. I've only been that high using my clone, so I'm not sure what the environment is like. Laura was surprised by his words. You went up that high of a distance. Me? Yes. I did. How? I summoned the sky splitter, and I used the dance of shadows to create a clone. Ah, Azel created a clone with substance, and he was able to freely change the magical properties of such a clone. He was able to resonate with the sky splitter to take on the property of light. This allowed his clone to be able to climb up to incredible heights. Azel spoke. However, I wasn't trying to send a clone to a faraway distance. I was faced with a slightly different challenge. As the clone climbed higher, it became exponentially hard to maintain the clone. When it reached a certain distance, the clone expired. Still, it is a ridiculous ability. Carlos thought so too. He said my greatest weapon is the ability to be at multiple locations at once. I agree with his assessment. Azel smirked as he spoke. Well, shall we climb? The guardian shadows are creating a path for us. It was as he said. The guardian shadows were lined up in a long line as if they wanted to show them where to go. 
several thousand guardian shadows stood in an ordered line towards the top of the mountain. They were also being vigilant of their surrounding. It was such an alien sight that it made one feel a bit queasy. Chiron spoke. It seems there are over 3,000 of them now. I guess so. I thought a lot of them were killed during the last battle. Yet there are still so many of them. In the battle where the Keepers of Prophecy were wiped out, the Guardian Shadows had taken a significant blow. From what they had observed, the Guardian Shadows weren't invincible. They were able to ignore simple physical attacks, and they were more tenacious than any living being. However, they could be killed with attacks infused with magical energy. Despite this fact, there were over 3,000 Guardian Shadows gathered here. Even if Ragus and Almeric had shown up right now, they wouldn't have been able to look down on the force gathered here. Chiron spoke. Let's leave the rest to our friends. Let's go meet your Archmage friend, and we can hear the final secret from him. Let's do that. The party followed the Guardian Shadows, and they started to climb towards the mountain peak of Laos. There were no paths that could be traversed by humans, but it didn't matter. Azel and his party members could walk on wall as it was flat ground. Moreover, they also possessed flight magic. They were vigilant against their surrounding, and they left plenty of energy in reserve as they climbed. This meant they were traveling up the mountain at a pace similar to a normal human sprinting across a flat surface. Still, the destination was far. On top of that, it was getting harder to breathe as they climbed higher. We are high enough that I'm starting to run out of breath. Chiron stopped for a brief moment as he gathered his breath. It was natural to be breathless in the high mountain terrains, but Laos was on a different level. Above all, the environment itself was too harsh. The temperature was so low that it felt as if their lungs were about to freeze. Then there were the knife-like winds. If all of the party members weren't superhuman, they wouldn't have been able to climb this far without powerful magical assistance. It probably would have taken a normal human a week to get up here. Chiron queried. How much do we have left to go? Soon, there is a door. It was such a simple question that the guardian shadows were able to understand his question. They answered him. It was as they said. It didn't take them too long to reach their destination. However, there was nothing in the direction pointed out by the guardian shadows. It's a wall. Euron was baffled as he stared at the location pointed out by the guardian shadows. Nothing was there. It was a rock wall. He approached the wall just to be sure, and he touched the wall. He even checked if there was an illusion spell placed over it. He found nothing. Prophesied being. Only he. His presence is the key. When he heard their words, Azel stepped forward. What do I have to do? The guardian shadows didn't answer him. Instead, a deafening roar rang out as the wall shook. The party was surprised, so they got into their battle stance. However, the change that was occurring in front of them was harmless. The rock wall was changing shape. The sight in front of their eyes became distorted, and a tunnel formed within the darkness. Laura mumbled her words in surprise. Path of tears. It was the same as the passageway created by the Vitans chalice where she distorted space. This technique was capable of creating a path, even when there was a physical barrier. Azel stared into the darkness as he took a deep breath. When Leticia saw this, she asked him a question. Are you scared? Aren't you supposed to ask if I'm nervous? It's the same thing. It's different. Azel burst out laughing as he took a step into the darkness. At the same time, his surrounding changed. It is a dimensional distortion field. When Azel entered the path, the tunnel morphed into a dimensional distortion field. He was being dragged towards a new place. It was like using the Vitans maze to travel a long distance in an instant. Azel remained calm. As expected, he had never been to this place. However, he had seen this place once before. It wasn't in reality. He saw it in a dream. The light reflected off the surface of the water, and the light danced on the wall. Normally, an underground space like this shouldn't have a single light source. Yet the magical light created such a mystical sight. You finally reached this point, Azel. He knew this voice better than anyone, yet the voice sounded so foreign. The voice spoke towards Azel. It was a very bleak voice. 
It was as if the deepest darkness below had been squeezed to create this voice. It felt as if his lifespan was shortened by listening to the voice. The voice sounded similar to the voice of an undead, yet the voice elicited a more basic fear from a living being. I've heard those words before. Azel felt lost as to what he should feel. He looked towards the owner of the voice. Water was gathered at the corner of this space. There were fragments of lyre dancing above the water as if they were fireflies dancing in the summer night. The light was so faint that it looked as if the darkness was about to swallow them at any moment. However, the light continued to fragment, and the beautiful halo of light continued to exist. In the middle of all of this, a silhouette wrapped up in darkness existed. Fragments of light was dancing around him, yet his face couldn't be seen. It wasn't, because of the darkness casted by the worn-out hood. It was probably caused by the ominous energy surrounding his body. His body was wrapped in a ragged robe, and something was planted deep in his chest. The end was rounded, and it was embedded with a clear gem. The wooden staff was pierced through his chest as a quiet darkness emanated from it. There was a rectangular pillar made out of silver erected behind him. Black chains were tying him to the silver pillar, and darkness crawled up the surface of the pillar in the shape of letters. It was a bizarre sight. Azel called out to him. It has been a while, Carlos. Yes, it really has been a while, Azel. The two sworn friends had ended the Dragon Demon War, and their reunion occurred after 220 years had passed. Chapter 183. Two Persons. Part 1. The rippling waves of light turned hazy within the darkness, and the silence continued. Two people. No, one person and a being that used to be a human silently stared at each other. There were only 20 steps between the two of them. However, there was 220 years piled atop of them. They looked at each other, and mixed emotions were exchanged between them. He couldn't see Carlos' face, but Azel was confident they were feeling the same emotions. There was a maelstrom of words within his chest that he wanted to blurt out. However, when it came time to speak, he had no idea what he should say first. You. In the end, Azel opened his mouth first. I heard you became bald. Is that all you have to say after meeting me after 200 years? Carlos was dumbfounded as he laughed. Azel smirked. Your thought construct reacted a bit differently. He became angry. It has been a long time since I created it. I'm not angry at hearing such words. Actually, I welcome it. You welcome it. Yes, it is proof that there is someone that is willing to talk to me as if I'm human. Moreover, that person happens to be you. Azel. It has been very long since I've had a proper conversation with a human. It has been over a hundred years. When he spoke those words, one could hear a deep loneliness in his voice. There was a bizarre ring to his voice, but there was also his emotions mixed within it. It made Azel's heart ache to hear it. Azel took a step closer as he asked a question. Did you purposely isolate me from my party? Yes, I've been observing you, and I know you have good companions. However, I don't want us to be interrupted during this time. I see, a good amount of time had passed, but Azel was the only one that had arrived at this place. There had been no news from his party members. This wouldn't have happened unless this was Carlos' intention. Azel queried him. The guardian shadows acted as your eyes and ears. You are still quick on the uptake. I also know that they are your eyes and ears, but they cannot be your mouth. You would have conveyed your intentions at a much early date if you were capable of doing it. That's right. Unfortunately, I had to go through these inconveniences to protect my secrets. I cannot unilaterally use methods that is only convenient for me. The more you act in pursuit of your own convenience, it allows your opponent to use it against you. You always used to say that. When you went to sleep, I always told my students that phrase. I taught that about the concept of security. I'm guessing a lot had occurred even after I went to sleep. Even if I churn out a page of record per day, I won't be able to finish it in 20 years. That is how much incidents had occurred after you went to sleep. I don't like long-winded stories. You should summarize it, and just tell me the fun parts. The fact that I can hear such shameless statements makes me really realize that I am meeting my friend Azel.
I don't know if you changed in your old age or not, but I just know that you went bald. I was sad, but that's old news. My body is in a state where it doesn't matter if I have hair or not. Whom you don't like my joke? Truthfully, I don't. Let's discuss that at a later time. Let's talk about the fun stuff first. I would like you to go first. Ha! Huh, you are here in reality. Your voice is the same as the one I remember. You probably don't realize how deeply moved I am right now, as L. I want you to tell me what has gone on after you woke up. I want you to tell me what the guardian shadows were unable to report. Shall I? It doesn't seem right for you to be standing, while you are telling your story. You should have a seat over there. Azel followed his words. There was a suitable stone next to him, so Azel sat on it. I guess I don't have to worry about where to start my story. Azel started his story from the time he woke up within the Balan forest. He spoke about what he experienced when he was found by the western border guards of the Rulan kingdom. He spoke about the dragon demon princess Arietta, and the encounter he had with Carlos Thought Construct, who had gotten angry at Azel for making fun of his baldness. His story was long. Was it really okay for them to speak in such laid-back manner in such a situation? The question arose inside his mind, but he ignored it. At that moment, he wanted to forget all other problems. Carlos listened to Azel's story, and he had fun chiming in with his own words. You've experienced much in a short amount of time. It seems you are not destined to live a quiet life. Unfortunately, you are right. After you went to sleep, I met those that lived turbulent lives. Some of them helped me save the world. I've read the recorded history books, yet I never read about such events. They did list your many achievements, but these events didn't come to the forefront of history. I took care of it before they could surface. I see. Carlos' current state might have had something to do with those incidents. When Azel became silent, Carlos asked a question. Do you have something specific you want to ask me? Him. Let's see. How did Rogan lose his business? Oh, that really was an unfortunate situation. Thanks to that incident, I lost the money I invested in his business. You invested in his business? I did. It was when Rogan had a money flow problem. In truth, I wanted to help him more, but he turned me down. I see. Rogan had made many friends in the Dragon Demon War, and these friends had helped Rogan, when he was in a tough spot. Carlos was one of those friends. Of course, he helped out. Carlos spoke in a playful manner. Should I tell you another story? What kind of story? After you went to sleep, do you know that countless women came to the county of Kazakh claiming to have borne your child? The county of Kazakh suffered a lot because of it. It looked as if Carlos had hit a sore spot. It was to be expected, since he had heard about the problem from the keepers of prophecy, who were his descendants. Even if he had ten mouths, Azel couldn't say anything about the problem. Can we not talk about that? That isn't possible. I want to tell you the exact details, and I believe it is your duty to hear it out. Shit. I'm all ears. I feel a grim resolve from you. It is akin to when you went into battle with your life on the line. I'll gladly tell you all about it, my friend. Carlos seemed very delighted as he spoke about stories that had piled up within him. While Azel met Carlos, his party was guided towards a different space. A guardian shadow appeared in front of the flustered party, and it spoke to them. Hello everyone. I am Carlos Rizester. I know who all of you are. I've watched all of you through the guardian shadows. What about Azel? Laura was facing the legendary Archmage, but surprisingly, she asked about Azel first. Carlos laughed as he answered her. He seemed amused. He is with me. It has truly been a long time since I've met my friend. Will you not all too friend to catch up for a short time? Of course, the party had no grounds to refuse his request. They had no choice, but to wait until Azel finished talking with Carlos. Still, it is a reunion after 220 years. If they are planning to catch up with each other, four days and four nights won't be enough. Are they going to leave us here for that long? Leticia grumbled. They were in a communal space with magic surrounding them. Faint magic lights floated through the air like fireflies. It lit the surrounding very dimly. The light only reached the vicinity of the party members. 
There was only complete darkness a short distance away. Euron looked at the darkness as he furrowed his brows. I've seen this darkness before. Darkness is darkness. How can a darkness look familiar to you? Leticia rebuked him. However, she was feeling a similar sentiment as him at that moment. The darkness filling this place was infused with remarkable amount of power. Laura spoke. I know what it is. What? This is the great darkness. Everyone startled in surprise. The only one amongst them that had seen the heart of the great darkness was Laura. This was why her words held weight here. Euron queried her. It doesn't look entirely similar, right? I'm not sure. It does feel slightly different, but I cannot put my finger on it. Laura narrowed her eyes as she observed the darkness with her magic. She started using all types of magic to see through to the true nature of the darkness. I'm lost. However, she couldn't see through it. The magical construct was too complex. She could only observe its surface. It was impossible for her to see through to its inner side. Laura wasn't familiar with such an experience. She wasn't as good in battle, but she was one of the top magicians of this generation. The only time she found herself lacking was when she looked at the artifacts left behind by Atane. The Archmage Carlos was a figure of this caliber. But, one could just look at the records inside the Plane of Darkness to know how great Carlos was. He was like Hazel. His abilities transcended the limits of humans. However, she was having a hard time accepting this fact. The magic within the Plane of Darkness had advanced much further compared to the days of the Dragon Demon War. Atain, Ornsaurus and Baldazark had been transcendent beings, but they were exception to the rule. If one looked at the overall approach to magic and research, their descendants had advances past that era. For example, Azel had become surprised when she was able to disguise her dragon demon magic as regular magical energy. Still, it had only been 200 years, yet he was able to recreate the great darkness by himself. Carlos had gained powers that rivaled the dragon demon generals in his twenties. It wasn't, just, two hundred years. It might have been possible if it was him. Still, a combat-oriented magician weren't comparable with other types of magicians. The great darkness wasn't something that could be created just because one was outstanding in battle. If Ornsaurus's handwritten accounts were true, Atain was the only one that had been able to understand the true nature of the great darkness. Those that were connected by the great darkness could transcend the limitations placed by distance. It was possible to speak in real time through the great darkness. This special property allowed one to gather an enormous amount of information. Atain had created greater artifacts using the great darkness as basis. For example, he was able to create results like the road of darkness. He was able to achieve ridiculous results like being able to cause simultaneous magical effects several dozen kilometers away. The great darkness encompassed the whole continent, but there was no burden in maintaining it. There were no magic circles needed, and no facilities were made. In fact, magical energy wasn't needed to maintain the great darkness. This wasn't just something that transcended the common sense of magic. It defied logic of this world. Basically, he had creating something out of nothing. I wonder what kind of person he is. She was really curious. She hadn't been this curious since she had met Azel. Suddenly, the party felt a chill. Who are you? Chapter 184. Two persons. Part 2. Who are you? Chiron's hand moved towards his sword sheath as he asked the question. There was something there beyond the darkness. It wasn't a guardian shadow. It was some being with a powerful presence. I'm not your enemy. An undead made its appearance as it spoke those words. At a glance, this being didn't look like an undead. It was a being wearing a worn-out black robe. However, there was nothing within. The robe was filled with darkness. It is akin to a guardian shadow, but it is an undead. What should we do? If it wasn't an evil spirit, a part of a corpse had to be used as the core to make an undead. Normally, there should be bones that would be visible. This happens once an undead exists for a very long time. Even if the bones are protected by magic, they aren't eternal. Please don't ask how long I've been like this. I do not remember. The undead spoke as if he could read what the others were thinking about him. Chiron queried him. May you reveal who you are? 
I am his messenger. Archmage Carlos messenger. I believe he went by that name before. What about now? There was a strange nuance hidden within his words. However, the undead didn't give the party time to question him any further. He continued to speak. He said it would be rude to make guests wait indefinitely. So he wanted me to deliver what he had prepared for all of you. He prepared something. He prepared items that might be of great strength to you. He has observed you all for a long time. This is why he had prepared tools that will be useful to you. Who? Chiron's eyes shone. The Archmage had created the Guardian Shadows. Of course, Chiron was interested in the tools prepared by him. This was especially true, since he had lost one of his two dragon swords in the battle with Almeric. When he resided within the Alberton Forest, the smith offered to replace his sword as a gift, but he had found the new sword lacking. The undead turned around as he spoke. Please follow me. I will guide you to his armory. The conversation between Azel and Carlos was never-ending. They talked about memories from the Dragon-Demon War, and the events had that occurred during Azel's sleep. Then they talked about events after Carlos receded from the surface of history. There were plenty of topics to talk about. Even if they talked for four days and four nights, they wouldn't have run out of topics to talk about. It is unfortunate that we don't have any alcohol here. I didn't have the means to acquire any alcohol. Still, that is the world's most precious water. Carlos shrugged his shoulders. Azel held a cup made out of ice, and light was sloshing within it. It was groundwater from within the mountain peak of Laos. As expected of the sacred mountain peak, the water contained enormous amount of energy. Carlos had refined it with magic, and Azel was drinking that water. I don't really remember what alcohol tastes like. It is the same with food. It's so faint that I have to ruminate over it through my memories. I think about it until the memories run out. It was a miserable story. However, it was something that happened naturally for an undead. An undead could not experience what it enjoyed as a human. Basically, an undead couldn't enjoy the fruits of being alive. It was the biggest reason why undeads lost their minds over time. Azel could tell that Carlos was a special existence when compared to the other undeads. However, this didn't change the fact that he wasn't alive. No, even if he was alive, memories became altered, and it wore down through the flow of time. Carlos had been trapped in this dark space for over 100 years, so it was inevitable that his past memories eroded away. Azel briefly looked at Carlos, and he brought up a topic he had been putting off. I have a lot I want to ask you. You want to know about events that occurred after I died? Yes. Who who? Where should I start the story from? Carlos hesitated. When he raised his arm, the black chains binding his body clanked. Him. The problems that occurred during that time was so numerous that I'm having a hard time talking about it. In truth, I want to put off talking about it. If possible, I never want to talk about it. If that is what you want, I'm fine with it. Those from the plane of darkness might come here at any moment, yet you are okay with it. Azel had already been worrying about that possibility. However, he spoke in a firm manner. I don't care if they come or not. Ha ha ha. You haven't changed at all, Azel. Carlos let out a cheerful laughter. There was such a bleakness in his voice, but Azel was able to find the voice of Carlos within it. If I was alive, if blood pumped through my heart, I would have shed tears. That's right. I would have immediately rushed out from this place with you and if you want to do it you should do it what's the big deal about you being dead i doesn't matter if you are alive or dead that isn't the important part i'm already dead as l i was removed from the surface of the world and the only thing i can do is to prepare for the future in the dark and damp darkness in historical terms i'm in the same boat the era i lived in died the moment i was put to sleep that's you are carlos it doesn't matter what you look like right now. You are Carlos Rizester, who put your life on the line with me. We fought the Dragon Demon King's army. Who cares if your heart doesn't pump any blood? Azel didn't hesitate as he spoke. A part of his mind thanked Leticia. He had listened to her advice, and he had resolved the indecision within his heart. If he hadn't done so, he wouldn't have been able to express his feelings clearly. If he had been indecisive, 
he might have heard Carlos. Who? Yes. In truth, you don't have to worry about the problem I just spoke about. You mean those bastards from the plane of darkness? Yes, they won't be able to find this place. It has always been that way. I see. Azel didn't ask how this was possible. If Carlos said it, it was based on him having sufficient evidence to make that statement. Azel. Carlos' voice was infused with emotions that he couldn't voice. I'm sorry. About what? I wanted to apologize to you if we ever met again. I want to apologize for not being able to protect the county of Kazakh. You don't have to apologize for that. You did all you could. How can you be so sure? If it's my friend Carlos, I'm sure he would have done exactly that. Carlos' shoulder shook. Only darkness existed where his face should be. But he laughed as he covered his face. It was as if he was sobbing from the grief he felt, but at the same time, one could also feel his joy. It was a confusing laughter. Carlos laughed for a long time before he spoke. If we met when I was alive, we would be having a slightly different conversation. You probably would have gotten angry when I mentioned your baldness. Maybe. No. I'm sure I would have been angry. Maybe. There would have been a distance between us. Because I would have spoken to you like an old man. In the latter years of my life, I pretended to be a respectable archmage. You aren't acting that way right now. Is that so? Geez. I tried my hardest to live, so I could someday treat you as if you were a brat. However, when my body became like this, such thoughts started to fade away. Instead, for a brief moment, Carlos thought about the right expression he wanted to say. From the moment I met you, I feel like my old self. It is as we've gone back to the old days. I see. Azel snickered. It was true that Carlos' attitude towards him hadn't changed much. I've already had a similar conversation in the past. Azel told him about the conversation he had in the past with the Carlos thought construct, who had been old. Carlos started to snicker. I'm glad I left behind my thought construct. It relayed words that I cannot convey to you right now. I've received many benefits from your forethought. No, I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for you. If Carlos hadn't found a way, he wouldn't have been able to win out against Atine's curse. From the moment he had woken up, he had benefited from all the measures taken by Carlos. He wouldn't be here if it wasn't for Carlos planning. The friendship between the two of them had transcended a time span of 220 years. That is why it is my turn to help you. I'll help you in any way I can. Just one. Carlos spoke. I have one request I want to ask of you. Are you planning on asking me to end a time's ambitions? If so, you don't even have to ask it of me. Of course not. The tasks we couldn't finish in our era. Yes, it is our duty. We have to settle it. Is that why you sacrificed yourself? You let yourself become what you are for that reason. It isn't as if I did this, because I wanted to do it. I know, you probably did it, because you had no choice. What is your request? I'll grant whatever request you have. You promise? Of course. When Azel nodded his head, Carlos spoke. Let's talk about that later. Before I can tell you my request, you have to know some other facts first. If you have something you want to hear first, ask me it. Azel furrowed his brows at Carlos' words. However, he followed Carlos' suggestion instead of questioning him. I heard it from Alberton. As compensation, you traded a time's curse to him. He spoke as if something meaningful had happened. What was it? That old dragon should have told you everything if he went so far as to tell you that. He always does such annoying. I know right. He is a dragon yet he acts like a naughty old man. The feelings the two of them felt for Alberton was completely synced, so they sniggered. Soon, Carlos confessed to something Azel could have never imagined. Azel, in truth, I failed in the attempt in saving you. What? The disappearance of the curse inflicted on you had nothing to do with the sleep of the dragons. There is a really important story I have to tell you. Carlos had suggested the sleep of the dragons in attempt to save Azel from a Tyne's curse. The dragon and dragon magens displayed a surprising amount of life force during their hibernation. In exchange for entering a period of no activity, a wound that could have killed a dragon or a dragon magen could be healed over a long period of time. However, one was completely defenseless in this state. It was unlike the hibernation of other animals. 
There was proof that magic was active during this sleep. Carlos took notice of this characteristic. Since Azel possessed dragon demon magic that exceeded most dragon demons, he hypothesized that Azel would be able to overcome the curse through the sleep of the dragons. I was too naive. At the time, I didn't even know what a Tyne's curse was, and I failed in identifying the true nature of this curse. I merely allowed you to maximize your strength. It allowed you to resist against the curse, but I couldn't find another way to defeat the curse at the time. However, I woke up from the 200-year sleep, and I recovered from the curse. The curse didn't disappear, because you recovered from it. I found this out later, but the curse wasn't something that could be overcome with just power. It was obvious if I look back on it. Atain was the founder of magic, and he reached the zenith in the art of magic. A being of that caliber had used this curse in the moment of his death. It was Atain's final technique. So why did the curse disappear? I eliminated it. What? Chapter 185. Two Persons. Part 3. I'm the one that eliminated your curse. Despite this fact, there are two reasons why you slept for a long time. First, Carlos eliminated the curse after Azel fell asleep for over 100 years. Until that moment, Azel had been using his hibernation to resist against the curse, and he had been persistent in hanging on to his life. Secondly, the damage he had taken from the curse had put him close to death. It took a long time for Azel to recover from it. I woke up with my rings of life missing not because of the long sleep. The curse ate away at it. If it wasn't for your rings of life, you would have died before I was able to circumvent the curse. So that's how it was. Azel was astonished. He knew something had gone awry, but he hadn't expected this. What was the true identity of the curse? Alberton had revealed that Atine's curse hadn't been placed there only to kill Azel. Alberton had revealed that there was some profound intent behind the curse. Carlos spoke. Dragon Demon General. What are you saying? Atain planned on making you the new Dragon Demon General, Azel. What? Azel couldn't hide the shock he was feeling. What nonsense was he saying? However, Carlos was serious. Let's look at our current situation. All the dragon weapons of the dragon demon generals had been preserved. Regus's corpse had been destroyed, yet he was brought back as a special breed of undead. How was he revived as this special undead? Moreover, Almeric was able to come fully back to life, because his corpse had been recovered. How was this all possible? What's worse is that Atain is trying to revive himself too. Laura surmised that this was all possible thanks to the great darkness. That is correct. They stored their essence within the great darkness, and this allows them to be revived. What is the great darkness? How can it bring about such miracles? If I try to explain it in a concise manner. Him. Yes. Let us say there are beings that had gained transcendent power. It is the graveyard for those that had reached for immortality. A graveyard. There were beings that couldn't die, and those that were dead that still wanted to live forever. It's a graveyard that promised eternal sleep for these beings. You are explaining in a prose that magicians love to use. I have no idea what you are trying to say. Ha ha ha. If I start getting into the specifics, the explanation will become endless. However, I'll tell you about a figure you have to know. There was a being named Belrun from a long time ago. What did he do? He was called the King of Death. He was the original black magician. That's a very grandiose title. I don't think I've heard about him before. He was a figure buried in legends. However, he once pushed the world to the brink of its demise. He was the first amongst the numerous creatures of this world to defy death. He became an undead. He also used his experience of becoming an undead to create summoning techniques that taunted death. It was the same story told by Ragus to Chains. A living being feels pain because one is alive. That is why I will make everyone into an undead. Everyone will transcend the cycle of life and death. This will free everyone from the, the pain caused by the four phases of life. Belrun was a madman that had tried to bring his ambition into reality. The problem was the fact that Belrun had the enough power to bring his ambition into fruition. He was the first to defy death, and he shook the foundation of the world by causing all kinds of disasters. He caused countless deaths. In the end, 
he was defeated at the hands of Atene, Almeric and Regus. So they were once heroes, who saved the world. That isn't the entire story, but it is part of it. However, even Atene was unable to kill Belrun. Belrun had transcended death, and it was more apt to say that he was a godlike figure. Atene put Belrun in a sleep that he couldn't wake up from. Then Atene sealed him. The method he used to bring about this result was the Great Darkness. Belrun wasn't the only one trapped within the Great Darkness. He wasn't the first nor would he be the last. There were beings that the world couldn't handle. These transcendent beings threatened the balance of the world through their madness. Atene methodically defeated these beings, and he had sealed them within the Great Darkness. It was odd. These were beings that transcended the mysteries of the world. They had become immortals, and every single one of them had gone mad. They couldn't accept the world that was in front of them, so they tried to change the world into their image. Every time such an event occurred, Atene and his comrades fought to defend the world. Moreover, the power of the sealed beings became the basis for creating the Great Darkness. This is my guess, but Atene probably hadn't expected such a result to occur. Atene had realized that it was impossible to indefinitely seal the power of these near-immortal beings. This was why he further developed the Great Darkness. These were beings that could not perish. How could one seal beings that continuously regenerated? It was impossible. Atene put him to sleep, and he created a method where their power was being continuously consumed. Atene used the power generated by these beings as pillar to a feedback structure that encompassed the world. It was a system that continuously sealed them using their own power, and it continuously inflicted loss on their power. The Great Darkness possessed immense possibility, and when the power of these beings mixed with the Great Darkness, the Great Darkness started to change. The Great Darkness was something that transcended magic. Atene had created it, but it had become part of the world. This caused a huge wound to be formed on this world. So they were able to use the power of Belrun to revive themselves. It is part of the reason. The power to make the undead allowed him to make the special undead. However, that power couldn't wholly bring someone back to life. Regus was a result that was achieved using Belrun's power. Him. It seems we've strayed off topic. What about the part where he was trying to make me a dragon general? I need to tell you this story. If not, you won't be able to understand the conclusion. Atene targeted you with the curse, because he wanted to make you part of the Great Darkness. Him. It means you would have been a subordinate to the Great Darkness like Almeric and Regus. That. Azel stopped breathing for a moment. If he had died by Atene's curse, would he have been reborn in this era like Almeric? Yes. You would have become the new dragon demon general. You would have had to obey Atene. Azel became chilled with fright. He never expected such a plot from Atene. His attempt failed. I was barely able to find out the true nature of the curse, and I was able to eliminate it. By this time, you've been asleep for well over 100 years. Azel felt an ominous feeling as he queried Carlos. Were you in this state? Or were you still your former self? No. So how were you able to accomplish it? Carlos couldn't exit this place. It had been the same at the time. The Guardian Shadows were created at a later date. Basically, he didn't have any subordinates that could have helped him take care of his business. That was what Azel surmised. As expected, you are quite sharp. I, Carlos spoke with a bitterness in his voice. I became part of the Great Darkness. While Azel and Carlos were conversing, the other party members were walking down a tunnel created within the mountain peak of Laos. They felt a chill. Chiron spoke using the whispering technique. It is creepy here. Is everyone an undead here? There were countless stone cases, clothes and armor filled with darkness lining the tunnel. It seemed they were all vessels containing an undead. Euron spoke. I guess so. They are all very powerful undead. They feel similar to the guardian shadows. They felt similar to the sleepless guardians who had accompanied the keepers of the prophecy. They felt distinct from the normal undead, and they seemed to possess more power. Chiron posed a question. Why won't they mobilize them onto the field? With this amount of troops, the ongoing fight would be resolved much easier. The sleepless guardians were powerful beings. However, they had possessed a limitation. 
they had been tied to the keepers of prophecy. However, if there were more beings like them, they would be able to further restrict the activities of the dragon demon king worshippers. It is an unsatisfying situation. The party reached their destination. There was a space along the tunnel that had been widened, and the items for the party had been readied there. The undead spoke. Please look on top of the stone altar engraved with your name. It was as he said. The space contained wide stone pillars that had the name of Chiron, Laura, Leticia and Euron engraved on it. On top of these altars, there were items that were infused with powerful magic. It seems they really prepared items that are tailored to each of us. Chiron expressed his amazement. There was a sword that looked similar to his dragon sword, and there was a set of armor that looked similar to the one he wore in the past. These items didn't contain any dragon demon magic, but one could tell that they were powerful magical weapons. Leticia received a new spear and armor. Laura received a magic tome that contained Carlos' knowledge, and a coat that was infused with magic. They also received accessories that were complementary to the gears they received. Why do I only get this? Euron sounded as if he was about to cry. It was to be expected. You only received that. Chiron was taken aback. Euron was given an iron box that was the size of his fist. Euron furrowed his brows. Wow, since he is my ancestor, my hopes were high. How can this be? It seems you just look like him. You might not be his descendant. That's not possible. You heard what Azel and Almeric said, right? Euron grumbled as he looked over the box. It didn't look special, but a change occurred when he inserted his magical energy into the box. To my descendant Euron Rizesta, when he inserted his magical energy, he heard the voice of Carlos within his head. This is the box of hope. Box of hope. If you open this box, you will be greeted by an irrevocable destruction. The name and the description didn't match up. I promise you this. In return, you will be able to overcome any danger using this. It is used for suicide bombing. Euron grumbled. Basically, he would have to sacrifice his life to obtain enormous power. However, the explanation hadn't ended yet. Then you will find out the truth. Truth. This is a truth you must know. The miracle is the price for this truth. The choice is up to you, my descendant. Carlos' explanation ended there. However, Euron dumbfoundedly stared at the box for a long time. Truth. What truth is he talking about? Is he perhaps talking about the identity of the guide? He had a lot of guesses, but he was leery at the fact that he couldn't pinpoint what Carlos was talking about. Euron furrowed his brows. Chapter 186. Two Persons. Part 4. A silence descended between the two of them. Azul's face hardened for a brief moment, but he patiently waited for Carlos to continue his story. Carlos read trust from Azul's demeanor. No matter what, Azul's trust in him didn't waver. Even if they were to become adversaries, Azel would assume he had a good reason for his actions. Azel had absolute trust in him. Ah, ah, the fact that he could enjoy the confidence of someone was moving. He had made the right choices. He had pursued this even at the expense of his body, and he hadn't been wrong. Carlos regretted the fact that he could no longer shed tears. It had been a long time for him. The time exceeded the lifespan of a human. He armored himself with a firm conviction as he fought for the future. However, even if one possessed a strong conviction, humans were endlessly wavering creatures. Even an object from nature like the boulder became weathered over time. Humans were continuously changing creatures. How hard would it have been for a human to remain unchanging? It was the same for Carlos. Carlos hadn't had anyone to support him through the fight he waged on his own. He felt endless regret, doubt and despair. Azel. Carlos regretted the fact that he could no longer put on a bright smile. The fact that I was able to meet you again. I've been compensated for the pain I've felt up until now. He had hope. Even if his soul wore down from the despair, he felt. He believed there would come a day when someone would tell him that he had been right. However, those words couldn't come from just anyone. It had to be spoken by one person, and he had used every method in his arsenal to give this person a life and a future. Carlos had waited for him. He wanted the reliable and strong person from his memories to show up one day. 
He had wanted to see this person laugh again. He had persevered in the darkness of despair, and at this moment, he had received his reward. Azel smirked. Stop talking nonsense. It is the same problem now as in the old times. You pretend as if something is of great import to test the reaction of others. We've already exhausted every test we can pose each other. It has been over 200 years, but it seems old habits die hard. Carlos cheerfully gave an explanation. As you probably know, I created the Guardian Shadows. However, it wasn't created solely through my power. The Guardian Shadows were an amazing piece of magic. However, it was something that transcended magic. It used every person on this world as a surveillance net for the Dragon Demon King worshippers. Moreover, the Guardian Shadows were made up of members that died with an eternal enmity against the Dragon Demon King worshippers. At its foundation, the structure of the Guardian Shadows is similar to the Great Darkness. It's because I made them using the Great Darkness. The Great Darkness used transcendent beings like Belrun as pillars. However, they weren't the only ones that were present within the Great Darkness. There were other doomed souls that wished for eternal life. There was a large cluster of souls that made up the Great Darkness. Amongst these souls, some are able to manifest in this world as supernatural beings. Regus and Almeric is an example. Their essence remained within the Great Darkness. That was why they were revived every time they were killed. If the body remains intact, they were revived back to their living state. If the body was destroyed, they were brought back as an undead. The power of Belrun is the main engine that powers the revival. Aside from this ability, the power of many other beings were added to Atine's technique. I became part of the Great Darkness, and I stole part of his power. I was able to create a technique that was independent from Atain. It was similar to Great Darkness within the Plane of Darkness. Both Ain Sarah and Almeric had access to the Great Darkness. Carlos had gone through a different process, so he wasn't beholden to Atain. He was able to create the Guardian Shadows. Aside from the Keepers of Prophecy, the Guardian Shadows are immortals. They can't be easily killed, and even if one is able to kill them, they are revived after time passes. Is that why their numbers continue to grow even after fighting the Demon King worshippers over the years? Yes. For example, there are over 3,000 Guardian Shadows gathered outside of this mountain. There are many more Guardian Shadows that are spread across the continent, and they are thwarting the plans of the Dragon Demon King worshippers. If there are 3,000, that is almost the amount that assembled last time. Are you saying you can bring more of them here? It means that there are that many beings, who hold a grudge against the Demon King worshippers. I've gathered such numbers even though I started the Guardian Shadow technique less than a hundred years ago. Carlos let out a bleak laughter. The number of Guardian Shadows was directly correlated to the number of wicked deeds carried out by the Dragon Demon King worshippers. Why do you think the Keepers of the Prophecy weren't immortals like the Guardian Shadows? It's because you wanted to deliver the Dragon Weapons and Dragon Demon Magic to me. Why did you use that particular method? Azel had given all his dragon weapons to Carlos before he went to sleep. Why had he chosen to use the Keepers of the Prophecy to bring the weapons into this era? They were needed. I was able to preserve the Sky Splitter by connecting it to you. I couldn't do that with the other dragon weapons. Why didn't you give it to others? It was my selfishness. I wanted to give it all back to you when you returned. If you look at the result, I think I made the right choice. He was right. If Carlos had given Azul's dragon weapons to other people, the dragon demon king worshippers would have made sure to destroy them. Also, it isn't as if I tried to preserve all of them. I passed on two dragon weapons. He had given one to Azul's adopted child, who took over the county of Kazakh after Azel. The other one was given to the country's most promising hero, Hauer, they weren't able to pass on their weapon. Then there's the one. I blew it. What? I'll tell you about it a little bit later. Azel was taken aback, but Carlos waved his hand to calm him. Carlos' explanation left much to be desired. However, Azel had seen the exception to what he was describing. Weren't the dragon weapons of the dragon demon generals preserved in the great darkness? I tried to do the same thing. However, 
I wasn't able to perfect it like Attain. I couldn't find a solution that dealt with the wear and tear that accumulated over time. In the end, I needed living vessels, so I created the keepers of prophecy out of need. I see. I am part of the great darkness, but that doesn't mean I'm capable of doing everything Attain is capable of doing. The other side can't create the guardian shadows like me. I'm able to copy certain things created by Attain, but there are also things I cannot copy. Did you see Ragus? He's only an undead, yet he was able to use his dragon weapon. On top of that, he's able to temporarily use his dragon demon magic. Ah, that was jaw dropping. It is possible, because Ragus and the soul hammer resides within the great darkness. I decided to impart the dragon weapons and dragon demon magic to the keepers of prophecy, and I kept them from aging. It seems I owe a lot to my descendants. Azel let out a bitter laughter. It didn't matter what an amazing feat of magic the keepers of prophecy were. He could only express his respects towards the keepers of prophecy, and he would continue their will. Carlos looked into the empty air as he spoke. I did them wrong, but there was no other choice. There was no choice left for them and me. I didn't say those words, because I blame you. I know. Carlos sneered at himself as he continued to speak. I was able to take over part of the great darkness, and it was the foothold needed for me to create the guardian shadows. Instead of giving the keepers of prophecy immortality, I imbued them with special powers. Alpha was able to suppress undead power using his gaze. This was possible, because he had imbued part of Belrun's power to Alpha. Omega was able to peek into the great darkness that was under the control of Ainsera. This was possible, because their essence were within the great darkness. If Atain was alive, this would have been impossible. He would have recognized my presence, and he would have acted accordingly to counter my actions. However, Ainsera and Almeric received only a limited power over the great darkness. They are merely custodians. Ainsera was limited to keeping the system created by Atain rolling. Just doing this had caused her sense of self to erode. You were the one that stopped Ornsaurus and Baldazark from being revived. That's right. As I've explained to you before, this was one of the advantages I gained from joining the Great Darkness. The four dragon demon generals had become part of the Great Darkness. However, only Ragus and Almeric had been revived. Ornsaurus and Baldazark had met their true death. This was a feat accomplished by Carlos from within the Great Darkness. So the fact that they were killed instead Ragus and Almeric wasn't a coincidence. I chose that outcome. As always, I aim for the optimal result. Yes, in truth, I could have buried either Almeric and Ragus if I had chosen to do so. I could have theoretically eliminated three dragon demon generals, but I chose not to. He could bury two for certain. Carlos chose certainty in his fight. He picked Ornsaurus and Baldazark. They were magicians. In terms of battle capabilities, they were archmages that rivaled Atain. If they were revived, they would have been able to manage the great darkness better. Is that the reason why they were chosen? That's correct. If Ornsaurus and Baldazark were present, Carlos might not have been able to make the guardian shadows. Carlos changed the topic. Azel, you talked to my thought construct before, right? After you went to sleep, the world faced two threats. I did. Carlos thought construct had told him this. Absolute calamities that threatened the entire humanity had appeared, and the death of Atain had released them onto this world. In the context of our previous conversation, this being had been sealed within the great darkness. Yes, you became like this in the process of blocking them. Correct. Carlos shrugged his shoulders as he gave an explanation. You might not be too interested in this, but it is important for me to explain what kind of being she was. The second calamity. I think I know what it is even if you don't tell me. Let's talk about the first one for now. Our comrades that survived the dragon demon war fought against the first being that was unsealed. We joined forces with the younger generation to stop her. This incident spurred me to research the dangers of the great darkness. Which being was it? She was the first to create the dragon weapon. Her name was Ixeru. Azul's eyes widened in surprise. I heard from Alberton at a later date that she was from the era of the Five Star Kingdom. 
I believe she was a descendant of Atain. I heard about her. She's a female dragon demon. It seems the old man have already told you that story. It was in passing. He didn't put much importance on the story. Azel grumbled. It would have been better if Alberton had told him this story earlier. Carlos cackled as he spoke. She was. That's right. She wasn't a magician. She was a dragon arts practitioner. She created the first dragon weapon, and it allowed her to realize a desire she shouldn't have had. What kind of desire? Chapter 187. Two Persons. Part 5. Immortality. She didn't want immortality for herself. She wanted immortality for others. It was a time when humans died easily. It seemed she couldn't stand it when the humans she treasured kept dying. Her dragon weapon could exhibit incredible abilities, but she couldn't achieve her wish. In the end, it was like a curse for her. Ixeru had become an immortal, yet she tried to make her loved ones into immortal. However, they didn't become full immortals. On top of that, they weren't the same beings that she had loved. Did they become monsters? That's right. They became monsters that could extend their lifespan by eating their own species. What's worse, the cursed beings started to spread like a plague. They were autonomous, and they were able to create beings just like them. As a price for immortality, their humanity was destroyed. They also couldn't procreate like humans. They could only eat and infect other humans. They were like a disease. These beings couldn't exist without eating humans, and they couldn't control their appetite. If left alone, these beings would have wiped out the human race. Moreover, they were fated to be wiped out after no humans were left on this world. This was why Atain sealed Ixeru in the Great Darkness, and the souls of the cursed beings were made part of the Great Darkness. Azel was at a loss for words. She really was someone that threatened the existence of humanity. She was an ancient being, yet she was incredibly strong. We were barely to win out against her. Unlike Atain, we were able to kill her. Didn't you say she was immortal? How is that possible? Unlike Atain from the Five Stars Kingdom era, we had a solution. You came up with it. It was a technique you used to kill Atain. Are you talking about extreme extermination? Azel brought up the word he hadn't thought about for a long time. Extreme extermination. During the Dragon Demon War, it was the final domain reached by Azel. He had an abundance of Dragon Demon magic, and he had connected his 13 dragon weapons to maximize his power. The sword made out of light cut through the sky, and it produced a near-infinite hail of swords. If that power was focused in one place, it would create an extreme destructive phenomena that would destroy everything in this world. That was the extreme extermination. It was a phenomenon that could be raised using the light sword. Without it, he wouldn't have been able to win against Atain. Were you able to replicate it? It had several troublesome restrictions, but we were able to successfully replicate it. We used it to kill a being that was considered to be unkillable. That was why Atain had sealed her in the first place. However, isn't Atain is going to revive? Atain isn't an immortal existence. He left his essence within the great darkness. You really did kill him with your sword. Since his essence was within the great darkness, he just needed time to revive from his death. It didn't matter if he was killed. If the great darkness existed, he would always revive someday. This was true for Atain and the dragon demon generals. I see. Azel accepted his words. In the final battle against Atain, the extreme extermination had a crucial role in defeating Atain. Atain's defensive magic spells were sturdier than a castle, yet the extreme extermination had pierced through all of them. Azel was able to inflict a critical wound on Atain. However, Atain wasn't killed by the extreme extermination. He had fallen to Azel's sky splitter. If Atain had been killed by the extreme extermination, he wouldn't have been able to leave behind a curse or even a will. Carlos continued to speak. Unlike him, Ixeru couldn't be killed by any other method except for the extreme extermination. It was the result of her immortality. Before Azel discovered the extreme extermination phenomena, the beings sealed by Atain were immortals for all intents and purposes. They became injured when they were stabbed, and they lost energy when they performed activities. However, their ability to heal was endless. 
It didn't matter if their bodies were destroyed, or they exhausted their energy. They never died. Since we found a method called extreme extermination, they were no longer true immortals. Once they are killed, they cannot revive. Does that mean it is also the answer to destroying the great darkness? You are absolutely correct. Carlos clapped his hands. Azel had picked up on one of the key points Carlos had been trying to convey. They had to destroy the great darkness. If they don't destroy the great darkness, Atain would continue being revived. The problem had always been the fact that they didn't have a realistic way to destroy the great darkness. Each pillar holding up the great darkness were immortal beings. They had been sealed there, because Atain couldn't destroy them. Moreover, each being were powerful enough to threaten the existence of humanity. They were calamities. They were powerful evil from myths, and they were on par with the dragon demon war in terms of threat to humanity. However, things are different now. We have the extreme extermination technique, and we have you, who can carry out that method. We can end it. Can't you do it too? You've recreated the extreme extermination already. I just have to teach you the secret. Didn't I tell you that there were troublesome restrictions to me using it? Azel, do you know why you were the first one in history to reach the domain of extreme extermination? Extreme extermination was a phenomena, discovered, by Azel. Atain was the founder of magic. He was someone that could change the rules of the world. Yet the extreme extermination had caused fear in such a being. Azel thought for a brief moment before he answered Carlos. Is it the sky splitter? You are correct. That weapon had started out as a beam of light, but it evolved to being able to control all forms of light. It is also possible to materialize light. It can shift between the material and immaterial world. Your dragon weapon transcends the common sense of this world. During the dragon demon war, Azel had been full of dragon demon magic. He had eight rings of life, and he possessed thirteen dragon weapons. For a short amount of time, he could generate power that rivaled Atain. However, the extreme extermination couldn't be reached just because one could generate massive amounts of power. One couldn't reach it even if one was able to concentrate the power into a single point. These two prerequisites had to be activated at the same time. On top of that, a high-dimensional power that transcended the common sense of the world had to be applied. The Sky Splitter was a dragon weapon that had reached this domain. The Dance of Shadows allowed Azel to be in multiple places, and his Sky Splitter could be used anywhere light could be reached. When he held his sword, he reached a domain that transcended time and space. No one except Azel could have defeated Atain in an one-on-one -on -one battle. No matter how hard I tried, I couldn't copy the Sky Splitter's ability. On the other hand, the abilities your other dragon weapons could be copied over time through time and effort. This was why Carlos had chosen to store the Sky Splitter with Azel. He determined that the Sky Splitter was something that was too important to be lost. Since I didn't have the Sky Splitter, I needed a sacrifice to create the extreme extermination phenomena. What sacrifice? I had to use a dragon weapon as a sacrifice. Azel swallowed his breath. The meaning behind Carlos' words were clear. At the very least, I have to sacrifice a dragon weapon to create the extreme extermination phenomena. Moreover, it can't be a dragon weapon that hasn't yet reached its stable form. I needed a dragon weapon of a caliber that could generate a certain scale of destructive power. Did you perhaps? Yes, I used my dragon weapon. A dragon weapons wasn't a simple tool. It was a clone of one's soul. Carlos had developed his dragon weapon over a long period of time and it had been his companion through many life and death situations. What emotions would he have felt when he had to sacrifice his dragon weapon for a single use of a technique? Azel was having a hard time imagining the sense of loss that would have been felt by Carlos. Carlos spoke. The second calamity was dismal. When he faced the second calamity, Carlos felt despair. In the first calamity, he had faced the dragon demon Ixeru, who had created the first dragon weapon. His side had taken massive loss in the fight against her. This was why Carlos hadn't been confident that he could avert the second calamity. My personal power had suffered, and I had lost most of my comrades. Moreover, the number of people that were willing to follow me was much smaller. 
Even during the fight against Ixeru, most of the veteran heroes of the Dragon Demon War were old or dead. The ones that were still alive had lost most of their battle capabilities they had possessed during their prime. Moreover, many of the survivors from the Dragon Demon War died in the fight against Ixeru. As time passed, our closest friends started to pass on to the next life one by one. Of course, the new generation produced many that possessed excellent talent. However, was it because there was a lack of urgency compared to era of the Dragon Demon War? Only a very small number of the new generation were helpful. The fight against Ixeru was the impetus for me to start researching the Great Darkness. It allowed me to predict the time and location of the Second Calamity. That calamity was Belrun. Yes, the Second Calamity was the King of Death, Belrun. He was the first to transcend life and death. He had denied death through his own power to become the first immortal. Thankfully, I had plenty of time to prepare. I gathered companions, who were willing to fight with me. Moreover, I prepared an ace in the hole. At the time, he had no idea how strong Belrun was. Since he was a magician from ancient times, he might be unexpectedly weak. On the other hand, he might be strong like Ixeru. The only thing certain was the fact that they couldn't give Belrun the time to recuperate. They had to stop him before he could gather information on this era. If he gained knowledge of the current era's magic, it was all over. This was why Carlos had led his comrade to the faraway mountain range of Atazan. Carlos had known when and where the fight would start. Belrun still didn't possess any information of the current era, so Carlos decided to use his final move from the start. I started the fight off with the extreme extermination. I'm sorry, I used your dragon weapon as sacrifice. I see. Carlos was able to get a direct hit in against Belrun. Thanks to the attack, they were able to gain a complete advantage over Belrun. However, the dragon weapon wasn't the only cost of using the extreme extermination. A significant backlash prevented Carlos from using the move again in the battle. He hadn't been able to end everything with the surprise attack. That was his mistake. Since events had turned out like that, it was impossible to kill Belrun. What was his options? Should he have tried to seal Belrun like Atane had done? Even that was impossible. There was a reason why I couldn't do it. Atane had the great darkness. Carlos didn't have anything. It was impossible to seal a being like Belrun with a simple seal spell. In the end, I made a choice. Carlos didn't explain any further. Azul's face became distorted. He could guess what method was used to seal Belrun. You became the vessel that sealed Belrun. That is correct. The sound of laughter flowed out from Carlos' face, which was shrouded with darkness. It was a sad and empty sounding laughter. Chapter 188. Two Persons. Part 6. Carlos had used himself as a vessel to seal Belrun. He had done something equivalent to becoming Belrun. Carlos had sealed Belrun, but the effects didn't hit him immediately. He had accepted the dangers of sealing Belrun within him, but he had thought he would be able to come up with a solution. This was why Carlos had been happy in the moment of his victory, and he had celebrated with his comrades. However, he realized a bleak truth as time passed. This method won't work. I have to reproduce the same environment as when Belrun was sealed. After he agonized over it, Carlos came to a decision. Belrun's power was eating away at him, and his body was turning undead. This was why he had headed towards the mountain peak of Laos, and he had joined the Great Darkness. Finally, he was able to completely seal away Belrun. The price of his action was on display right now. He had nailed himself to this place. He was neither dead or alive. Instead of living the life of a human, he became weathered by the long passage of time. Azel felt wretched as he looked towards Carlos. Was that really the only method available to you? There was nothing else. Even now I cannot come up with a different method. If he hadn't stopped Belrun, humanity would have been wiped out before Atane was revived. I regretted my decision countless times, and I despaired over it. However, I made the right choice. No one else could have done this. I was the only one. He knew it. He knew it all too well. Still, he felt tormented. His anguish was so large that he started to hate the world. The world required endless sacrifice from him. 
He had to eternally suffer in this hell, so selfish and ignorant people could enjoy their peace. Wouldn't it be better if he had ended everything? If I didn't know for certain that you were going to wake up, I would have become a demon king that despised this world. Azel would wake up someday. It was the only thread that maintained Carlos' resolve. When Azel returned, his self-mortification would be over. He would no longer despise the world, which needed his sacrifice to roll along. He just wanted to see the smile of his friend, who would end all of this. Azel would take over his responsibilities, and he would wrap things up. If it's you, you'll be able to end it. I want you put an end to this long and disgusting fight. Without fail, Azel held back his tears as he nodded his head. I'll end it with my hands. Well, it is time for me to tell you my request. After hearing Azel's answer, Carlos spoke in a tired manner. Please kill me, Azel. What? For a moment, Azel was sure he had misheard Carlos' words. Carlos tilted his head. Ah, I guess kill is the wrong word to use. I'm already dead. In this case, stop joking around. Azel raised his voice. His voice trembled. He couldn't hide the confusion he was feeling. What nonsense are you talking? Don't be like that, Azel. What? You already know. This isn't the time to throw a tantrum. There is no way you don't already know this. Azel's face hardened when Carlos spoke to him as if he was trying to soothe a child. However, it was akin to a crack forming on ice. His face started to slowly distort into a wretched expression. I'm already dead. Moreover, I'm closely related to Belrun. Carlos and Belrun were already two sides of the same coin. One side couldn't be preserved while eliminating the other side. You probably realized it, while you listened to my story. Isn't that right? You shouldn't lie. You. No. I don't want to be deceived. Azel looked as if he was about to cry. Carlos laughed when he saw Azel's expression. We aren't kids anymore. Haven't we sent several of our friends to the next life with our hands? Are you going to cry again? Why? It had occurred several times during the Dragon Demon War. They had taken care of those that were dying and in pain. They ended those that were changing into monsters, so they could die as humans. Then there were the undeads created by their enemies. These undeads attacked their old friends. Azel and Carlos had put them them to rest. However, Azel never expected to carry out such a deed in this era. Moreover, he never imagined he would have to do it to Carlos. How can you ask me to? It is something only you can do. Carlos looked up into the empty air as he spoke. Azel couldn't see his face, but he got a feeling that Carlos had a peaceful smile on his face. It was as if Carlos had let go of all the burdens that he had carried all through his life. I couldn't sleep for a very long time. Do you know why? I knew that Belrun would awaken when I went to sleep. I had to look at this darkness as I took in everything. Carlos had been in hell. For all these years, Carlos wasn't allowed to rest even for a second. The only reason he was able to endure through the years was the fact that he believed this moment would come some day. I'm tired now. No, I've been tired for a very long time. Please show me mercy, Azel. You. Azel's throat was choked up, so he was having a hard time speaking. You are a tenacious bastard, Carlos. I know. That is why I was able to last this long in this state. Carlos pointed toward his chest. I want you to pull this out of me. It is my last present to you. It was a wooden staff with a clear and round gem embedded at the top. It was pierced through Carlos' chest. If you take this out, he'll be released. Then, Carlos raised his hand as he pointed towards Azel. He will fight you. Belrun knows what I know. When the seal is broken, Belrun's consciousness will push to the fore. If that happens, he won't die quietly. You evil bastard. Azel grinded his teeth. His vision started to turn murky. Azel realized that he had started crying at some point. Carlos spoke to Azel. You promised, right? Yes. Azel spoke in a hoarse voice as he extended his hands. I'll grant your wish, you bastard. Oh, it has been a while since you've cussed at me. When Azel grabbed the staff, Carlos looked up at him as he spoke. Azel. I'm sorry. Azel roughly extracted the staff. A thunderous roar rang out, and the mountain peak of Laos, which had existed for perpetuity, shook. 
The party had returned to the initial room, and they had been waiting for Azel. They became surprised. What was going on? What the hell? Chiron's expression hardened. What is it? A frightening wave of power was spreading into the surrounding. It wasn't just one. There were two of them. Moreover, one of them was very familiar to the party. Azel has brought out his sky splitter. Laura spoke, and at the same time, she activated her dragon demon magic. Come forth dragon weapon. Vitten's chalice. The Vitten's chalice made its appearance. It looked as if it was made from semi-transparent glass. Laura took hold of it as she spoke. Enemies are coming this way. All at once, every member felt the gazes that were trained on them. From all direction, the beings without a real body started to show up. They were spirits that were being controlled by an evil power. Chiron unsheathed his two swords, and he couldn't hide his dismay. Aren't they controlled by Carlos? So why? I did have feelings of unease with them. However, that isn't the problem we should be focusing on right now. It is too cramped to fight in here. We should head out to assess what is going on right now. Leticia quickly made an assessment. Laura nodded her head. Yes, a distortion formed on the wall as the Path of Tears was activated. Chiron bit his lips. I was wondering why everything was going so smoothly. When he swung his dual swords, dragon demon magic spread out like a storm as it swept up the spirits. As horrific screams filled with evil rang out, the party exited Laos through the Path of Tears. Then, it's Azel. Laura pointed towards the sky. A pillar of light that looked like lightning and fire streaked through the sky. It was the sky splitter. After streaking across the skies over Laos, the light started to move all over the place. Who is he fighting? The power being emitted by Azel was terrifying. Even as Azel's comrades, the incredible amount of dragon demon magic being generated by Azel shocked them. It spread into the surrounding like hail. At that moment, the streak of light created by Azel converged with the streak of darkness. They knew at a glance. The streak of darkness was another gathering of incredible magical energy. The streaking of light and darkness clashed against each other. It looked as if a ball of darkness was bouncing around in the sky. Belatedly, the sound of the explosions started to reach them. The streak of light moved faster than the speed of sound, and an incredible shockwave formed when it clashed against the darkness. There was enough destructive force to destroy a mountain. It could dry up a lake. Laura understood the situation. Azel forced the battle into the skies. Why would he do that? Chiron was puzzled. He could tell at an instinctual level the enemy was powerful. However, why did Azel drag him up into the sky? If the enemy was a powerful being, wouldn't he want combined forces with his comrades to defeat him? Laura shook her head from side to side. It seemed she had asked the same question to herself. I'm not sure. Was there a need for him to fight alone? Or did he want to fight alone? Him. In my opinion. Suddenly, Leticia looked aside as she spoke. It seems Azel is trying to dump them onto us. When Laura opened her path of tears, tunnels made using spatial distortion appeared on the wall. Undeads leading an army of spirits started appearing from within these tunnels. Chiron asked a question to the undead that stood in the front. Didn't you say you aren't our enemy? He was the undead that had lead him to the armory. The undead, who didn't possess a single fragment of bone, shrugged his shoulders. I did at the time. Do you really think there is permanence to an antagonistic relationship between rational beings? It isn't to my knowledge. It has been a long time since I've been a human. I guess the common sense of humans could have changed in that time. I see. It seems you are either a philosopher or a magician. It seems your tongue is spouting unnecessarily complex ideas. Thank you for the compliment. You guys will be great opponents for a warm-up. Since I cannot help my mast, I'll have to help him by killing you all. Master. Carlos. I called him that until a moment ago. There was another layer of nuance to his words. Laura realized something. I see why he is in the sky. Him. What do you mean? When Chiron queried her, she gave an explanation. Azel is fighting the enemy that is the source to this power. However, the undeads and the souls can't reach them when they are up so high. Basically, Azel is weakening that unknown being's power by fighting him in the air. Maybe, 
A few undead could reach the sky. However, they couldn't all reach there. I see. I can see what role Azel wants us to play in this. While Azel fought in the sky, his party was tasked to fight the undead and the army of souls. Chiron shook off the confusion he was feeling. He queried her. Laura, can't you block them from coming out? Unfortunately, there are too many holes. It is like an ant mound. It was as she said. Numerous dimensional distortions were used to create paths, and countless undeads were coming out from them. How very unfortunate. Shit. It is midday, yet we have to watch these unpleasant beings wriggle free. Surprisingly, undeads and spirits were crawling out into the middle of the day. It seemed they didn't feel any pain from the sunlight. Are their powers reduced? Him. When there is so many of them, I guess it doesn't matter if their powers are reduced or not. Each of Azul's party members were a match for a hundred, but would they really be fine against this massive army? There was no reason to worry about it. I don't think we'll have to worry about going up against superior numbers. Leticia looked around her surrounding as she spoke. It was as she said. Countless guardian shadows were making noise as they gathered. The guardian shadows had complete surrounded the region. The leader of the undead tilted his head as he found all of this troublesome. Geez. I'm not happy to see them. His following words angered Chiron. Even if we kill them, the number of subjects to our king won't grow. It'll be a useless labor. Since you don't have a mouth, I can't say I want to crush your mouth. Anyways, I'll make it so that you will no longer be able to speak. Ah, I won't stop you from spouting nonsense. Our king doesn't care what a living being has to say. You guys are precious resources that will become his subjects. Chiron no longer held back. He swung his dragon swords in a heroic manner. The battle on the ground started. Chapter 189. Two Persons. Part 7. The Sky Splitter was deployed. Azul's magical energy became one with his clones as they streaked across the sky. The evil spirits on the ground were emanating magical energy without reserve. The battered body of Carlos. No. Belrun's body was flying high in the air. He had shot up much higher than the mountain peak of Laos. This is fun. Azel heard a voice infused with a bleak magical energy within his head. It wasn't the voice of Carlos, which he had heard within Laos. The voice didn't exist. It was a dense mental wave made out of magical energy. It was a curse that attacked Azel's mind. If he was a normal person, he would have lost his sanity after hearing the voice. The evil spirits are bound by the distrust of this world. I see. It seems air isn't the only thing that thins out at this high of an altitude. Belrun's power was founded on the massive amount of evil spirits he controlled. He was just one being, yet he had control over countless spirits in his ranks. He was the king of the dead. The evil spirit could transfer their magical energy to Belrun to create a particular phenomena. The level of power that was transferred could create a catastrophe. Azel had predicted this, so he immediately brought out his sky splitter. He dragged Belrun into the skies. I never knew I had this weakness. You live and learn. The evil spirits were bound by misgivings that was spread across the surface of the world. They were created through the death of humans. This was why they couldn't use their full power in locations that were absent of death or the misgivings of living beings. Basically, humans as well as the evil spirits couldn't exist this high in the air. If it was through Belrun's power, he might be able to drag the spirits into the air by sheer force. However, he would have to consume power to make this happen. The consumption of power would override any benefit in bringing up the spirits. This scenario was possible, because he was Azel. It was also thanks to the information given to him by Carlos before Belrun had awakened. Did you say you are the king of death, Belrun? Azel glared at him as he spoke. This sky is where you will die. Oh, it seems you are a human that tells funny jokes. Haven't you heard of me before? He snickered. I am the first to defy death. I didn't need outside help. I am a king, who used my own power to defy the way of the world. The concept of death doesn't apply to me. That is why, the cursed darkness rose up. The faces of many evil spirits appeared from within, and a hail-like attack was sent towards Azel. There is no way I will die. Ah, the heavens shook. 
It wasn't a darkness simply made out of magical energy. Even the sound wave was a vector for the cursed power. I will prove how flimsy that statement is. However, as Azel approached Belrun, his figure disappeared. At the same time, light erupted in all directions as it ripped through the sky. The cursed darkness started burning up, but the sound of this event was drowned out by the roar caused by the light. It was like a flame and a lightning. The beam of light pierced through the being called the King of Death. However, this is. Azel was taken aback. The sky splitter had turned into a beam of light, and when it was about to reach the King of Darkness, a gulf suddenly formed. Belrun was suddenly so far away that it was hard to see him with the naked eye. Azel was well aware of what the appearance of this phenomena implied. Endless plain. Shit. He is already able to use such techniques. It was like the dimensional distortion created by the Vitans' chalice. It was the endless plane. It was such an unexpected development that Azel was taken unawares. His real body was separated from his clones. He was so far away that his clones dissipated, and for a brief moment, he had lost track of the sky splitter. The cursed darkness came at him like a hailstorm. Azel had lost his sky splitter, so it seemed he wouldn't be able to block such an all-encompassing attack. Come dragon weapon. Unyielding fortress. However, a shout containing his will exploded forth from the darkness. A wave of transparent light erupted to block the hail storm of darkness. After creating a barrier, he kept summoning his other dragon weapons. Storm dragon's wings. Underworld ruler's marksman. Master of raging waves. Aside from the sky splitter, he summoned four additional dragon weapons. It was something no one else had been able to replicate after the Dragon Demon War. The summoning of multiple dragon weapons were an unsurpassed ability that only Azel, Duke Kwa Nidal and Atain could use. The space started to ripple. A wave of transparent power shook the space, and the energy generated from within this space was absorbed. The hail of darkness, which was about to engulf Azel, was swallowed up by a countercurrent. At the same time, the endless plane was destroyed, and the dimensional distortion righted itself. What is this? Belrun's shocked voice rang out. A sword made out of light had pierced through his body. Even if you are able to imagine up such a large space, you won't be able to leave behind the light. Azel had been flustered by the formation of the endless plane, and he had lost contact with his sky splitter for a very brief moment. He had brought out the unyielding fortress to establish his defense and at the same time, he regained connection with his Sky Splitter. He used the Sky Splitter to attack Belrun, who had been at the end of the vast space. You might be borrowing Carlos' knowledge, but as a magician, you are merely an old relic, who have fallen behind the times. Belrun was one with Carlos. He was able to use Carlos' magical knowledge. It was as Azel had said. Belrun had fallen behind the times, but he had access to the evolved magic spells. Belrun had no compunction in using these new spells, but he couldn't use it freely like Carlos. Belrun would need to use Carlos' magical knowledge to update his own magic spells, which was full of holes. However, he needed a lot of time to accomplish this task. I won't give you the opportunity to turn into a calamity. You will die here and now. Humph. Extreme extermination. I'll acknowledge that it is a scary technique. However, do you think I'll let you use it? What can you do? Azel snorted. At the same time, something penetrated Belrun. Kook. Belern staggered. Arrows, which were invisible to him, impacted on his body. It was the dragon weapon named Underworld Ruler's Marksman. Since Belrun had Carlos' knowledge, he immediately knew this fact. He tried to defend against it, but he couldn't block it entirely. He could only minimize the damage. Azel used this opportunity to send the Sky Splitter towards Belrun. Azel resolved into several dozen clones, and a destructive light impacted on Belrun. I'm well aware of it. You are very sturdy, and you have an endless reservoir of energy. He had heard it from Carlos. Belrun had a reservoir of magical energy that was larger than the magical energy possessed by Atain and the Dragon Demon Generals combined. Of course, the current Azel could barely contend with him in terms of magical energy. However, you are merely a spirit that has lost twice before. Carlos had trouble with your immortality. 
It wasn't as if he afraid of you. I'm just here to finish the battle that Carlos had already won. Azul's clones spoke as one. Belrun kept attacking the clones, but he couldn't find Azul's true body. All the clones possessed presence, and they all attack him as if they were real. This makes no sense. Even if Azel was great at using his cloning technique, they were fighting in midair. It might be understandable with his clone, but how could his real body fly around the air freely like a bird? The answer lay within Carlos' knowledge. Storm Dragon's wings. Shit. I can't believe a human has such abilities. Dragon weapon Storm Dragon's wings. It was the identity of the flame-like red light that was surrounding Azul's body. He was able to fly through the air using his dragon weapon, and he could do it better than a magician. You bastard. Belrun raged. There was little oxygen present in the high altitudes, and the pressure in the atmosphere suddenly rose. A fierce wind arose, and a thunderbolt roared from within. Azel didn't blink at all. Belrun let out a yell. The attack was similar to the magic used by Almeric's dragon weapon Storm's scream. Belrun had copied it. However, Azel let the thunderbolt flow off of him, and he counterattacked. At the same time, consecutive explosions occurred around Belrun. Is this the box of hate? Masses of transparent magical energy were floating around the air, and they started exploding when triggered by magical energy. Belrun had suffered under this attack before. Carlos had used it against him. The box of hate reacted and exploded in reaction to the magical energy making up a spell. One had to increase the density of the masses of magical energy, and one had to create a dense shell around it. It allowed one to cut off the masses of magical energy from the box of hate. One had to waste an incredible amount of magical energy to do this. However, this was the only counter to the box of hate devised by Atain, Baldazark and Ornsaurus. Belrun willingly accepted the inefficiency of this method, since he had an incredible reservoir of magical energy. I'll show you the power of my dragon weapons, which had been under the custody of Carlos. The 32 clones of Azel tirelessly assaulted Belrun. Azel's clones flew around using the storm dragon's wings, and the box of hate suppressed Belrun's magic. The sky splitter turned into a pillar of light as it kept attacking Belrun, and the underworld ruler's marksman pierced through Belrun's defense to pierce through him. It was as if several hundred magicians were attacking him. Dragon weapon dismissed. Master of raging wave. Unyielding fortress. After dismissing two dragon weapons, Azel summoned new dragon weapons. Come dragon weapons. Moon sword. Cry of the phoenix. Defender of dawn. He summoned seven dragon weapons all at once. Belrun was in a state of shock. How can this be? How is this possible? Belrun knew that each dragon weapon were terrifying weapons. Azel had summoned seven of them all at once. I've already told you this. This sky is where you will die. Carlos and I have already determined this. Yes. He heard another voice from his side. Azel turned to look at him with a complex expression on his face. Carlos was laughing next to Azel. I should thank Count Banan for this. He had neat brown hair and cold gray eyes. He was a young man. Carlos looked exactly like how Azel remembered. However, Carlos' figure shimmered as if it was a mirage made out of light. This was the power of the Defender of Dawn. Belrun was pressing down on Carlos' personality, but he was able to give help through this particular dragon weapon. Azel could make at most eight combatants with the Defender of Dawn, but he focused the weapon's power to create a single clone of Carlos. Don't make such a face, Azel. It makes me not want to go. Carlos smirked as he spoke. Then he used the magical energy granted to him. The clone possessed an exact replica of Carlos' personality and abilities. Since he was being provided power by the dragon weapon, Carlos could cast magic that was superior to the ones he could cast in his prime. You bastard. You are only my vessel, yet. Belrun was helpless as he started being pushed backwards. It didn't matter that he had overwhelming magical energy, and it didn't matter that he possessed Carlos' magical knowledge. There was an absolute gulf between having the knowledge and actually being able to apply that knowledge I've been planning this for a very long time. I felt annoyed at the fact that I wasn't able to end this long fight over 100 years ago.
Carlos spoke as he overwhelmed Belrun in the magical battle. There was clear gratification in his demeanor. At the time, if Azel had been with me, you would have been cooked. Just separating you from the undead army reduced you into this state. According to my calculations, you can generate only one-fifth of your power once you entered into the air. The power of a magician varied in many ways, depending on the preparations made by the magician. It was similar to an army's strength. It came down to how well the soldiers were equipped, and how well the army was supplied. Magician were incomparably stronger in their bases where they had access to their facilities and tools. The scary thing about Belrun was the unlimited power he continuously gained from the undead and evil spirits. It was how Belrun was able to use many of his spells and curses at the same time. From the standard of this era, you are still scary. However, what are you going to do now that you won't be able to lean on your immortality? I wonder what you are feeling right now. Carlos was thorough in his taunt against Belrun. Carlos had suffered for more than hundred years, because of Belrun's immortality. He was full of joy, because he would be able to end this chapter of his life. As he spoke, light started gathering around him. The blue sky started to burn up with light. A tree made out of light was formed. Its numerous branches started splitting the heavens. It was as if a lightning was magnified. In the midst of this scene, Azel held his blue dragon weapon as he stared at Belrun. Azel. Carlos spoke as he turned to look at him. Let's not drag this out. Carlos. When he saw Carlos' face, mixed emotions appeared on Azel's face. Carlos had already become a part of history, yet Azel's memories were still fresh in his mind. The memories from their past kept replaying in his mind. When they first met, Azel thought Carlos was a rude magician. He remembered all the times they had bickered with each other. He remembered the youthful follies. Then there were the times where they discussed each other's plans for the future. My mind is already made up. Carlos let out a gentle laughter. The light sword was complete. When Azel wanted it, a hail of light swords would fall towards this location. Azel wordlessly raised his sword. An extremely hoarse voice flowed out of his mouth. I'll resent you forever. Please do. Carlos shrugged his shoulders as he let out a sad laughter. Just don't forget about me. Azel didn't answer him. Then, the sword of light split the sky as it stretched out. Chapter 190. Transition of Tactics. Part 1. The light burned the sky, and silence descended. It didn't take too long for the fight on the ground to finish after the fight in the sky finished. The undead army had remained unharmed under the sun, thanks to Belrun's power. The undead army screamed as they burned under the sunlight. It was truly easy for Azel's party and the Guardian Shadows to wipe out the remnants of the undead army. A good amount of time had passed after the fight on the ground was over. Azel finally descended from the sky. His party members tried to ask him about what had happened, but they hesitated when they saw the expression on his face. His expression was too tragic. Azel was the first one to open his mouth. You should use this, Duke. Azel lifted the staff towards Chiron. After accepting it, Chiron asked in bewilderment, What is this? It is Carlos' keepsake. Shouldn't a magician use this item? You have to use it, Duke. You have the most potential in terms of developing as a tactician. Him, there was no context to his explanation, so Chiron was still confused. Azel looked tired as he gave an explanation. It is a magical item that will allow you to command the guardian shadows. The staff, which had been pierced through Carlos, had been key to sealing Belrun. It also had the function of controlling the guardian shadows. Carlos was able to control the guardian shadows through his will using this item, and he was able to gather information through the guardian shadows. Laura mumbled to herself in surprise when she heard his explanation. It is similar to the great darkness. It isn't similar. It is the great darkness. Ha! Huh, I'll explain it to you later. Aside from that, I have a lot I have to explain, but I want to rest for a little bit. I don't want to do anything right now. Azel spoke those words as he sat on the ground. There was a mountainous amount of stories he had to tell them. He had to think over the stories, and he had to choose which ones he wanted to tell them. There was so much that he felt lost. Despite this fact, 
he just wanted to rest. For now, he wanted to rest despite what was waiting for him in the present and the future. I have no idea what's going on. Almeric was taken aback. Something had happened. However, he had no idea what had happened. What's the problem? Ragus queried. The fog has lifted. Are you planning on changing career to become a magician? Of course not. What about it? The problem is the Vitans chalice. Almeric had authority over a portion of the great darkness, so he was able to sense the dragon weapons used by the dragon demon generals. However, the degree of precision in detecting the Vitans chalice had become unusually low after Azel acquired it. He had even lost track of it not too long ago. Then it appeared in some random location. It seemed someone had the ability to circumvent his tracking ability. However, it was as if a fog had been lifted after that event. He could accurately senise the location of the Vitans chalice. Him. I was fooled once. I don't want to be fooled again, but. Ragus tapped the nasal bridge of his skull as he spoke. The signal of the Vitans chalice had disappeared for a short amount of time, and it had appeared in a random location. Almeric and Ragus led the elite troops to the location, but the only thing they found were a bunch of guardian shadows. At that point, Almeric wondered if Laura had set a trap for them. However, he didn't think she had the capability of duping his detection ability. Still, shouldn't we check it out anyways? That is why I sent the kids. I told them to avoid any direct confrontation. When Almeric and Ragus realized they had fallen for a trap, they quickly returned to the Plane of Darkness. If Azul's party had attacked the Plane of Darkness while they were gone, they would have been able to fend of Azul's party. However, the Plane of Darkness would have had to pay a steep price for doing so. I have no idea. I don't know what they are planning. Almeric furrowed his brows. Ragus spoke. I have one important thing I have to tell you. What is it? I have only one life now. What do you mean by that? It is as I've said. If my body is completely destroyed again, I won't be able to revive again. How can you be sure? What proof do you have? You aren't an undead. Can you really know something only an undead would know? I'm sure of it. I can't be revived anymore. Are you saying something has gone wrong with the great darkness? Almeric was taken aback. Ragus wasn't kidding. At the very least, he believed what he was saying. Ornsaurus and Baldark should have been revived yet they weren't revived. Are you sure you will be able to revive in the future? The king's plans aren't perfect and faultless. Him. Almeric groaned. On the other hand, Ragus looked excited. Our magician friends weren't able to revive, so we can't do anything about it until the king revives. However, I like it. You sound as if you've lost your mind. Kook kook kook. If you are able to revive multiple times, you won't value your own life. It is not in my nature to use such cheap methods. Even if I have one life, I'll willingly put it on the line. That is the way of a man. You are already living your second life. You are just being shameless with your words. The milk has already been spilled, so what can I do? I just push forward even if it is shameless. Anyways, Almeric realized he was laughing as he ragged on Ragus. His blood was boiling. He had calmed down a lot but he used to be a beast-like warrior. He changed after he revived. Was it because he became older? No, that wasn't it. If time caused his personality to change, it would have changed much sooner. Before he died, he was like a living history book. He had lived for a very long time. The change was caused by the power given to him by Atain. In his past life, he knew he was a mortal, yet it hadn't felt like it. However, when he was truly revived, he couldn't live his life with as much zeal as before. When living as a life as a warrior, one knew that one would fall someday by the sword. It didn't matter how powerful you were. When he was born as a first-generation dragon demon, he had faced fierce competition. He didn't have any parents that sheltered him. He had to fight everything in his environment to survive. He was able to fight with such zeal, because he had only one life. If he died, everything he worked for would be for naught. He fought with zeal, because everything he enjoyed would come to an end. When Ragus saw Almeric's expression, he cackled. He asked Almeric a question. You like it too, right? I don't want to agree with you, but. Almeric couldn't help it. 
The corner of his mouth lifted into a smirk. I can't help it. You were right. An emotion that burned in his chest in the past was rekindled. Azul's party quickly exited the Atazan mountain range. They no longer had any reasons to stay there. While they were doing so, Chiron was going through the process of identifying and controlling the Guardian Shadows. There is about 12,000 Guardian Shadows that can be mobilized. The Guardian Shadows were basically immortal before this event. They were able to be revived when they perished. It just took time. However, this wasn't the case now. Belrun's power had been a big part of why they were able to be revived. Since Belrun was dead, they couldn't be revived after they perished. Even at this moment, their numbers are being replenished, but we are consuming faster than we are adding to the force. The power of revival was gone, but the system of the Guardian Shadows remained intact. Aside from the Dragon Demon King worshippers, the entire continent provided the Guardian Shadows with information. Moreover, those that possessed eternal enmity towards the Dragon Demon King worshippers continued to become Guardian Shadows. Azel asked him a question. Did you come up with a good idea? I think so. First, we'll have to contact the friends of our organization in each country. We'll have to update them on what is going on, and we'll use this opportunity to see all their faces. The way we run this organization will change drastically. Carlos hadn't used the Guardian Shadows as his voice, because he wanted to keep his secrets hidden. It would have been over even if one person had found out his existence. Azul's party wasn't under such restriction. Carlos had created an excellent system. Chiron sent the Guardian Shadows as emissary, and he would be able to use the Guardian Shadows like a communication spell. The only downside was the fact that Chiron couldn't sort through all the information. Carlos had become part of the system, so he could manage the massive amount of information. However, Azul's party couldn't do that. They could give specific orders to the Guardian Shadows, and they could only receive reports from the Guardian Shadows. They couldn't hear and see everything the Guardian Shadows observed. Chiron realized this fact, so he spoke to Azel. At the very least, we'll have to keep one Guardian Shadow with each member. Yes, I am thinking about using half of the Guardian Shadows as non-combatants. Chiron started explaining his plan. What did the party need the most right now? Military force. Of course, they needed it. The members of Azul's party were powerful as individuals. However, the Demon King worshippers were numerous, and they were all over the continent. If they had to prioritize, strength wasn't at the top of their needs. The thing we need the most is information. Chiron was firm with his statement. The Guardian Shadows had been able to become a thorn in the sides of the Plane of Darkness. It wasn't, because they were overwhelmingly more powerful than the Plane of Darkness. Of course, they were superior combatants that could sway the balance of power in this era. Event, the weakest amongst them could gain employment as a combatant anywhere, however, their number wasn't as large as they had assumed. It did come down to numbers. There were enough members to make up a secret organization that could terrorize their enemies from the background. However, they weren't an army that could fight all over the world. The plane of darkness if causing mischief all over the world, and they're using the opportunities created to their advantage. What if they're trying to take over the world without a direct confrontation? There are a very limited number of ways to achieve this goal. The Plane of Darkness had used this plan to great effect, and they had almost take over the world before. If it wasn't for the Guardian Shadows, the Plane of Darkness would have planted puppets in leadership roles. They would have controlled the world from the back. However, this plan was no longer feasible thanks to the Guardian Shadows. The two sides are able to compete with each other, because both sides possess transcendent information capabilities. The Plane of Darkness used the Great Darkness to create a massive information net that encompassed the whole world. The Guardian Shadows used the awareness of people as their information net. If one side's intelligence capabilities fell short, the balance would have been broken. Still, neither side could dominate each other, so this boring fight continued to go on. We have to get ahead of them. We have to slowly chip away at their organization, which is like a well-oiled machine. The information capabilities of the Plane of Darkness remained intact, 
but a structural defect had occurred in the information capabilities of the Guardian Shadows. Carlos was gone. But that wasn't the problem. The bigger loss was the Keepers of the Prophecy. The Keepers of Prophecy received the information from the Guardian Shadows, and they moved their forces in the most effective manner. They had taken on the role of commanders. They were gone now. The hands and feet remained, but the head was removed from the Guardian Shadows. From now on, Azul's party had to act as the head of this system. If they wanted to do this, they had to receive information that everyone could comprehend. The Guardian Shadows had a hard time communicating with others, and there was no point in receiving unfiltered information from them. We have to use our limited forces to maximum efficiency. We'll have to do that until we destroy the Great Darkness. This was like eating away at a sand castle with a flag planted on top. The destruction of the Great Darkness meant the destruction of the Guardian Shadows. If they ate away at the Great Darkness, it also meant they were diminishing the power of the Guardian Shadows. If both sides were taking damage, they had to make it so that their opponent took on the bigger wound. Chiron already understood the meaning behind the battle. Pillars of the Great Darkness. If they wanted to neutralize the Great Darkness, they had to kill the sealed beings. They had to do what they had done to Belrun. Waypoints for the Road of Emptiness. The Road of Emptiness were the main reason why the Plane of Darkness could work behind the scenes. They had to destroy it. It wasn't an exaggeration to say that the loss of the Road of Emptiness would cut off their strategic lifeline. This was the crux of Chiron's new plan. I want to use half of the Guardian Shadows to monitor the Road of Emptiness. The Guardian Shadows didn't have the ability to articulate complex information. However, they possessed the ability to carry out complex instructions. If they were given clear instructions, it wouldn't be too hard to pass along missives. Chiron opened a map. He spoke with Laura, Euron and Leticia to label the waypoints of the Road of Emptiness. He numbered each site, then he sent Guardian Shadows there. They would act as observers. They know where we are thanks to the Vitans Chalice. If it is as Azel said, they can track us with precision in real time. I'm sorry. At Chiron's comment, Laura apologized in a sullen manner. Chiron smirked. I'm not try to be mean to you. The Vitans Chalice is a risk we have to shoulder. It gives away our location, but at the same time, it makes them predictable. We can discern their movements, and we can spoil their plan. If they kept tabs on the troops traveling through the road of emptiness, they would be able to keep track of what the plane of darkness was trying to do. This was why Chiron didn't hesitate to invest half of the Guardian Shadows to this task. Let's see which side ends up with the flag from the fallen sand castle. Shit. I'll make sure to deplete their forces before Atane is born. They won't be able to recreate the Dragon Demon War. Chiron's eyes burned. He made the declaration as he glared at the map. Chapter 191. Transition of Tactics. Part 2. Azul's party left the mountain peak of Laos, and they started moving in earnest after 10 days. The leaders of the Plane of Darkness became very frustrated when this occurred. It wasn't too hard to locate them. They just needed to ascertain the location of the Vitans Chalice to find them. Moreover, they didn't have to be worried about it being a trap. They confirmed on three occasions that the tracking ability was working perfectly. However, they couldn't catch up to Azul's party. It really makes one shudder. I never expected him to move in this manner. Kieran, who was the successor of Dragon Demon General Baldazark, mumbled to himself. Azul's party moved as if they didn't have a destination in mind. Azul's party was already moving at a transcendent speed but now they were going all over the place. They looked as if they were going in one direction, yet they suddenly changed direction in the opposite direction. The plane of darkness couldn't catch up to them. The road of emptiness wasn't all powerful. The waypoints were fixed, and the number of people it could transport was limited. Basically, the plane of darkness couldn't predict the path taken by Azul's party, so they couldn't concentrate their forces in one place. On top of that, Eight locations were destroyed in just ten days. Niberus was facing him, and she couldn't believe the report she was reading. She didn't know why, but. No, Azul's party definitely had a hand in doing this. The Guardian Shadows had changed up their fighting style. 
Until now, the Guardian Shadows had reacted in a strictly defensive manner. When Dragon Demon King worshippers were detected, the Guardian Shadows would intercept them in a defensive move. However, the Guardian Shadows had completely flipped to take an offensive approach. When the route of Azul's party was predicted, the Plane of Darkness mobilized to send troops towards them. However, the nearest waypoints were destroyed before that could happen. It was done by the members of the Guardian Shadows organization and several hundred Guardian Shadows. It was like Chiron and Biorin within the Rulan Kingdom. Each kingdom possessed members that were part of the Guardian Shadows organization. Moreover, all of them were skilled fighters. The Dragon Demon King worshippers couldn't take them lightly. These members led over 100 Guardian Shadows to attack the waypoints. There was no way the Plane of Darkness could defend against it moreover. The information regarding the forgotten techniques have been spread amongst them. I'm sure of it. Kieran's face hardened as he spoke. Not all of their forces were completely wiped out in the fight against the Guardian Shadows. Some had run away with their lives intact. This report was the result of gathering all accounts from the survivors. The Plane of Darkness realized that their advantage in skill over the rest of the world was diminishing. The organization called the Guardian Shadows were contacting strong people in each nation, and they were given key points to the forgotten techniques. To be precise, the information was being delivered even at this moment. White Sword Count Ricardi of the Leros Kingdom. It is true that he is a very skilled, but he wasn't at a level where he could take out two of our senior officers by himself. Ricardi was like Chiron. He was a dragon magian, yet he was a lord of a human kingdom. He was the count in the Leros kingdom. He was a very skilled dragon arts practitioner, and he was given the nickname of the White Sword Count. The loss of his parents at the hands of the Plane of Darkness had made him join the Guardian Shadows. All the members of the Ricardi tribe were very skilled, so the Plane of Darkness had paid special attention to them. This was why they had a lot of information regarding Ricardi tribe. However, in the recent attack at the waypoint of the Road of Emptiness, the Ricardi tribe's power greatly exceeded the assessment made by the Plane of Darkness. It didn't mean that the Ricardi tribe had learned and used the forgotten techniques in such a short amount of time. They were like the Dragon Sword Count Chiron of Tarantos. They might have lost their techniques, but aside from this fact, they had cultivated scary amount of skill. Their resistance became much stronger just from knowing what kind of techniques were being used by the elite troops of the Plane of Darkness. Niberus spoke. However, they aren't the true problem. Yes. Kieran threw down the report as he let out a sigh. Great sinner Azel Kazark. In the past ten days, Eight waypoints to the Road of Emptiness was destroyed. Azel had personally destroyed four of them. The Sky Splitter, Storm Dragon's Wing, Crying Phoenix. Each and every one of them are ridiculous dragon weapons. It was true that the ability of Azel's party to travel was ridiculous. Each member were capable of moving quickly, yet they were using Vitten's Chalice at strategic moments to travel a great amount of distance. On the other hand, Azul's ability to move was incomprehensible from a common sense point of view. The storm dragon's wings gave him speed equal to a flying dragon, and he was able to move fly freely through air. Moreover, he could locally control the pressure to create violent gales. The crying phoenix was the only dragon weapon that was capable of fighting by itself. Its battle capabilities changed depending on how much power its owner possessed. However, if the legends were to be believed, this weapon was scary in the hands of Azel. It was as if a dragon that possessed wisdom was using its magic. One of the terrifying abilities of this dragon weapon was its mobility. Even if the owner was asleep, it could move through the air with its owner in tow. The Plane of Darkness couldn't find a solution to this problem. They could only defeat Azel's party if they concentrated their elite troops in one place. However, Azul's party wasn't giving him the opportunity to do so. We are taking way too much loss when compared to their loss. It wasn't as if the Plane of Darkness was being beaten unilaterally. They were causing the continent to fall into chaos, and they induced the fight between human nations. Humans were suffering under self-inflicted wounds. The Guardian Shadows were trying to put this matter to rest, but the side had been split. 
it would be difficult for them to stitch up the situation. Moreover, the Guardian Shadows weren't winning in overwhelming fashion. The fact that our side can't win if we don't step forward means that the situation is serious. The Plane of Darkness had reacted to the, their opponents' moves. They had dispatched elite troops at each waypoint, and when a battle occurs, they would send more troops as support. Nibiris and Kieran had been inserted into this place, and they were able to defeat the Guardian Shadows. The members of the Guardian Shadows were strong, but they were helpless against two Dragon Magians using their powerful dragon weapons. Laura. Nibiris mumbled to herself. Her words carried anger. Why did their enemies know all the waypoints to the Road of Emptiness? The answer was obvious. Laura knew where all the waypoints were located at. Kieran spoke. This is a very serious problem. You don't have to tell me it is a problem. I already know. That isn't what I meant. At his words, Nibiris glared at Kieran. She had an ill-humored expression on her face. However, Kieran was serious. Our enemies know our secret. Moreover, they are attacking us with all their might. That is serious in itself, but that is not what we should be truly fearing right now. What are you trying to say? Nibiris. After the Dragon Demon War ended, this is the first time we've fought a defensive battle. What? We were always the one to attack. We just had to demonstrate that the defense set up by our enemies were faulty. The Plane of Darkness hadn't been fighting a war. One was either defending an established structure or one was attacking. Which one was more difficult? Of course, it was more difficult to defend than attack. The Plane of Darkness didn't possess the power to wage an all-out war against the world, so they always attacked from the darkness. Until now, the Guardian Shadows had been the barrier protecting the world. It was sturdy, but in the end, it was only a barrier. However, their roles had been flipped now. Until now, the Plane of Darkness didn't even reveal their castle wall, which could be attacked. The Plane of Darkness was a fortress blessed with natural barriers for defense. Even if they lost a head on battle with humanity, they could come back to the Plane of Darkness. It would be difficult to wipe out the Dragon Demon King worshippers. This was why they were able to survive through the Dragon Demon War. In the first place, it was impossible to lead a large force into the Plane of Darkness without using the Road of Emptiness. However, our castle wall is exposed now. If we lose our castle wall, we lose the power to fight against the world. Nibiris felt a chill run up her spine when she heard Kieran's insight. She finally understood the problem he was pointing out. The Dragon Demon King's army had always been conquerors and invaders. After coming to the Plane of Darkness, they had never been in the defensive position. Now they were required to take on that role. However, the two of them still didn't realize something. Azul's party had something more critically damaging than what the two of them had observed. Five Dragon Demon Princess Arietta and Dragon Demon Prince Saiga had stopped the Second Grand Alliance of Darkness. After resolving the situation in the Balan Forest, they were given an extended vacation. However, their vacation didn't last long. It had become a bit less heated, but there was a war going on with the Leros Kingdom. Arietta and Saiga was expecting an order to enter into the battle occurring along the eastern border. The two of them expected a call from their mother, the dragon demon Queen Lyre. However, you are, Saiga became surprised when he ran into this person at Lyre's palace. He went into his battle stance, and at the same time, he realized he had made a mistake. I should have brought my long sword. He had been called into the palace by his mother, so he hadn't armed himself. Moreover, Saiga's weapon was a large and heavy weapon. This was why he didn't carry it around outside of battles. At that moment, Saiga regretted that fact. His opponent possessed blonde hair, and amethyst-like eyes. She was a dragon demon girl with curved horns that looked to be crafted out of amethyst. She was beautiful like a doll. From Saiga's perspective, he could never forget this expressionless girl. Laura Orsaurus. She was the dragon demon magician that handed him an appalling defeat in the dukedom of Tarantos. Everyone run away. Saiga stepped in front of his servants as he shouted. Noonam. I'll hold her off here. Please go to mother. He had a heroic expression on his face as he unfolded his dragon demon magic. He wasn't armed, 
but he was skilled enough to rip apart several dozen regular soldiers with his bare hands. Unlike before, he had learned the forgotten techniques, so he'll be able to buy some time against her. Wait a moment, Saiga. However, Arietta held him back. She stepped in front of Saiga, who was letting out an imposing presence. She noticed that something was off with Laura's attitude. I don't know who she is, but she isn't showing any signs of hostility. Hmm, Saiga also felt this. Like Arietta, he had received the forgotten techniques from Azel, which included the gaze detection technique. Laura spoke. It is as he said. Who are you talking about? He said the dragon demon prince will blindly try to fight me, and the dragon demon princess will calmly assess the situation. I don't like admitting this, but it seems he is a teacher that knows his students quite well. You are talking about my teacher. That's right. At that moment, Chiron appeared from behind Laura. When they saw him, Arietta and Saiga became confused. Teacher, what is going on? Saiga remained tense as he spoke. His revered teacher was in front of him, but he couldn't comprehend the situation. Is he perhaps an enemy disguised as my teacher? It caused him to question such a scenario. Chiron smirked. I commend you for being wary, but I really am your teacher Chiron Tarantos. You were quite silly. You roped me into doing this boring prank. Laura grumbled as she turned away. She completely ignored the situation as she walked towards the inner palace. Arietta and Saiga still had no idea what was going on. Chiron spoke to the confused two people. I came here, because I need both your help. The king have already given me permission. Follow me. Chapter 192. Transition of Tactics. Part 3. I didn't realize you were the legendary hero in the past, and I was discourteous, Marquis Azel Kazak. Arietta was courteous as she gave her respects. This was their first reunion after they parted ways within the dukedom of Tarantos. It had been four months. The truths that had been revealed to her in that time frame hadn't been light. Azel burst out laughing. How did you find out? Our enemies gave us the confirmation. The words you threw out as a joke was the truth. You believed their words. I believed them. There was always a voice in the corner of my heart that said it might be possible. It was easy to accept it when I received the confirmation. My brother wasn't pleased with the information. At her words, Azul's gaze turned towards Saiga. His expression revealed a lot of complex emotions. He knew Azel was an incredible person. The stuff he had learned from Azel was worth the weight in gold. However, he had been humiliated by Azel. He acknowledged that Azel was the legendary hero, but he felt trepidation in expressing his respects. It was the pride of a young man. Azel smirked. You don't have to start that now. Just treat me like before. I am a Marquis of the Nadic Empire. You are a princess. I'm not ranked as high as you. Him. If that is your wish, I'll do so. Arietta suddenly changed her attitude. The change was so fast that Azel had to laugh. You became quite imposing since the last time I saw you. You became stronger. Normally, aren't you supposed to say I became more beautiful? I'm sure some dimwit count from some province will willingly sing your praise. I'll speak to you as a warrior. Your skill with words remains the same. However, I'm not offended by it. It is none other than the legendary hero Azel Kazak giving me that compliment. I already have the duke blowing smoke up my ass. I think one is enough. Anyways, let's stop talking about me now. Shall we get to the main topic? I heard the short version from my mother. Dragon Demon Queen Lyre was a member of the Guardian Shadows. She retired from the organization after she became queen, but she still maintained her relationship with the other members of the Guardian Shadows. She gave support when needed. Of course, she hadn't revealed this fact to her children. It was because the duty of the royal family was already heavy as it is. Lyre hadn't wanted to draw her two children into the Guardian Shadow's brutal fight. However, the situation had changed. The truths, which had been frustratingly veiled to them, were being brought out into the open. The time for a showdown was approaching. It might be the critical conflict that would decide the fate of humanity. Lyre was able to understand this truth when Chiron explained the situation to her. Chiron was now in charge of the Guardian Shadows, and she decided to deploy her two children. 
an organization made by the Archmage Carlos was fighting the Dragon Demon King worshippers from behind the scenes. It is quite surprising. However, it doesn't surprise me that Teacher is a member of this organization. Chiron hadn't told Arietta and Saiga about the Guardian Shadows. However, Arietta had always felt Chiron had a secret that he wouldn't share with her. It felt as if he was trying to protect her from something. Azel spoke. I'll start telling you the specifics. I'll take questions before I do that. Since the two of them were being made into members of the Guardian Shadows, they had a lot to explain. A long conversation ensued. It feels like I'm dreaming. When one was away from a girl going through puberty, even a small amount of time resulted in a big change. Azel felt this this truth anew. It had only been four months, but Honora had grown noticeably. Of course, she was still a cute girl that hadn't lost all her baby fat yet. Azel asked her a question. Why? Him. Sir Azel. Should I call you Marquis Kazark? You can just call me by Sir Azel. I'll do so. I can't believe I'm trimming the hair of the legendary hero Azel Kazark. It had been a while since they met, so Honora was trimming Azel's hair. When his hair bothered him, he had cut it off with a knife. It seemed his hair had gotten very rough compared to the last time she saw him. It isn't as if this is your first time doing this. I thought you said you didn't think it was a big deal even if I turned out to be Azel Karkik. Why? Dot you should quickly forget that I said such words. Honora's face became red. Azel hadn't forgotten what she said last time. Still, I really was surprised. You don't look too surprised right now. When I heard it for the first time, I almost fainted. In regards to Azel's identity, Arietta had received confirmation from the Dragon Demon King's followers within the Balan Forest. Afterwards, she told the truth she had learned to Honora. At that moment, her eyes had turned round like a rabbit. So what did you feel? Him. At Azel's question, Honora mumbled to herself before she answered him. She had a slightly coy expression on her face. I was surprised, but at the same time, I accepted it. It sounded plausible. It was the same for Arietta and Giles. When they realized he was the hero Azel Kazark from the history books, they became surprised. However, it seemed obvious when they heard the truth. They discovered that they were able to accept this fact without much trouble. The stories you told me before has more impact on me now. You mean the stories from my era? You really sound like someone from the past when you said that. Him. Did I sound like an old man? A little bit. Honora let out a playful laughter as she asked him a question. I don't know much about this, but... I know that you are fighting an important fight like you did in the past. Honora was told about Azel's identity, but she hadn't been told the specifics of their situation. It was something she shouldn't know about. However, she had pieced together information she had gleaned from her past experience. She realized that Azel was fighting a fight that was as important as the Dragon Demon War. Unfortunately, you are right. It's unfortunate. If possible, I wanted to wake up in an era where I wouldn't have to fight. I wanted a world where girls like Muzanora wouldn't have to be scared of the evil dragon demon king worshippers. She stared at Azel as she asked him a question. Sir Azel, what do you want to do after the fight ends? Him, I'm curious. What does the legendary hero want to do after the fight ends? Something I want to do. Azel had a dumbfounded expression on his face as if he was taken aback. He hadn't thought about this problem before. After he woke up, fighting was synonymous with his life. He always fought fiercely against the enemies in front of him, so a future with no fight was like an abstract concept to him. He wanted to live a peaceful life. He wanted to live a happy life. He possessed such vague hopes, but he never sat down to plan out what he wanted to do. He had always been too busy. After thinking over it for a moment, Azel queried her. What about Ms. Honora? I asked you first. You are asking about my future. That information is a bit pricey. Humph. All right. I'll let it slide since you are the legendary hero. Her voice made it obvious that she was sulking. Azel laughed. Honora spoke. I'll serve the princess until she retires. When she retires, I'll follow the princes, and I'll become her personal head maid. 
I'll be in a position to order around other maids with just the gesture of my chin. After while, I want to meet someone nice. It is my dream to live a happy life. That sounds a bit. It doesn't sound like a girl's dream. It sounds too realistic. Of course. What nonsense are you talking about? Do you realize how much on the job experience I possess? I've even thought about becoming the head maid of the royal family. However, the position comes with power, and I don't like that. I decided to give up on that idea. The princess is the world's laziest person, and she is good to have as a mistress. I want to be by her side, and I want to be happy as I live free from worldly cares. Your plan in life is so clear. Amazing. It is your turn now, Sir Azel. Him. I'll probably. I believe I'll have to fight again. Azel let out a bitter laughter as he spoke. Honora's eyes turned round. Why? There are too many unfinished business that can only be solved through fights. When he was posed the question by Honora, he took the opportunity to organize what he had to do. When the fight ends. Soon, he had to defeat the revived dragon demon king Atain and his subordinates. He would have to end the fight that had continued from the time before his sleep. If he did that, I want to return to my lands. I want to restore it, so people can live there again. The Bayer's kingdom has dispute over my lands, so it won't be easy. However, it is something that must be done. Ah, at his words, Honora looked as if she knew she had made a faux pas. The tragedy at the county of Kazakh was well known. It was a historical event to her, but she couldn't imagine the huge wound that was being felt by him. Don't make such an expression, Ms. Honora. You didn't make any mistake. How can you say that when you can't even see me? Honora was standing behind Azel, since she was trimming his hair. Azel asked in a playful manner. I can see you. How? Look to the side. Honora was frightened to death when she casually looked to her side. Another Azel was there. He was propping up his chin as he stared at her. Hook, Ms. Honora. That's dangerous. Scissors. Watch it with the scissors. He had used his clone to surprise Honora. Azel hurriedly dodged the scissors being wielded by Honora. Laura was sitting in a rocking chair as she held up a book as if it was a shield. It had the size and thickness of a slab of stone. It truly had been a long time since she had a break. After the business at the mountain peak of Laos had ended, they had busily moved all over the continent. They had to sleep outside most of the time. This was why the current situation was like a sweet dream. She was resting in a luxurious room, and her needs were being taken care of by the servants. She suddenly raised her head. Azel. She felt the presence of Azel within her room. Laura's eyes turned round. Laura tilted her head in confusion. What? Nothing. You just look like an old lady. Laura was wearing a loose gown as she sat on her rocking chair. She was reading a book, while she had a blanket covering her knees. She looks sexy, but why is she giving off a vibe that makes her seems like an old lady or a dame? The dragon demon queen had accepted Azel's party as important guests. This was why skilled maids had worked over Laura. They made her shine. If she had put on some nice clothes, she would be drop-dead gorgeous. She is still alluring right now. He could see milky cleavage between her loose gown, and her bare feet were showing. The sight of Laura was enough to make his imagination go down odd paths. However, Laura's attitude was that of an old lady who was relaxing in her own house. Laura sounded sullen when she spoke. It has been a while since others took care of me. I just became a bit relaxed. She had been an important figure within the plane of darkness, so she didn't feel awkward when being served by others. Azel smirked. It is okay to be like this for one day. We are well defended. It is a bit funny that we have to waste my mental power in order to rest like this. On the surface, she looked very relaxed. However, Laura was using various magic spells right now. In the first place, high-rank magicians were paranoid about their safety. They couldn't relax without taking all the precautions. If she wanted to truly relax, she had to lay down magic spells that would act as barriers. One needed an exhaustive personality if one wanted to deploy all the defensive magic. Of course, she had also taken measures in regards to the Vitten's chalice. It provided the real-time location to their enemies, 
so it was dangerous to have this information known even if they were residing within the palace. The Dragon Demon King worshippers had an absolute rule of working in the shadows. However, Azul's party didn't want to make such a dangerous gamble in regards to how their enemies would behave. From the perspective of their enemies, Azel was someone they wanted to kill at all costs. They might risk exposing their existence to the public. They might try to destroy the royal palace of a kingdom. Have any enemies approached this place? Chapter 193. Transition of Tactics. Part 4. Have any enemies approached this place? Azel asked as he looked at the corner of the room. A guardian shadow suddenly appeared from the bottom of the floor. Not yet. Him. They know that they can locate us at will once again. It seems they've given up on spying on us. Are they gathering their main force? At that moment, the Vitans chalice was in its summoned state. It was located at a mountain that was five kilometers away from the palace. It had been placed within a barrier. If enemies approached the location, the guardian shadows would alert them. It was possible to unsummon the dragon weapon at any moment. It was possible thanks to the magic tome Laura inherited from Carlos. Carlos had included all his magical knowledge into the book, and Carlos had made it so that a significant amount of spells could be demonstrated by the magic tome. For a high-ranking magician like Laura, the book was priceless. Normally, magicians treasured their knowledge, and they put a premium on knowledge that was passed down from their ancestors. They also became obsessed with it. After going through their studies, magicians had to conduct magical experiments for themselves. This was the what being a magician was all about. Of course, there is a limit to how much new knowledge could be pioneered by a single magician. This was why magicians wanted previously verified knowledge. This allowed him to branch out more. Moreover, this book was made by Carlos, who was acknowledged to be the greatest prodigy by Atene and the Dragon Demon General. He had researched for a time period that transcended the limitation of human life. Laura's power was increasing each day just from learning the knowledge from the book. Suddenly, Laura spoke. However, it's weird. What is? Why did Carlos Rizesta give me this book? This book was the essence of Carlos' magical achievement. When Carlos chose to pass on the book, he had given it to Laura instead of Euron. He did so, while acknowledging the fact that Euron was his descendant. Moreover, Carlos had made it so that Laura was the only one that could read the content of the book. Euron had to receive the knowledge through Laura. She had to read and learn it before she could teach it to Euron. He had to go through a very inefficient method to receive the knowledge. I'm not sure. For some reason, Azel had a dark expression on his face as he spoke those words. Maybe, it was because the subject of the conversation was Carlos. Laura picked up on this. What are you hiding from us? Did you hold back information in regards to what Carlos told you? I did. Azel readily nodded his head. It was such a natural response that Laura became surprised. What? She couldn't understand it. If it was personal business between the two, she could understand him not telling others about it. However, when she deciphered the nuanced response from Azel, she realized that he had held back information that would be important to the party. Azel's face hardened as he spoke. These are unverified information. That is why it is hard to speak it out loud. Him. Laura showed signs of being unsatisfied, but she didn't inquire any further. Azel spoke. Aren't you going to press me for the information? I'm sure you had valid reasons for doing so. Azel heard absolute trust in her words. Suddenly, it made him think about Carlos. Carlos had been touched when he witnessed Azel's unwavering trust in him. He could understand Carlos' feelings a little bit. After being thrown into the far future by himself, it was a big relief to have someone that showed absolute trust in him like this. Please tell me one thing. Ask me. Does that mean there is a chance that Euron might become our enemy? No. Azel didn't hesitate as he shook his head from side to side. Laura was taken aback by his answer. When she heard Azel's story, Laura had guessed that he was talking about the identity and the business related to the guide. There were too many bases that were pointing towards the guide. Carlos wasn't the guide. Carlos had revealed some uncomfortable information to Euron, and he had given Euron a very unsavory item called the Box of Hope. 
He even went through the steps of not giving Yuran an item that was considered to be his essence as a magician. Naturally, her presumptions had a negative tilt to it. There was a possibility that the guide could be an enemy. However, Azel was firm in his denial. Laura was confused. Countless possibilities swelled around inside her head, but she couldn't determine which one was true. Azel spoke with conviction. Yuran won't become our enemy. You can trust in that. Azel's party stayed at the Palace of Rulan for one day. They weren't in a position to stay in one place for too long. They decided one day was enough. It wasn't just Arietta and Saiga. Giles and Bor were brought into the Guardian Shadows, and they created a framework for cooperation. These were people that Azel could trust. The number of people he could trust was small, and he needed as many trusted comrades as he could get right now. Moreover, it was decided that Arietta would join the party. There was a significant amount of consternation until this decision was made. It was because Arietta and Saiga were insistent that they should be the one to go. Azel couldn't take both of them. The Dragon Demon Princess and the Dragon Demon Prince carried out important missions for the Rulan Kingdom. At the very least, one of them would need to continue their work as the front man. This tug of war ended in Arietta's victory, because Chiron held up Arietta's hand. I'm judging this objectively. Arietta has gone through the Dragon Slayer's ritual, so her potential is higher than yours. Saiga gritted his teeth at his teacher's cold assessment. He was frustrated, but he couldn't dispute Chiron's words. After she completed the Dragon Slayer's ritual, Arietta's dragon demon magic had made a noticeable jump. It was such a large jump that it was almost unbelievable that she was a dragon magian. Moreover, you have feelings of animosity towards Laura. He also couldn't deny that truth. In the end, he backed off as he swallowed back his pride. Chiron consoled the devastated Saiga. You will be staying here, so your responsibility will be immense. You will work with the other Guardian Shadows to cut off our enemy's lifeline. You'll have to risk your own life each time. I know. Azel was the revived legendary hero, who had transcended time. Arietta would join him to fight for the fate of the world. The heart of any martial artist that was born in this era would be excited at this prospect. Saiga also felt the same way, so he was greatly disappointed. I'm jealous of you, Noonam. Saiga let out a bitter laugh. Ten Chiron was cautioning Arietta. Since you've joined our party, you have to pull your own weight. Your station in life won't grant you any exceptions. Of course, I plan on pulling my own weight. From a young age, Arietta was put through harsh trainings by Chiron. It was true that she showed unbelievable amount of laziness in the palace, but she was capable of pulling her own weight in any situation. I have important things to teach you, but I'll have to delay these lessons for a later time. Why? For a while, you'll have to get used to moving at our speed. We move at a very fast pace. At his words, Arietta's expression stiffened a little bit. She knew that her teacher boasted an abnormally fast-moving ability. Will I be able to keep up? In truth, she was worried. After she inherited the forgotten techniques from Azel, she had completed the Dragon Slayer's ritual. However, she still wasn't confident in her abilities. At the same time, she had a question. They are able to keep up. Azel was a given. But how was the other party members able to keep up? Soon, she was able to acquire the answer to her question. The party had started to move. It had been a long time since she had become exhausted just from running. She had thought she was well equipped to travel a long distance. She had been trained by Chiron since her childhood. She had climbed the mountains numerous times. However, the speed of Azul's party was beyond the limits of what she had experienced. The more surprising part was. We've reduced our speed significantly to match Arietta's speed. Will that not cause us trouble? Let us say we do prioritize our speed. The princess won't be able to adjust to our speed, and if we are ambushed, she won't have any stamina to fight. In my opinion, that would be a worse outcome. I know why we are in this situation, but it still worries me. Chiron and Azel were having this conversation as they prepared their meal. Here, please have some water. There was an awkward atmosphere amongst the party members. Arietta was close with Azel and Chiron. However, she wasn't sure how to treat Laura, 
Leticia and Euron. Fortunately, Euron behaved in a pleasant manner. He talked to her first. Thank you. It is only your first day, yet you are doing very well in following us. It didn't matter how great one's skill was. No one traveled in the manner Hazel's party traveled. They ran on their own two feet to traverse across mountains and lakes. How many would think about running across several hundred kilometers through all types of terrain? If it was a short distance, it was understandable to ignore the terrain. It was extremely odd to travel long distance when a carriage or a horse was available. Basically, she had not experienced anything like this in her life. She never had to use her abilities in such a manner. However, if she moved like this for a couple days, she thought she would be able to slowly adjust to it. Still, you guys are amazing. Laura, Leticia and Euron weren't showing any signs of fatigue. Arietta was proud of her ability, so she felt her unyielding spirit rise up. May I call you by Ms. Letica? Please take out the Ms. You can just call me by Leticia. Leticia answered in a blunt manner. It seemed she didn't care if the other person was a princess. She wasn't going to show Arietta any deference. However, Arietta didn't get mad as she asked a question in return. May you just call me by Arietta? Him. Leticia's expression turned peculiar. As a royal, I thought you guys place much importance on your rank. You guys stake your life on it. You can think of me as being a bit strange. Other royals aren't like me. I see. Then I'll do as you say, Arietta. At her words, Arietta had a peculiar expression on her face. Leticia was puzzled by her reaction, so she asked Arietta a question. What's wrong? Ah, this is the first time I've experienced this. What are you talking about? A woman of similar age as me just called me by my name. When I was young, some called me by a false name. I've just been called by my real name. Him. It is a strange feeling, but it isn't as if I don't like it. Arietta nodded her head as she mumbled to herself. When Leticia saw this, she smirked without realizing it. You are a strange princess. Should I take that as a compliment? I think so. In truth, Leticia hadn't liked the idea when she heard that Arietta was joining their party. She had already formed a strong bond with her party members. Someone was going to intrude into their party dynamic. Of course, she wouldn't welcome it. She became more opposed to the idea when she found out that the person joining their party was a princess. However, some of her trepidation went away when she saw Arietta's attitude. Arietta decided to talk to Laura next. Mo's Laura. I'm throwing this out there just in case. Before Arietta could speak, Laura cut her off with an expressionless face. Please do not add Ornsrus to my name. I've thrown that name away. Him. It is an unwelcome name even for me, so I welcome the suggestion. You can just call me by Laura. I'll call you by Arietta. Thank you. Arietta looked to be enjoying herself. After being taught by Chiron starting from her childhood, she had always lived her life as a princess. The current experience was stimulating her in new ways. After a short meal, Chiron gave an explanation. As I've explained yesterday, we are going to go around destroying the waypoints of the road of emptiness. Laura, Leticia and Euron consolidated their information, and they were able to name a total of 222 locations. There are a lot of them. Arietta was surprised. However, if she thought about it, this continent was large. If there weren't that many, the Dragon Demon King worshippers wouldn't be able to suddenly appear and disappear like they had been over the years. Currently, there are 204 of them left. If they included the ones destroyed by the Keepers of Prophecy, they had destroyed 18 waypoints. It hadn't been easy fights. The Plane of Darkness had set up defensive measures, and they had to charge into the teeth of the defense. Moreover, all the Dragon Demon King worshippers in the region were called into the fight. There were cases where several groups of the Guardian Shadows were almost wiped out. This was why Chiron transitioned into being extremely careful in directing their attacks. First, he sent in the Guardian Shadows to check the response of their enemy. If there was a high-ranking official that they couldn't handle, the attack was aborted. Of course, Azul's party was the exception. Azul's party only had to avoid Almeric and Ragus. 
Arietta was dismayed after hearing Chiron's explanation. We are talking about the legendary hero and the dragon demon generals. It feels unreal. They are the enemies we'll have to fight but. When they approach us, they'll snap you right out of such feelings. Chiron snorted. Chapter 194. Message. Part 1. Kaalia didn't have a real body. This was true long before the dragon demon war. She was from an extinct tribe. She was a first generation dragon demon, who had been revered as a goddess. Since she have lived through multiple lives, her history was longer than any nation in existence. In front of her, even the dragon demon generals were like children to her. However, Kaalia didn't treat herself as being an ancient being. It was true that she had the memories of her past life. From the moment she was born without parents, she had walked this world, and she had memories of living lives as several different beings. The problem was the fact that it really didn't feel like her life. It was like an adult trying to remember the memories from childhood. The thought process and actions of the being she used to be felt foreign to her. When she was reborn in a new body, she lived life with a completely different personality. She repeatedly had an awakening, but she always maintained a part of her current personality. It would be strange if that didn't happen. Whenever Kialia experienced her past life, her personality changed a little bit. She had also experienced life as a human, so it was unclear if Kealia remained the same person. Right now, she. Why are you acting? What do you mean? At Regus's question, Kealia tilted her head in confusion. She was like a girl from a noble family. She was elegant as she drank her tea. It was impossible for her to do this. She didn't have a real body, so how was she able to drink the tea placed on the table? However, she was doing it right now. She savored the smell of the tea as she drank it. Of course, every item was half translucent like her. It was an illusion. It really looks like you are enjoying the tea. Regus questioned her about this. It was possible to create an illusion with the power of magic. A magician could probably hold up an illusion, and one could also pretend to enjoy a cup of tea. However, Kealia didn't look like she was acting. She was an illusion, yet she looked as if she was enjoying her tea as she sat on top of her chair. No matter how he looked at it, her actions were believable. It was as if she was holding up items that had weight and texture. She looked to be enjoying the smell of the tea, and he was getting an impression that warm liquid was traveling down her throat. Everything was so matter of fact. I'm really enjoying it. How is that possible? Regus couldn't comprehend her answer. This was why Kaalia changed the topic. Opa, there is something I miss when my body became like this. What is it? It's the fact that I can't touch anything. Kaalia reached out her hand towards Regus as she spoke. Her hand went through Regus's body. It was odd. Normally, a ghost didn't have a true body. However, this was only true when one was talking about the physical body. When one was talking about it in terms of spiritual level, they possessed a presence. If a spirit tried to pass through a someone, the spirit would feel resistance and pain. As an undead, Regus's spiritual presence was very strong. If a phantom or an evil spirit tried to charge into him, they would be repelled. It would be like running into a steel wall. So how did Kaalia just pass through him? Aren't you a ghost? How can you pass through my body like that? I'm an illusion. Kaalia let out a bitter laugh. Before I died, I wasn't part of the great darkness. My past lives weren't connected to the great darkness. It was done through my own personal technique. When Kaalia died, she hadn't prepared her revival technique. She could no longer treat her past lives as her own. The revival technique had revealed itself to be unstable. She couldn't continuously live her new life as the same person. If she couldn't do that, she had no reason to cling to her revival. This was what Kaalia had thought. When she was dying, the will left behind by Atain within the great darkness was heard by Kaalia. When I agreed to the king's request, I created a new pact with him. In the distant future, I'll be awakened as a part of the great darkness when the king's revival nears. Him. I'm not sure what that has anything to do with the question I asked. I'm getting to the main point now. As I've said before, I threw a tantrum saying I don't want to become an undead like Opa. You said you wanted him to respect the feelings of a girl. 
That's right. That is why I decided to manifest as illusion in the real world when the king made me part of the great darkness. So you really are an illusion. That's right. My body is in the great darkness like Oprah's body. The only thing that can be manifested in this world is an illusion. However, that doesn't mean there is no purpose to my presence. I have the role of being an anchor. Anchor. I observe the world, and this illusion can act as an anchor. It allows the manifestation of my powers. If this criteria isn't met, it would be impossible for me to involve myself with the workings of this world. I am having a hard time understanding what you're saying. When Regus started to scratch his head, Kealia giggled. You don't have to understand it. I'm just an illusion, but I'm able to converse with Opa. You can use magic too. Yes. That still doesn't answer why you were able to drink tea. It is simple. In the great darkness, there are countless fragments of thoughts. There are experiences and thoughts of others. I'm there. Kealia was an illusion that wasn't affiliated with this world. This was why she couldn't touch anything. Kealia was part of the world called the Great Darkness now. Anything within the Great Darkness was real to her. Both Kealia and Regus existed within the Great Darkness. However, Kealia chose to stay within the Great Darkness. Regus chose to step out into the world within the body of an undead. That is why I'm sensitive to the problem more so than you. Are you talking the problem I spoke to you about? Yes. Regus spoke. He knew that he won't be able to be revived again if his body was completely destroyed. Kealia was closer to the great darkness than Regus. That is why she was able to feel the problem more sharply. The pillars are being destroyed. What pillars? These are the pillars making up the great darkness. It isn't just one that was destroyed. I'm the only one that sensed it, but another pillar is being destroyed right now. This will create a great imbalance in the great darkness. The activities of the dragon demon king worshippers were extremely reduced. They had been causing confusion all over the continent, but they had no choice to abandon their political maneuverings. Even their lowest ranked political agents were called in to defend the waypoints of the road of emptiness. This didn't mean the confusion caused by them were gone. Of course, there were problems that arose even when things were supposed to settle down. The dragon demon king worshippers had already set the fire, so the intense conflagration of society continued to occur. This was the case in the Daylan kingdom. To be precise, their problem stemmed from the fact that the king was killed before the heir could be chosen. In the end, a civil war had occurred. The civil war was getting so intense that the members of the guardian shadows affiliated with the Daylan kingdom couldn't do anything. No. The members had to stand by their political affiliation and they had to fight each other. As members of the Guardian Shadow, they were supposed to protect humanity by fighting the Dragon Demon King worshippers. However, they were also nobles of the Daylan Kingdom. They had to choose a new king before they could end the civil war. They had to bring stability to their kingdom. I'm not sure we can interfere with matters involving another country. Chiron grumbled as he shook off the blood from his sword. The corpses of Dragon Demon King worshippers were strewn about, and the undeads were ruthlessly destroyed. They were the forces placed here to protect this location by the Plane of Darkness. Azel and his party didn't have high hopes that the Guardian Shadows of Daylan would mobilize to help them. In the end, Azel's party had to attack the waypoints. Leticia spoke. From their perspective, they did the best they could do, so I can't fault him too much. I'm not complaining about them. I'm complaining about the situation itself. The members of the Guardian Shadows in the Daylan Kingdom couldn't participate in battles, but they had done much to support Azul's party. They gave Azul's party places to rest. They also sent supplies and healers to them. Since Azul's party was continuously moving as they fought, their help was invaluable. Each member of Azul's party was strong enough to make their name known even if they were back in the Dragon Demon War. However, they possessed living bodies. They couldn't free themselves from fatigue and wounds. After the party entered into the Daylan Kingdom for a fortnight, they were able to destroy nine waypoints. If there were easy fights, there were also dangerous fights. Leticia, Arietta and Euron were wounded in different battles. They had to sit out one battle each. Our fatigue has to be taken into account. For a while, we'll have to avoid fighting. We have to focus on rest. 
Chiron came to that decision. The biggest burden possessed by the party was the Vitans chalice. They couldn't rest in one place, because of the Vitans chalice. If they stayed in one place too long, Almeric and Regus would lead their elite forces against Azul's party. Chiron asked a question towards the nearest guardian shadow. Please check if it is possible for Azel to contact us. In the next moment, Chiron got his answer. I'm still fighting. We finished faster than him. I guess that location was much more dangerous than expected. Let us retreat for now, and we'll wait for Azel to contact us. Azel and Laura were moving separate from the other party members. They were moving separately. But their objective wasn't the destruction of the waypoints. Their objective was a bit more important. Azel contacted Chiron after three hours. The Guardian Shadow spoke with Azel's voice. We were successful. It seems you had to fight a very hard battle. You took a very long time. A Tyne's monsters were placed here as guards. They were quite annoying. The goal of Azel and Laura was to destroy the Pillars of the Great Darkness. These locations possessed transcendent beings that Atain had been unable to kill. Carlos had found out where all the pillars were located when he became affiliated with the Great Darkness. These beings might become unsealed like Belrun. Sarazel had no choice. He had to destroy them. When he came to this judgment, he decided to move independent of his party. He only took Laura along with him, because he predicted he would need a magician. When he arrived, he found out that the seal wasn't left unprotected by Atain. You were able to destroy it without suffering any loss. But it seems it would be better if we move together. I agree. I underestimated him too much. Azel readily admitted his mistake. Then he asked a question. How did it go on your side? We were able to neatly wrap things up here. We suffered no injuries. And the loss to the Guardian Shadows were minimal. I'm glad. The problem is. Chiron decided to speak to Azel about a problem that had been weighing on his mind. What do you think? I believe the Duke's judgment is correct. We need the rest, and we need time to be able to teach the dragon's soul to the princess. It had been twenty days since Arietta had joined the party. In this time frame, Chiron had been trying to teach the dragon's soul to Arietta. However, they were too busy fighting and moving. This was why it was difficult for Arietta to make any progress. Rishu was the founder of the dragon's soul and even he needed over a month to teach Chiron and Leticia. Moreover, they were able to focus on their training, since their enemies wouldn't attack them within the forest. They were also able to avoid major pitfalls thanks to Cybane's ability, so their progress had been fast. In comparison, Arietta's environment was too poor to learn the Dragon Soul. For the near future, we'll avoid battles. We can decrease our traveling speed as we rest. I just had a good idea. Azel cut off Chiron's words. Chiron was puzzled as he asked Azel a question. What's your idea? I'll travel with Laura for a while. Then you guys will be able to rest. Him. What about you? I have the Storm Dragon's Wing and the Crying Phoenix. We'll summon the Vitans Chalice in a distance location, and when our enemies come to confront us, we'll dodge them. If it is just one person, I can move with her. Understood. Let's do that. Chiron decided to follow Azul's suggestion. Chapter 195. Message. Part 2. Laura was exhausted as she sat in front of the campfire. She had her eyes closed with an ashen face. After talking to Chiron through the guardian shadow, Azel spoke with a weak voice. I'm sorry. I should be the one saying that to you. I'm the one that made the wrong judgment. You don't have any reasons to apologize to me. I'm sorry. Azel gave an apology. The monsters, who were left behind by Atain to protect the sealed transcendent being, were terrifying. Azel and Laura were able to defeat them after a fierce battle. However, Laura had used too much magical energy, so she was exhausted. Azel was also tired, and he was injured. Azel had become injured protecting the exhausted Laura. Azel didn't relay any of this through his communication. He wanted his comrades to rest in peace. He wanted to take care of his comrades. Laura spoke. If I didn't possess the Vitans Chalice. If so, we would have had to fight a foe equipped with the Vitans Chalice. You shouldn't place unnecessary blame on yourself. Azel unfastened his cloak, and he placed it around Laura's shoulder. 
You'll feel better soon. The guardian shadows will keep a lookout. We'll rest for an hour here. You should take a quick nap. I think you need sleep more so than meditation. What about you? You should be. I'm all right. I'm built much sturdier than you. In truth, Azul's wound wasn't light. There was a large cut on his left side, and couple ribs were cracked. He had used his spirit order to stop the bleeding, but he would need proper healing. Still, Azel wanted Laura to rest first. I want you to sleep for now. If you don't recover enough to move on your own, it'll become troublesome. Yes, she had abused her mind and energy pulse as she consumed her magical energy. Sleep washed over her as she felt a chill. Laura swallowed the words she was about to say, and she went to sleep for a brief amount of time. When she opened her eyes again, Azel was putting out the campfire. Are you awake? Yes. When you started putting out the campfire, I assumed it was time for us to move. It seemed she used a spell that was activated when a prerequisite was triggered. She had slept for a short amount of time, but she had recovered significantly. Laura queried him. What did you do? I talked with the Duke once again after you fell asleep. The party had destroyed the waypoints of the Road of Emptiness for the past 40 days. They had traveled all over the continent. They had fought at an incredible pace. They had traveled several hundred kilometers per day, so they hadn't taken any breaks. Even Azul's condition was deteriorating. They had worked in concert with the members of the Guardian Shadows to destroy 31 waypoints of the Road of Emptiness. Their enemies still had 191 waypoints left. They still had enough waypoints to travel the entirety of the continent. We've significantly decreased their mobility, but we didn't take any breaks as we made the big push. That is why we are slowly hitting our limit. We'll have to spend a good amount of time on fixing ourselves. How long is a good amount of time? If nothing drastic happens, it should take a fortnight. They would have to leave the battles to the members of Guardian Shadows in each country. They would have to focus on supporting them with intelligence. Laura's expression darkened. The others will be able to rest, but you. We'll be fine. Azel went out of his way to use the word, we. We've worked diligently, and as a result, there are huge gaps in the road of emptiness. We'll pick one of those regions. What about the Alberton Forest? That'll be our last resort. We've already used that place as a refuge once. If we repeat our actions again, it might not matter that we are in the Alberton Forest. The Plane of Darkness might risk a war with the Alberton Forest. We can't discount that possibility. If that happened, Alberton couldn't guarantee the safety of Azul's party. Alberton was the leader of the forest, and he would have to make decisions based on politics. If he made a level-headed judgment, there was a high probability that Alberton would chase Azul's party out of the forest. Awakened dragon weapon. Crying phoenix. An enormous bird made out of fire appeared in front of Azel. It was as big as a house, and it looked if it was capable of carrying several people on its back. In fact, it was capable of doing just that. Let's go. He got on the fiery phoenix. No one in their sane mind would want to get on it, yet Azel and Laura didn't hesitate as they mounted the phoenix. When the two of them got on, the phoenix beat its huge wings as it flew into the air. In a flash, the ground dropped away. Laura asked him a question. Was it like this during the Dragon Demon War? What do you mean by your question? The whole world is on our side, yet we don't have any refuge we can use. No. It was a war where the Allied forces were putting up a fight against invaders. It was a different situation than the one we face right now. Azul's gaze headed towards the darkening sky. It was as Laura had said. The Dragon Demon King worshippers were the enemy of world. This was why the whole world was on Azul's side. Still, they didn't have any place where they could rest in peace. Their enemies were on the defensive, yet they had to travel at a pace where their enemies couldn't catch up with them. If Almeric and Regus didn't exist, we could hole up anywhere. Those two were the problem. Aside from Azul's party, no one could contend with Almeric and Regus. To be precise, Azel was the only one that could fight on an even ground with them. When the two of them woke up, Laura couldn't help but worry about other hidden forces that might wake up within the plane of darkness. Still, this fight has an end. 
The pressure on us lessens every time we destroy a waypoint. It doesn't erase the fact that our enemies know our location. Aren't we coming up with some ways to counter that? As I've told you earlier, I don't want you to blame yourself. It is better than watching a city with tens of thousands of people being evaporated into ashes by the Vitans' chalice. It was as he said. It wouldn't have mattered if it was a regular dragon weapon. The Vitans' chalice was too dangerous to hand over to their enemies. However, it was also true that the Vitans' chalice was the root of many of their troubles. That's why they had thought about destroying the Vitans' chalice. There is no guarantee that they won't be able to summon it again even if we destroy it. The dragon weapons of the dragon demon generals were affiliated with the Great Darkness. If its owner was dead, it would return to a fixed location. This occurred even if one gave up rights to the weapon. The problem arose from the fact that Carlos had been unable to decipher the structure of this system. Would the dragon weapon cease to exist if it was destroyed? Or would its essence be returned to the Great Darkness? Would it be recovered as time passes? If it was the latter, it would be the worst possible outcome. In the case of Azel, he had a reason to be pessimistic in regards to the possibility of Vitan's chalice being restored. He had recovered his sky splitter. In the Balan forest, he had gone through the dragon slayer's ritual with an earth dragon. He had thought his sky splitter had ceased to exist. However, he had found the fragments of the sky splitter within his energy pulse and he was able to restore it. In the end, Azel had no choice, but to maintain the status quo. Azel spoke. It is true that the distinction between allies and enemies were much more simpler during the Dragon Demon War. That part was easier. The Dragon Demon King's army had attacked the world as an army of conquerors. In turn, humanity coalesced into one to resist against the attackers. Of course, there had been a lot of problems. There were political problems, and various forces fought for their own profits. These were the types of problems that had been present at the time, but it wasn't as complicated what they faced right now. Since things have turned out like this, it might be better to reveal the existence of our enemies. What if we make it everyone's fight instead of a fight between the Guardian Shadows and the Dragon Demon King worshippers? It wasn't as if Azul's party hadn't thought about this before. However, they decided the collateral damage from a head-to-head -head fight would be too large. Unlike the days of the Dragon Demon War, the continent was divided into seven kingdoms. The Guardian Shadows transcended nationality. Their mission was to fight the Dragon Demon King worshippers. If the Dragon Demon King worshippers were revealed, the existence of the Guardian Shadows would be revealed too. It would create many problems. This was why Azul's party hadn't gotten involved with the civil war inside the Daylan Kingdom. As a noble from another country, Chiron's involvement would cause an incredible amount of backlash. It would have been great if everyone could cooperate with each other for the sole purpose of fighting the Dragon Demon King worshippers. It would have been great if the world was that simple. Since the world could never be like that, they had no choice but to fight in this manner. On the other hand, the Dragon Demon King worshippers didn't want to reveal themselves to the world either. It was a fear that was developed during the Dragon Demon War. They were afraid of their existence becoming common knowledge. They no longer had the power to fight against the entire world. We have no choice but to nudge the world at a slow pace. Their plate was already full taking care of the chaos caused by the Dragon Demon King worshippers. Still, this didn't mean they weren't going to do anything. They possessed operatives like the Dragon Demon Queen of the Rulan Kingdom. The organization called the Guardian Shadows kept itself hidden as they carried out their work of eradicating their enemies. If possible, I want to finish them before they make themselves known to the world. I don't want a repeat of the Dragon Demon War. Azel liked this peaceful era. Of course, it wasn't as if the whole world was peaceful. However, he was able to find peace in this world. He didn't want the entire world to suffer under a war. He didn't want the world to go crazy again. He didn't want children to be born into the world where it would be hard for them to imagine a world without a war. I want girls like Muzanora to live in a peaceful world. I don't want him to even know about the war until it has already come to an end. Laura quipped. You sound like an old man. Are you saying that as a revenge for what I said to you before? However, 
I cannot refute your words. Azel burst out into laughter. As each waypoints of the road of emptiness were destroyed, the freedom of movement enjoyed by the dragon demon king worshippers were decreased significantly. When traveling to a place, it mattered that they were able to appear in front of their destination. The difference in what they could do differed significantly if they had to travel an hour to reach a destination. If the road of emptiness could be used continuously, it might not have mattered. However, it took time to restart the gate, and the number of forces that could be moved through them was limited. Their effectiveness decreased noticeably. When problems occurred, it was getting progressively harder to gather all their forces in one place. This was why each waypoint had defensive forces stationed there. They were no longer on the offensive, and the burden they had to shoulder also grew. Moreover, it is as if they can read our mind. The biggest problem was the fact that they were falling behind in terms of information. Kieran had on a serious expression as he pointed out this fact. In the beginning, the Guardian Shadows attacked blindly. This was why the Demon King worshippers were able to smash them into pieces in several occasions. However, at some point, their tactic had changed. First, they attacked a waypoint to induce additional forces from the Plane of Darkness to be sent in. If someone that they couldn't handle showed up, they would give up on the battle. They cleanly cut their losses as they retreated. Nibirus asked him a question. What if it is their plan to attack different locations at the same time? Kieran and Nibirus weren't dispatched amongst the normal defense force stationed at the waypoints. They acted as support. They were only inserted when there was a problem. In the beginning, the two of them smashed their enemies, and they made glorious contributions. However, at some point, their enemies retreated every time the two of them were dispatched. They were coming up empty. Currently, they had already used the road of emptiness to come here, so their hands were tied. While they were waiting, another waypoint was being attacked. It was obvious that their enemies had created a list of dangerous figures they would avoid. Moreover, the Guardian Shadows possessed capabilities similar to the Great Darkness where they could assess a given situation in real time. They were fighting the battles in an organic manner. Kieran frowned. That's it. They attacked as if they waited for us to arrive here. It seems the nearby forces were mobilized. But. Where's the nearest waypoint? It is 32 kilometers away. We won't be able to make it in time. When a waypoint of the road of emptiness was used once, it needed 10 minutes to recharge. Even if they waited for the waypoint to recover in 10 minutes, they wouldn't be sent directly to the waypoint that was being attacked. If things were going poorly, the troops would have already been sent from the plane of darkness. Nibirus spoke. They really are focused on decreasing the density of waypoints. The Guardian Shadows weren't just decreasing the number of waypoints. It was clear that they were attacking the waypoints as they stuck to a game plan. The game plan was to to maximize the distance between each waypoints. The Guardian Shadows were steadily cutting away at their mobility. This was what Chiron had aimed for. We just have to hope that they can last. Our waypoint will recover faster. So when the other side recovers, we can immediately move. Sir Baldazark. Suddenly, Nibirus desperately yelled out loud. At the same time, she activated her defensive magic. Chapter 196. Message. Part 3. Sir Baldazark. Suddenly, Nibirus let out a desperate shout. At the same time, she unleashed her spell. An unbelievable amount of thunder was sent towards them from a long distance away, and it exploded. Kieran's eyes opened wide in shock. Where the hell did that? Nibirus had created a magic eye that relayed information to her. She had done this as a precaution, and she was observing a radius of three kilometers. An attack had been sent from farther out. On top of that, they were in a mountainous region. If the attacker was farther out than three kilometers, one wouldn't be able to secure a clear view of them. So how did someone manage to pull off this attack? Rise Dragon Weapon. Bleeding Star. As they asked such questions to themselves, they immediately summoned the Dragon Weapons. The two of them had faced several life-threatening situations in the past. They wouldn't be taken unawares anymore. Even if they hadn't been careless, their minds couldn't make sense of what had happened. They were caught off guard. It couldn't be helped. Part. Kieran's eyes widened. Something had penetrated their multi-layered barrier magic. 
as if that wasn't bad enough. Something pierced through his shoulder. This is. Kieran realized the identity of the attack. Dragon weapon. Underworld's marksman. It was the dragon weapon that had critically wounded the dragon demon general Baldazark during the dragon demon war. Kieran was Baldazark's descendant. Of course, he knew about this weapon. Azel Karzark. The lightning strike in the beginning was bait. On the surface, it looked like a poor move that would cause unnecessary vigilance in one's opponent. However, the underworld ruler's marksman was used right afterwards, and they were taken by surprise. Kieran endured the pain as he pushed his body forward. The blood coming out of his wound sparked as it turned into flames that surrounded his body. Part. Pa bart. Pa ba bart. The bolts sent by the underworld's marksman hit the flame. After Baldazark almost died from this weapon, he had developed a barrier spell that would counter this weapon. The magic consumption was extremely high, and it had a critical flaw of increasing his susceptibility to all other attacks. However, it was better than being killed by the underworld's marksman. Unfortunately, this defensive method could only be used on himself. His subordinates that were outside the range of his barrier were dying. Kieran grinded his teeth. Shit, I want everyone to retreat inside for now. They were being sniped by something that defied reason. It was dangerous to be in a wide open space. With this in mind, Kieran retreated into the cave. Nibirus followed after him. However, she felt puzzled by what had occurred. Why were none aimed for me? Why? Not a single bolt from the underworld's marksman had been aimed at her. Half of the bolts were focused on Kieran, and the rest were aimed at her subordinates. Soon, Nibirus was successful in locating Azel. Over there, unexpectedly, Azel wasn't putting in too much effort in hiding himself. He just used an invisibility technique that discouraged his enemies from seeing him through sight. We are at a disadvantage right now. We'll have to retreat for now. She was having such thoughts when her surroundings suddenly warped. Nibirus. Kieran extended his hand in surprise, but he was a beat too late. Nibirus' figure disappeared as if she was a heat shimmer in the distance. Afterwards, violent lightning impacted the cave. The cave entrance collapsed. In a flash, Nibirus realized that she had been transported a long distance using the dimensional distortion. Nibirus knew of only one person that could pull this off. Laura. Vitten's chalice could use dimensional distortion to connect point A to point B. It was Laura's specialty. She could use this trick to pull anyone in front of her. It was an unpleasant experience, but it was true that Laura had used this move to save her from being killed by Azel. Still, that was the past. It was clear that Laura was an enemy. I'm still within one kilometer. Nibirus quickly assessed her situation. Thankfully, the Vitten's maze hadn't been used. This was why she was pulled only a distance of a kilometer. She was also able to sense that she was cut off from Kieran and her allies when the cave entrance was brought down. If Kieran used his ability, he would be able to come out of the cave in short order. However, Nibirus wasn't confident that she could last that long against Azel's party. If I had the time to use the Queen of Darkness. She decided to quickly summon her Book of Darkness. She had to use the great magic called the Queen of Darkness to amplify her ability. However, she wasn't given the time to use it. Unfortunately, her enemies wouldn't give her the opportunity to use such a move. She didn't even have time to say anything to Laura, who was in front of her. Lightning rained down from all directions towards her. Sky Splitter. Azel had initiated his attack. The lightning was like a mixture of flame and electricity. The lightning hammered on top of her barrier spell. It felt as if dozen magicians were attacking her at the same time. Nibirus could only focus on her defense. If I cannot endure this, this place will be my grave. When she hardened her defense, she started bouncing around the air like a ball. She didn't have the luxury to assess her surrounding. She put all her efforts in not losing her concentration. Soon, she realized that she was high up in the sky. The lightning that had been mindlessly impacting on her barrier was gone in a flash. Azel had halted his attack. Soon, she heard Azel's voice. Nibirus, will you have a conversation with me? What underhanded scheme are you plotting this time? Nibirus couldn't comprehend his motive, 
so she furrowed her brows. When she looked down, she saw that the ground was very far away. Even as a high-ranked magician, she had never climbed up to such elevation. Did he intentionally bring me up here? She was chilled with fright. Basically, Azel had used his sky splitter without a single ounce of killing intent behind it. He didn't give Niberus the chance to counterattack, and he had separated her completely from her allies without injuring her. It had all been done for this purpose. Azel shrugged his shoulders. I don't like the fact that I have to go through all these annoying steps to have a conversation with you. However, I made a promise, so I have no choice. You promised. To whom did you make this promise with? The simpleton prince. I meant to say your father. I made a promise with Sibane. Niberus' eyes widened. However, her surprise lasted only a moment. In a short amount of time, her expression calmed. Azel queried her. You don't seem as surprised as I thought you would be. If my father was alive, I had a feeling my father would run across you. In the past, Niberus had tracked down Sibane's whereabouts. She had gone into the Alberton forest. However, she had experienced something unbelievable in there. A water dragon of unknown origin had delivered the Book of Darkness to her. From that moment on, Niberus was sure that Sibane was alive. She didn't know why he wouldn't meet her but she knew he had his reasons for doing so. She had swallowed her disappointment. However, a determined resolve appeared in Niberus eyes. It seems you plan on deceiving me by trying to sell information about my father to me. I want you to give up on such empty dreams. There was a wide river of grudge separating Azel and Niberus. It wasn't a relationship that could be salvaged. I told myself I wouldn't become careless, yet. She thought herself to be pathetic. It was the same in the past when she had tried to attack Azel's party. She had been helpless as she was walked all over by his party. Azel let out a bitter laugh. I expected such a reaction. However, I did make a promise. Therefore, I don't think it would be right for me to kill you just because you cannot drop your hostility towards me. Just listen to me for now. Then I'll send you back alive. You continue to show contempt by looking down upon me. How much before you are satisfied? I don't have any plans on putting in any effort to look down on you. It would be much cleaner for me to kill you when the opportunity presents itself. If I wanted to, I could have killed you 100 times over since I've arrived here. You bastard. Niberus' body shook from anger. An acute sense of humiliation washed over her. On the other hand, she was a high-ranked magician, so she tried to coolly assess the situation. She didn't want to admit it, but it was as Azel had said. I'm sorry, Duran. I will not be able to take revenge for you. I found myself lacking. Niberus apologized to Duran, who had died for her. However, his presence still lived within her heart, so she wouldn't give up even if the fight was insurmountable. She couldn't withdraw her grudge just because she was curious about her father. Her pride wouldn't let her do so. As expected, this is how she'll respond. Azel could read Niberus' resolve. She showed no signs of compromising. There was no way she could win this fight. Her life was being threatened, and she wanted to know about her father. These were the reasons why she should withdraw her grudge against Azel. She should accept the demand for a conversation, but she wasn't going to humiliate herself by choosing that option. Her pride was strong and upright like a blade. I kind of like that about you. He had to deliver Sibane's message to her. From his perspective, it was a frustrating situation. On the other hand, he could understand and sympathize with her intentions. Azel and his comrades in the Dragon Demon War had felt the same thing as her. The Dragon Demon King's army held an absolute edge against humanity. The Dragon Demon King's army threatened their lives to forcefully forge a deal with humanity. However, Azel and his comrades never agreed to such terms. I have no choice. I'll make you listen with my strength. You won't be able to accomplish that easily. Unless you immediately take your own life. She had opened her book of darkness as she was about to cast a spell. Her heart lurched when she suddenly heard Azel's voice from behind her. You have no choice but to hear me out. Lightning exploded against her barrier. Niberus' body shot upwards. Is it incarnation? This was one of Azul's moves that instilled extreme fear in her. She had experienced it ad nauseum. 
She had experienced it before, but she had no way of countering it. Several dozen forms of Azel surrounded Niberus, and a storm-like attack was sent towards her. It was the same situation that had sent her up to this elevation. It was such a fierce attack that she could only defend against it. No, she was in a worse situation. This is. The sky splitter had changed itself into several thousand strands of light, and they were attacking Niberus barrier from all sides. While this was going on, another fatal attack was being used against her. Azel was using his moon sword to eat away at her magical energy. Normally, she would immediately try to counter such a move. However, she was having a hard time just lasting against Azel's bombardment. Her barrier was slowly decaying, yet she couldn't do anything about it. Do you now realize why I took the trouble to bring you up here? It felt as if she was going to lose her sense of hearing as the explosive sounds assaulted her ears, yet Azel's voice could be heard clearly. It was as if he was whispering his words right next to her ears. Do you think I'll take this lying down? Niberus used her hidden card. She hadn't used it, because of Laura. However, Laura wasn't present in this elevation. The Book of Darkness let out a wave of terrifying dragon demon magic. Several dozen spells poured out into the surrounding. The Book of Darkness strength was its overwhelming firepower. There were a great number of spells baked into the book, and she didn't need to chant the spells to use them. Once she took out the Book of Darkness, it was basically like having several dozen magicians as her support. In a flash, Niberus' firepower exceeded Azul's firepower. Her spells pushed aside the lightning from the sky splitter as she created space for herself. Respond to my call. Oh, Book of Darkness. She used the Book of Darkness to create an opportunity for herself. He chained the spells together as she used a continuous stream of magic. She planned on stacking the spells in order to fight against Azel. Niberus' eyes widened. What? Her spells were broken. A high-level spell had intruded from outside. Laura. Naturally, she thought about Laura. However, Laura hadn't followed him up into the altitudes. However, she was here at the same time. They are a lesser version of her, but I basically have four Lauras with me. That should be enough magical support. Amongst Azel's clones, there were four silhouettes made out of light. It was the dragon weapon called Dawn's Defender. He had created clones with the help of Laura. I heard it in our lore, but how many dragon weapon can he summon all at once? Niberus was at a loss for words. The Sky Splitter was an incredibly terrifying dragon weapon in itself. However, Azel was using the storm's wing to fly at high speeds, and the moon's sword was eating at her magical energy. Now he had manifested four clones of Laura using the Dawn's Defender. Let's talk. Azel continuously attacked her as he calmly spoke to her. As you've surmised, the simpleton prince is alive. He is alive and very healthy. He delivered his dragon weapon to you, because he made an oath to become the resident of the Alberton Forest. This was why he couldn't meet you. Your father wanted me to persuade you to leave the Plain of Darkness. I think his request is nonsense but he made the request. I'm delivering his message to you. Azel Kazark. Niberus raged. It felt as if her brain would fry from the humiliation she was feeling. However, Azel didn't care what emotions she was feeling. He was meticulous in hamstringing her spells. He continued to put her on the defensive as he spoke. Your father left the plane of darkness, because she couldn't shake off Azel's voice, and it shook Niberus' heart. Chapter 197. Message. Part 4. In the end, Azel was able to explain the entirety of Sybane's situation to Niberus before he exited the place. Laura had been in a faraway location, so she could harass their enemies. She had remained inside a barrier. Laura asked him a question. What if we, him, wouldn't it have been better to kidnap her? You've seen Niberus' personality. It wouldn't have been strange to see her kill herself if we did that. However, we could, have completely subdued her. Couldn't we have just taken her straight to Sir Sybane? We were in debt to the simpleton prince, so we carried out the promise we made him. Still, I don't want to go that far in trying to fulfill that request. Moreover, our opponent isn't that easy. While Azel taunted Niberus, he thoroughly assessed her intentions. However, 
This didn't mean Nibiris was a foe that we could take lightly. In the process of pulling her up into the air, he could have killed her at any moment. However, once she regained her footing in the air, it had been hard for him to pierce through her defense. The biggest problem had been the time limit. I believe Sir Almeric is here. Laura was using a mid-level magic eye. She had been monitoring the waypoint in the far distance. While he had been having a conversation with Nibiris, Kieran had exited the collapsed cave. Then Almeric revealed himself through the recovered waypoint of the Road of Darkness. However, they were too late. Azel and Laura was already exited the location at full speed. Azel let out a bitter laugh as he spoke. If we could defeat that bastard, we wouldn't have to do this. The tracking of the Dragon Demon General's dragon weapon was an ability possessed by Almeric. Ainsera didn't have that ability. Basically, Azel's party would be freed from the pressure of moving endlessly if they killed Almeric. However, it wasn't time yet. They had to get rid of as many waypoints to the Road of Darkness. At the very least, Azel had to create a scenario where he could fight Almeric or Regis in a one-on-one -on -one fight. He had recovered the strength he possessed during his prime, but he couldn't guarantee he could win in a battle against two of them. The opportunity will come. Azel buried the humiliation he had suffered in his past battle, and he made a cool judgment. Laura queried him, what are you going to do about Nibiris? I'm not sure. Azel told her the truth. He told her how her mother had died, and he had told her what her father had suffered within the plane of darkness. At first, she had been incensed. However, her face started to turn pale as the story continued. At the end, she was frozen. She didn't even think about catching Azel, who was making his exit. It was all a lie. That was what she had thought. It was all bullshit that was meant to deceive her. However, there was something she could not deny. Azel knew too much details into her personal affairs. Laura used to be a high-ranking officer in the Plane of Darkness, but there was no way she would have known about Nibiris' personal affairs. If possible, I would like you to come to a sensible decision. She was someone I wanted to kill at all cost in the past, but I'm reluctant to do so now, because of Cybane. Azel let out a bitter laughter as he asked Laura a question. Which option do you prefer? I'm of the same mind as you. Laura didn't like Nibiris. From Laura's perspective, Nibiris was someone that hadn't grown up doubting her own existence. She was someone that had been revered by everyone. Of course, Laura had become jealous of her. However, such emotions became faint when she became Azel's comrade. Laura already lost the source that had caused her to be jealous of Nibiris. She wasn't a tool within Azel's party. She had comrades, who respected her. She was treated as someone with feelings. Maybe, I might be feeling sympathy towards Nibiris. Laura wasn't sure of her emotions, yet she continued to speak. In the past, Nibiris and Laura didn't care about each other's personal life. The only thing that was important to them was the way they treated each other as competitors. It was different now. She had learned the truth about Nibiris through Cybane. Laura knew the truth now, and she could no longer look at Nibiris with the same eyes. Azel spoke. That might be true, but it is as you've said. She had been deceived and lied to by the spectres of the past that refuses to die. She lived her life by being blinded by their fanaticism. In the past, Azel had considered Nibiris only to be an enemy. However, his perception went through a change when he met Cybane. He saw Nibiris as a person now. She was a person that could cry, laugh and grieve. It was an unwelcome change. It was best to only have hatred and hostility towards one's enemies. Once one found a reason to be sympathetic towards an enemy, it was inevitable that the sword would be dulled. Laura spoke. I no longer want to fight Nibiris. If I'm being truthful, I feel the same way. I suffered a big loss in trying to keep this promise. I just have to hope her choice won't let this end on a sour note. Azel had suffered a lot of losses in this venture. The fact that he could have eliminated a strong foe like Nibiris was a big loss in itself. Even if he knew information that made him feel sympathy towards her, this might result in her killing one of his allies in the future. Moreover, he had revealed the extent of his powers to her. He hadn't shown her everything, 
but every information about his dragon weapons would have already been transmitted through the great darkness. Azel had shown good faith in keeping Cybane's request. If Niberus chose to fight him despite all of this, at that point, it can't be helped. While Azel's party took a break, the Guardian Shadows and the Dragon Demon King worshippers continued their fierce battle. The damage to both sides was proliferating. The role of attacking and defending was flipped, but it wasn't as if one side was overwhelmingly superior to the other. The Guardian Shadows were a bit ahead in terms of gathering information, so they were able to take the Dragon Demon King worshippers by surprise. However, one couldn't underestimate the fighting strength of the Dragon Demon King worshippers. The members of the Guardian Shadows in each country were dying in ones and twos. The spirits of the Guardian Shadow were no longer immortal, and their numbers were steadily decreasing. It is unfortunate that the continent was divided into seven kingdoms. Chiron was commanding the Guardian Shadows from the Rulan Kingdom. He was taking a break from fighting, but he still had to play his role. He gathered the information being sent to him from all over the place, and he was giving orders in real time. Arietta, who had been monitoring the situation from his side, let out a bitter laugh. It might have been better to have this war out in the open. No, if that happened, I doubt we would be able to unite our forces. If the Plane of Darkness declared their existence as they waged a war against the world again, would the world really fight back under one banner like the Dragon Demon War? She didn't think so. Aside from the kingdoms closest to the Plane of Darkness, the other kingdoms wouldn't consider it to be their problem. The fear of the Dragon Demon War was etched in history, so there would be some sort of cooperation between the kingdoms. However, the loss of one kingdom meant the gain of another kingdom. She was sure each kingdom would try to maneuver, so they would benefit the most. Chiron let out a sigh. This is frustrating. I am a noble of another kingdom. I hate the fact that I have to think about using someone in a similar situation as me. I am capitalizing on their deaths. Chiron was tied to the position of Duke in the Rulan Kingdom. That fact made it difficult for him to reveal to the others that he was the commander of the Guardian Shadows. A member of the Guardian Shadow had died moments ago. After seeing how the enemies were being mobilized, he had ordered a retreat. However, this person hadn't listened. It was something that happened often in battle even if the command structure was crystal clear. The command structure hadn't been established in the Guardian Shadows, so it wasn't surprising to see this occur. A noble from another kingdom had died, and he was troubled by it. Moreover, it was also a loss to the organization called the Guardian Shadow. However, there was a more important factors that troubled him. The dead member was in the same position as Chiron in the past. This person had become a member of the Guardian Shadow, because he had enmity towards the Dragon Demon King worshippers. This was the reason why he had fought with his life on the line. Instead of feeling respect and sadness towards the dead member, Chiron felt revulsion towards himself. Someone has to do this task. It seems I've lived long enough, since I'm being consoled by you. Chiron let out a bitter laugh. He had only seen her as his young student, who he had to look out for. However, he realized that she was an adult in her own right. Soon, he changed the topic of conversation. How's your dragon soul coming along? It keeps on staying at the precipice of succeeding and not succeeding. They had decided to move independently from Azel and Laura. This was why Chiron had decided to return to the Rulan Kingdom, and his party had joined up with Saiga. Moreover, he started teaching Arietta and Saiga about the dragon's soul in earnest. Both of them were dragon magians, but they possessed as much dragon demon magic as dragon demons. This was especially true for Arietta, who had gone through the dragon slayer's ritual. She had grown in leaps and bounds. On top of that, she had learned the forgotten techniques. She possessed all the prerequisites needed to learn the dragon soul. However, the dragon soul wasn't that easy to awaken. Chiron spoke. There is no other way than to be make steady progress. You've already learned the method, so you just have to work on it. It'll awaken before you know it. How long did it take for Leticia and you? It took us about a month and a half. However, your environment is inferior to what he had. Chiron didn't think he was better at teaching the dragon soul than Rishu. 
Rishu was the founder of the dragon soul, and he possessed deep understanding of this technique. On top of that, Saibane's absence was the biggest factor. Rishu had driven Chiron and Leticia to their limits, because Saibane possessed a healing ability. He couldn't do the same with Arietta and Saiga. Arietta asked him a question. I see. So who awakened the dragon soul first between you and Leticia? At her words, Chiron visibly frowned. His expression was an answer in itself. She was ahead of you, teacher. She's amazing. That is. Unlike him, Leticia had known about her own nature. He was about to make an excuse, but he shut his mouth. He thought it would be unmanly of him to do so. Chiron grumbled. You learned all the bad things from Azel, while you traveled with him. That is why you are being so mean. If it isn't now, when will I get to make fun of you? Humph. I should try hard to break your record. I can understand falling behind Leticia, but my pride as an elder sister would be hurt if I fall behind my brother, on the other hand, Sega's pride as a man would be hurt if he came in behind her. This was why he was trying very hard. The two siblings didn't look alike, but they were alike in every other way. Arietta spoke. However, it seems we won't be able to rest until Saiga and I awaken our dragon soul. That's right. Our absence is putting a lot of stress on our side, so we'll be moving in four days. In four days, it would exactly be two weeks since they decided to move independently from Azel and Laura. Everyone was well rested, and they were back to peak condition. Currently, they had destroyed 40 waypoints. There were 182 left. The deciding battle will start when the number of waypoints falls below 100. We just have to hope that our forces will be able to hold out until that time comes. Chiron was planning on dispatching Regus or Almeric at that point. He would set up a stage where they would be able to kill either of them for sure. However, it was always true that no plan survives contacts with the enemy. It had been 220 years since they had started the battle behind the scenes. This was the first time the plane of darkness had their hands full. They knew the value of the road of emptiness. They knew it better than anyone. It was a relic left behind Atene, who they had deified. This added to the value of the relic, and they decided that they would have to protect it no matter the cost. They could no longer leave the fight to the younger generation. The survivors of the Dragon Demon War had pulled the strings from the background. Now they would have to move their heavy butts. Of course, if one thought logically about it, not much would change even if they did move into the field. It was the same as the elders of the Ornsaurus tribe. They were dragon demons, but they had all weakened from old age. It had been too long since they had abdicated their places from the front line. However, those that were swept up by fanaticism usually made irrational decisions. Regus spoke. Him. I shouldn't be saying this, but what an ungainly sight. I feel the same way. However, the extra forces will be useful. Almeric smirked. Laura and the younger generation were told that only 20 survivors of the Dragon Demon War were left within the Plane of Darkness. Everyone else was dead, thanks to passage of time. However, that wasn't the truth. There were some amongst survivors of the Dragon Demon War, who had voluntarily changed themselves into the undead. If one thought about it rationally, it was truly a foolish choice. Even if one became an undead, one couldn't maintain one's sanity for long. Of course, if the undead was made well, there were various methods that could be used to maintain the undead. One could last for another several dozens of years, but this time period would be filled with pain. However, these beings wanted to see the revival of the dragon demon king with their own eyes. It was as Sibane had told Azel. It didn't take too long for the plane of darkness to be changed into a religiously fanatic organization. Those at the top were filled with madness, so it wasn't strange to see them act in such extreme manners. When they changed themselves into the undead, they had put themselves into a long hibernation in order to maintain their sanity. However, the upper echelon of the plane of darkness had no choice, but to wake him up. This was how desperate their situation was. Regus shrugged his shoulders. How much help can they be? I guess the magicians might help, but those that wield swords need a lot of time to reattune their senses. Spirit order practitioners and the dragon arts practitioners lost a lot when they became undead. 
When they became undead, they lost all reference points for their techniques. They had to retune their techniques to the standard of the undead, and it wasn't a thing that could be solved in a short amount of time. Almeric let out a bright smile as he asked a question. Are you speaking from experience after being drubbed by Azel? Ugh. You are poking at a painful memory. When he became an undead, Ragus had lost all his dragon demon magic. As a dragon arts practitioner, he had lost a lot of his skills in comparison to his past self. However, he had used battles to get used to the senses of an undead. Almeric spoke. Anyways, just the magicians will be of big help to us. These bastards have a lot of things hidden away, so it has been nice to continually use their resources. However, it seems the well is about to dry up, and I'm not too happy about it. For the most part, he had Ainsira's support, so Almeric had been acting as the supreme commander within the plane of darkness. However, those that were in power respected him, but they refused to reveal all they possessed to Almeric. Him, suddenly, Ragus raised his head. Almeric asked in puzzlement, What is it? Someone is coming. Is it someone that is worth paying attention to? How could it not be? However, the one to answer Almeric wasn't Ragus. Almeric and Ragus became surprised. Who are you? Someone had entered into the room after tricking their senses. After being revived, this was something both of them had experienced for the first time. The other person had his head covered with a black hood. No, if one was to be precise, a magical power was creating a curtain of darkness beneath the hood. It obscured the identity of the being, and it also modulated his voice. It seems a lot of time has passed. The being in front of them took off his hood as he spoke. When his face was revealed to Ragus and Almeric, they felt more surprised than the surprise they had felt when their senses were deceived. Chapter 198. Return. Part 1. Euron was having a dream. It was a familiar situation. He was dreaming about the guide. Countless fragments of memories were entangled in this chaotic space. Euron was in a half-asleep state when the guide whispered to Euron. It seems you are unsatisfied about something. You aren't Carlos Rizester. Euron brought up a question that he had harbored for a long time. The guide gave an affirmation. That's right. Are you the being that I've speculated to be? You know that I cannot answer that. If you are the one I guessed, you would say that. Even if I wasn't, I would have said the same thing. Unfortunately, that is true. When I say one thing, you evade in a different direction. I really do hate you. Euron grumbled. He could only guess at the identity of the guide. However, he didn't have any information that could confirm his suspicions. Euron was greatly disappointed when he found out that the guide wasn't Carlos. He had wanted the guide to be Carlos. He wanted confirmation that he was the reincarnation of Bayon, and he wanted the guide to be someone that had fought besides Azel. Suddenly, the guide asked him a question. Euron, what do you think about the life you are leading right now? I believe I am using my life for a worthy cause. Euron truly felt that way. Until he met the guide, Euron hadn't thought for himself. He didn't have feelings, and he didn't know what he liked. He had been developed as a tool for the Dragon Demon King worshippers. After meeting the guide, Euron started to find out what he disliked. He didn't like the environment he was subjected to, and he didn't like being made into a disposable soldier to be used by the Dragon Demon King worshippers. On top of it all, he hated himself for not being able to escape from their clutches. Currently, he thought he could like himself a little bit now. It was a gradual process. He couldn't shed the sense of guilt, but as he did the right things, he was starting to feel better about himself. It is all thanks to you. He was able to escape from the yoke of his fate, because the guide had given him power. He had been grown to be a tool for mad men, yet he was able to use his life as he fit now. Above all else, he was able to meet his comrades. Azel, Chiron, Leticia, Laura, and even Arietta now. He had established trust with everyone. He was no longer seen as a tool that didn't have a sense of self. He wasn't seen as a disposable tool. He gained comrades that would risk their lives for him and vice versa. It was a bit embarrassing to say this out loud, but Euron was truly touched by their attitude towards him. 
He would do anything for these people. He would willingly give up his life for them. These were emotions that he hadn't known it existed until he met them. Moreover, these emotions made him what he was right now. Isn't that enough? I'm scared. Euron spoke. Your identity and my identity. I'm afraid the truth differs from what I want to believe. Until now, Euron hadn't revealed his insecurities. Euron had always maintained an easygoing attitude in front of his comrades. He acted as if he didn't have any suspicions about the guide, who was an unknown entity. It looked as if he was willingly following down the road of destiny being shown by the guide. However, in truth, Euron was worried. He was able to understand his past sins through the guide. The knowledge ripped Euron's heart into pieces. He always looked for an opportunity to escape as he pretended to live as a tool for the plane of darkness. His sense of guilt had kept mounting during this time. It was so large that he had wondered if he would be able to settle it in the future. The meeting with Azel was like finding a light within the dark. He was able to decide how he wanted to use his life thanks to Azel. He wasn't just blindly fighting against the acts being perpetrated by the plane of darkness. He was fighting to end them once and for all. It was the same for Leticia. Euron and Leticia had been continuously fighting a battle with no end in sight. The two of them joined hands, because they had felt the same desolate feeling about the future. I'm afraid that you and I might become their enemy. This was the identity of the fear festering within Euron's heart. Azel and his comrades were invaluable to him. He wouldn't trade them for anything. This was why he was gripped with fear at the thought of harming them in some way. He was going nuts over it. No matter who you are, I'm really thankful towards you. My feelings about that won't change. Euron knew the guide Hade planned out his fate. In fact, he might merely be a puppet moving to the guide's tune. At the same time, the guide had given him the freedom to choose his destiny. In the past, he had only one choice. The guide had increased his options to two, and he couldn't express how thankful he was. If you are our enemy, then I. It doesn't matter who I am. You are you, Euron. The guide cut off Euron's words. If my guess is right, I am your reincarnation. We are the same person. Let us say your guess is right. You are the reincarnation of Bayon. Do you feel as if you are Bayon? He didn't feel that way. Euron was sure he was the reincarnation of Bayon, but he never considered Bayon's life to be his own. You are Euron Rizester. It doesn't matter what you think about me. You cannot deny that fact. Even at the cost of going against your will. I never forced you to do anything. You made your own choices. After Azel and Laura separated from their comrades, they had delivered Sybane's story to Niberus. Afterwards, it wasn't as if they spent the remaining time doing nothing. Azel, I think the relic collapsed during the excavation, so they gave up on it. I see. Him. It would be great if there was something left over. Azel and Laura was deep within a forest. It was a place where very few people frequented. They found an old ruin. There was evidence of someone else having tried to excavate this ruin. However, it was as Laura had said. The excavation attempt hadn't been successful. Instead of a large-scale excavation, a small group had tried to empty the contents of the relic like tomb raiders. The tunnel had collapsed in the middle. This ruin was made by Carlos during his lifetime. Before Carlos was trapped within the mountain peak of Laos, he had made arrangements for Azel. They were placed all over the continent. In the past, Azel had recovered some of them through the information given to him by Euron. After Belrun died, Carlos had told Azel many things before the power of the Dawn's Defender was depleted. Azel received something he should have gotten when he had woken up inside the ruin. Carlos gave Azel a map with the locations of stashes he left behind for Azel. While Azel and Laura was taking a break, they went around searching for these stashes. Some had been excavated, and some had remained intact. In the past two weeks, Azel and Laura had visited seven ruins, and three had already been excavated. How much love did Carlos have for you? Laura was baffled as she looked at what they found within the collapsed ruin. The ruin held the red magic cape, which he had worn during the Dragon Demon War. It was a cape made out of a dragon's hide. For reference, the two ruins before this one had held the true white dragon armor. 
The one that he had gained through Euron had been a replica, and it had been destroyed in the battle against Ragus. It was a truly welcoming sight to see this item. I guess a lot. That rascal should have left some of the dragon weapons for his descendants. Azel couldn't help but laugh. Carlos had been very persistent in creating these stashes. Aside from the weapons used by Azel, there were truly a lot of items hidden all over the continent. Even if he believed that Azel would return someday, wasn't this a little bit excessive? Carlos really wanted Azel to have his items again, and he had truly hated the idea of giving these items to someone else. He didn't like it even if the people, who received it, would have been descendants of either Azel or Carlos. Even in death, he makes it hard for me to raise my head. Azel had let Carlos depart this world using his own hands. The things that Carlos had arranged were helping him even at this moment. It spoke to a dedication and stubbornness that had transcended these long years. He felt a complicated emotion regarding the subject. Suddenly, Laura spoke. You look the same. Are you comparing me to how I looked during the Dragon Demon War? Laura nodded her head. Azel spoke. It does bring back old memories. If, suddenly, Laura spoke. If the king is revived. That is already a certainty. It is a matter of when. Azel had accepted the fact that a Tyne's revival as something that was going to happen. He had to think of it that way. And he had to prepare against it. What if the king moves in the manner described by Rishu? He'll turn his back on those within the plane of darkness. He'll have no plans on fighting the world. And he'll try to bring his ideal to fruition in this world. Are you asking what I would do if he moves with good intentions? Yes. I'll just send him back to his grave again. At his unhesitating answer, Laura was taken aback. When he saw her expression, Azel continued to speak. The bastard has the power to change the world his moves are so large in scale that it defies imagination. Atain was capable of changing the course of history. Azel knew this better than anyone in this era. He was a human that had experienced this truth. He had felt it in his bones. The dragon slayer's ritual. Yes, it's something that is in the realm of the gods. It wasn't such a bad idea. From the perspective of humans, it was a boon for them. Actually, it made me want to pity the dragons. Atain had created the dragon slayer's ritual, and he had reset the relationship between humans and dragons. If he hadn't done so, the population of the world might be much smaller right now. They also wouldn't have had the power to resist against the Dragon Demon General and Atain during the Dragon Demon War. Humanity would have been on their knees without the Dragon Slayer's ritual. On the other hand, the Dragon Demon War is a different story. He wanted to change the world to his ideal, so he turned the world inside out. Countless lives were lost before he realized, ah, I was wrong. I'm not going to give him the opportunity to repeat such a massive mistake. After meeting Rishu, he had thought about this problem, and this was the answer he came up with. Atain possesses massive abilities. He can overturn this world, and he is a lunatic. What if he tries to strong-arm the world into becoming like his personal ideal again? Wouldn't a tragedy like the Dragon Demon War happen once again? You are going to kill him just because of the possibility of another war. It isn't just because of the possibility. I don't plan on forgiving that bastard even if he repents. Moreover, I don't plan on believing in the good intentions of a madman. Laura closed her mouth. Azel asked her a question. It looks as if you want to say something. I am not sure. Laura furrowed her brows. According to the Orsaurus tribe, she was taught that Azel was the person that allowed the king to rewind his fate. According to Sybane's words, this was the truth. Atain started the Dragon Demon War, because he wanted to construct an ideal nation. He wanted to create a better world, so he forced the world to follow his new world order. This resulted in him taking on the role of a conqueror and an invader. However, at some point in time, Atain realized that his ideals were merely an illusion that couldn't be achieved. Atain had been very naive in wanting more from humanity and the Dragon Demons. This was why he had despaired after he had thrown the world into chaos through the Dragon Demon War. He had realized his mistake. However, it was too late to recognize his mistake, and he was no longer able to stop what he had started. Atain despaired, 
but he also tried to take responsibility. In the end, he was killed by Azel. Azel was a sword forged through the events Atain had precipitated when he tried to force his ideals on the world. By falling to Azel, Atain had earned the opportunity to turn back his wrong choice. Azel spoke, If that is true, I hate him even more. Why is that? He made a horrible mistake that embroiled the whole world. Countless people had died as a consequence. He only threw away his own life, because he knew that he would be able to start a new life. That fact makes it more unforgivable. Azel was firm in his stance. He didn't care what Atain had to say after his revival. His resolve wouldn't be shaken. The relationship between me and that bastard is already set in stone. There is no turning back for us. In fact, the events that occurred during my sleep makes me more secure in my position. This point had been agreed by Azel and Carlos. They had come to the same conclusion in their last conversation. The acts perpetrated by the plane of darkness. The remnants of his people transforming into a religiously fanatic organization after the Dragon Demon War. Atain has nothing to do with that. Ha! Bullshit! Laura, you have a habit of differentiating between the people of this era, and the beings that existed in the past. However, that isn't reasonable. Why? It was true. Laura tended to think that way. She was incensed by the actions perpetrated by the plane of darkness, but she didn't show any signs of hostility towards Almeric. He had been disguised as an elder, who had consoled her. Azel spoke. If Atain hadn't made preparations for his own revival, the plane of darkness wouldn't have been able to cause trouble to this extent. Moreover, Carlos wouldn't have had to go through the hellish period of time where he had to wait for me. If Atain had died a normal death, Azel would probably have a different opinion. However, Atain had prepared the Great Darkness and the Road of Darkness for his eventual revival. The rights to the Dragon Demon weapons of the Dragon Demon Generals and all other artifacts were given to the Plane of Darkness. It resulted in loss of knowledge like the Dragon Slayer's Ritual, and a plague called the Great Darkness. It was the worst catastrophe of this era. Atain had made arrangements for his revival, and he allowed the survivors of his followers access to his artifacts. He has to take responsibility for everything that resulted from that point on. Chapter 199. Return. Part 2. After the break ended, the party reunited within the southern border of Rulan. From the perspective of the Plane of Darkness, it was reasonable to assume that Azul's party were moving to take out the waypoints near this region. However, there were previous cases where Laura attacked a region on her own, and she had caused confusion as to where they would attack. They had to be more vigilant, so the Plane of Darkness gathered as many troops to the nearby waypoints. However, Azul's party had a totally different aim. Currently, there are 180 waypoints of the Road of Darkness left. Chiron updated his party on the current situation. While the party was reuniting, the members of the Guardian Shadows had destroyed two additional waypoints. Azel spoke, We still have a long way to go. It would be great if we had overwhelming number of troops, so we can hit each waypoint at the same time. If we had such detailed information in the Dragon Demon War, the complexion of the war would have changed. Azel let out a bitter laughter. However, when he thought about it, the waypoints didn't have as much value during that time period. The road of emptiness was the lifeline of their current enemies, because they decided to reside at the end of the world. The place was called the Plane of Darkness. It was important, because it allowed the Plane of Darkness to carry out their activities around the continent as a secret organization. If they were fighting the whole world, the road would still be a treasure, but it wouldn't be a critical loss if it was destroyed. Chiron spoke. Anyways, as of today, one more location will be destroyed for sure. Even if their goal was in a different location, this didn't mean they wouldn't use this situation to their advantage. While the enemies were concentrated in the nearby waypoints, Count Biorin Michael and the elite forces led by Dragon Demon Prince Saiga would hit a completely different location. Azel asked Arietta a question. Princess, how's your dragon soul coming along? I'm not there yet. It feels as if I'm at the cusp. I heard from Teacher and Leticia that they had that feeling before they awakened their dragon soul. In truth, I'm frustrated. It feels as if I'm of no help right now. 
Arietta became despondent after rejoining the party. It was to be expected. As the dragon demon princess, her martial abilities had been peerless. This was why she had been in charge of leading others. However, every one of her party members possessed terrifying abilities. So much so that she worried that she was being a burden to them. Azel spoke. You have been of great help to us already. From our perspective, you are a truly a valuable addition to our party. Him. Your words does soothe my feelings, but if I look at it coldly, I know that I won't be of much help if I don't awaken my dragon soul. It might have been better if I was a magician. She had such thoughts when she looked at Euron. It was true that Euron was much inferior in terms of magical energy compared to his comrades. He had the hidden card where he could summon and fuse with a demon, but this method carried a significant risk. Still, as a high-ranked magician, Yours abilities couldn't be compared to a dragon arts practitioner with similar magical energy. He was able to fight and support at the same time. This aspect of his abilities had wide utilization. Azel spoke. It probably won't take you too much longer to awaken the dragon soul. Even when you learned from me, you were an exceptional student. I'm feeling better. Were you popular with women, because you possess a smooth tongue? It wasn't really. I heard about how you were like during the Dragon Demon War. I never expected you to have so many descendants. It was truly surprising. Azul's smiling face froze in place. He discreetly glared at Chiron. Chiron had a devilish smile on his face. My teacher cautioned me about giving my heart to you. He put his heart and soul into making this entreaty. He argued the point by telling me the number of women you brought to tears. Duke. I'm just telling her the truth. I respect the legendary hero Azel Karzak, but you are a lecher that made countless women cry. I want to prevent the possibility of my precious student's heart getting hurt. I want to stop the possibility at the root. Moreover, Arietta became part of our party, so I believed she had the right to hear the truths about the Guardian Shadow. When Chiron replied in a cheeky manner, Azel started to shake. The problem was the fact that he knew he couldn't say anything even if he had ten mouths. Arietta broke out into laughter. You don't have to be too worried, Sir Azel. I don't see you as a fast-living playboy that throws caution to the winds. Your words are quite comforting. Azel grumbled to himself. The goal of Azel's party was to destroy the Pillar of the Great Darkness. Currently, they had destroyed three pillars. Before the Nadic Empire fell, Carlos had defeated transcendent dragon demon Ixeru. She was the first to create the dragon demon weapon, and she was the first pillar to fall. The king of death, Belrun had been sealed by Carlos, but when Azel killed him, the second pillar was destroyed. Moreover, Azel and Laura had killed a being called the Metal King. He possessed the ability to change anything into metal, and he believed that he could achieve eternal life through this ability. There are nine pillars left, according to what Carlos had found out. The Great Darkness had twelve seals that acted as pillars. However, this didn't mean Carlos knew all their location and true nature. He had been sure about five locations. We have four targets we have to destroy. However, only three are realistic targets for us. One of the four targets was located in the bitter cold region in the north. Basically, it was located within the plane of darkness. At this point in time, it was a location they couldn't assault. Even without that one, the Great Darkness won't come out unscathed when we destroy half of the Twelve Pillars. Even if half of the Pillars were lost, the Great Darkness wouldn't collapse. It was too massive and old for the magic system to fail. However, it was possible to weaken its functionality. The proof was seen when Belrun died. The Guardian Shadows were no longer beings with eternal life. Chiron spoke. If I let my emotions dictate my actions, I want to immediately go to the plane of darkness. I want to destroy them right now. I understand your sentiments. Please quell your anger. Azel tried to soothe him. The pillar within the plane of darkness had a deep connection with Chiron. God of Pestilence Lemurs. The dragon demon king worshippers used this god's artifact to bring about the plague called the Great Darkness. Chiron grinded his teeth when it came to this being. Suddenly, Arietta spoke. I can believe it's this place again. It seems we have a close relationship with this land. 
I guess so. Azel agreed with her. The party was standing within the Balran forest, which was located in the western region of the Rulan kingdom. It was a vast demonic land where humans dared not tread. It was the perfect place for a pillar of the great darkness to exist. It made sense for it to exist in this place. But Azel and Arietta truly had mixed feelings from their perspective. Everything had started here when Azel woke up from his sleep, which spanned for 220 years. He met Giles, then Arietta. They had fought dragon demon king worshippers, and their deeds were worthy of being made into stories. As time passed, Arietta returned to this location for the second time, and she had stopped the second great alliance of darkness. Moreover, she went through the dragon slayer's ritual for the first time in her life. Still, both of them never expected to fight on this land again with their lives on the line. Azel was the last to speak. Our last opponent, the Steel King, wasn't that terrifying however, one cannot look down upon the defensive measures prepared by Atane. The members of his party nodded their heads. This was especially true for Laura, since she had felt the fear of Atane's defensive measure to her bones. She was clearly tense. According to the information given to them by Carlos, the being sealed in this place was called the God of Trees. This being was able to accelerate the growth of trees by several thousandfold. He had tried to cover the whole world with trees that could move like animals. He was defeated by Atane and his comrades, and he had been sealed in this location. It might also be the reason why the vast Balran forest had formed here. Suddenly, Azel stopped walking. Is it here? They had no trouble reaching the location of the seal. The Balran forest was called the Demonic Land but Azel's party was too powerful. They also used the magic eye to scout their surrounding, so they were able to avoid most fights. When a clash with monsters and demonic animals were inevitable, they dispatched them swiftly. If the western border guard knew about this, they would have fainted. Azel's party were deep with the forest. Even those that were called experts of the Balran forest never came in this far. Laura nodded her head. Here, at a glance, it was a wide open space with nothing there. However, she was sure this was the place. Within the magic tome given to her by Carlos, the method to find this pillar of darkness was written there. Laura had used this method to find this specific location. Azel spoke. I'm stumped. I don't think I can use the method where I overturn the earth. Our options are quite limited. I guess we have no choice. Azel took one deep breath and he started circulate his dragon demon magic. A frightening wave of dragon demon magic was emitted from him, and their surroundings started to shake. Azul's party stopped breathing. Whenever I see it, it is unbelievable. Chiron mumbled his words. In the past, he had never fallen behind others in terms of dragon demon magic. After he awakened his dragon soul, his power had been amplified significantly. However, the amount of power being emitted by Azel was oppressive. Could this really be power that a human possesses? Azel's party wasn't the only one that reacted to Azel's display of power. The entire region went nuts. The surprised birds flew into the air, and the beasts ran away. This was what Azel had been aiming for. He wanted to chase away any living beings before the fight started. Well, I want everyone to take a step back. He had finished dual banding his eight rings of life, and they were resonating. The magical energy generated from the rings were extremely close in nature as dragon demon magic. The magical energy filled his energy pulse, then it overflowed to wash over the surrounding. In the middle of the sky, the sky splitter was streaking through the air in its light form. The sky started splitting, and enormous branches of light stretched out into the sky. It was such an enormous phenomena that the western border guard, who were far away, could see it. Still, he was able to complete his sun lightsaber without any impediment. He didn't plan on steadily going towards the heart of the seal. He had done so last time, and he had experienced an epic failure when he triggered the defensive measures left behind by Atane. This time he'll blow it all away. He'll pierce to the center before the magic devices protecting the seal could activate. If one considered the target was deep within the ground, it was an illogical idea. However, it was possible if Laura's power was used in conjunction. 
Laura was concentrating as she held the Vitten's chalice. She spoke. I found it. She found the seal, which existed deep within the ground. Azel was ready to shoot the sun lightsaber at any moment. He spoke. Can you open a path to it? I'm sorry. I can only reach halfway. Azel wanted her to use the path of tears to open a direct path to the seal. However, Laura determined that it was impossible to do this. The defensive magic left behind by Atane was too strong. It was even cutting off the dimensional distortion created by the Vitten's chalice. I'll have to apologize one more time. What happened? The defensive magic is starting to awaken. When the dimensional distortion came in contact with it, we attack immediately. Azel was unconcerned. It wasn't as if he hadn't thought about this possibility. Laura had attempted to use her magic to search and analyze the being below. And of course, he hadn't expected a Tyne's barrier magic to be unresponsive to such a probe. The defensive magic is 270 meters deep. It was so deep that it made one wonder how one was supposed to reach that place. Moreover, the seal was located deeper than the defensive magic. Laura's expression hardened as she spoke. I can no longer locate the exact location of the seal. It doesn't matter. We have to bring down its defense. That part is more dangerous. Laura nodded her head. As she retreated, the ground became distorted. She used the dimensional distortion to create a tunnel that led deep underground. Then, the pure white light connected the sky to the ground as everything burned. Chapter 200. Return. Part 3. Three people were flying high in the sky. They were on a bird with long wings, and it was made of white flame. That is, in the very far distance, the sky looked as if it was in tatters as it burned. It couldn't be explained as a natural phenomena. It was producing overwhelmingly more power than a storm. Him. This is the first time I've seen this phenomena. However, I have this odd feeling that I've seen it before. Did you have a sense of deja vu? You speak as if you've seen this. It is weird. The voice next to him spoke up. The first voice voice answered the second voice. Maybe I've seen it before. I see. However, something unknown to me is happening within that. It is quite interesting. I want to go there quickly, and I want to see what is going on. This isn't the time to be so happy. By the look of things, we were a step too late. It can't be helped. It's damage that we have to tolerate. Aren't you being too relaxed right now? It's just one of those things that we can't do anything about. That point about you is still the same. Him. It's still the same. I should be happy about that. I'm not sure if I'll be the same after all of this. The first voice laughed. The laughter was buried by the flaps of the wings. The laughter was dispersed into the faraway blue sky. Azel had manifested his sky splitter, and he had used the sun lightsaber. He caused a phenomenon called the extreme extinction. Azel could be in his peak condition, yet the extreme extinction didn't occur every time he used the sun lightsaber. Several troublesome prerequisites had to be fulfilled for the manifestation of the extreme extinction. The sun lightsaber had to be focused at a specific location, and high pressure had to be created. These conditions were a must. Azel clicked his tongue. I failed. Shit. He hadn't failed in manifesting the extreme extinction. However, he did fail in destroying his target. The problem was the fact that his target had been too deep below the surface. If his target had been in a mountain like Belrun, he would have blown up the entire mountain. He would have let the power of the sunlight's word radiate outwards to cause an enormous explosion. However, he didn't know what was down there. If he caused an explosion in the deep underground, it could result in a calamitous result. If he was lucky, it would cause earthquakes in the nearby regions. What would happen if he was unlucky? The earthquake could hit the southern border guard pretty hard, and it could cause volcanic activities. The consequences of detonating an explosion above ground differed from causing one underground. This was why Azel had concentrated his power to finish the extreme extinction. He had no choice. The sun lightsaber's extreme extinction destroyed everything within its range. However, a problem arose from the fact that the range wasn't that large. It destroyed part of Atine's barrier magic, but the barrier magic had immediately re-established itself. Chiron spoke when he felt the enormous amount of magic energy swell from below the ground. 
Let's think positively. At least, we aren't on a fool's errand. It might have been better if there had been nothing here. Leticia grumbled. Open dragon soul. She didn't hesitate as she awakened her dragon soul. The image of a green dragon appeared, and the nearby temperature started to drop precipitously. When Chiron awakened his dragon soul, strong winds swirled around him. The two of them moved to the opposite ends of each other. Arietta spoke. I've heard the descriptions, but they are amazing. Still, I don't think we'll be able to end this fight quickly. The problem was the fact that Azul's party couldn't fight a long battle. They weren't equipped to do so. If one extrapolated from the last incident, it seemed Almeric and Ainsera didn't really know much about the pillars. However, it was also a possible that they became aware of the pillars through the last incident. Azul's party had to fight with the worst possible scenario in mind. They had to exit this place as soon as possible after destroying the sealed being. Euron, who had been focusing on his detection magic, spoke. I've located the location of the seal. It isn't good, Azel. The seal was broken. Correct. However, there is also a good news. What is it? It is as you've said. Part of the barrier magic have started attacking the being that was released from the seal. The defensive magic prepared by Atain was put in place to protect the seal. Of course, it would try to reseal the being if the being broke free from the seal. That is good news. Let's end the tree god before he become wise to this world. Come dragon weapon. Chain of the earth dragon. Azel manifested his dragon weapon. It was an enormous chain made out of some unknown black substance. During the dragon demon war, this was only dragon weapon that could go toe to toe with Ragus's soul hammer. It was like the earth dragon, who were capable of controlling the earth. Azel gained the ability to freely move his chain. It was as if the chain in Azel's hand was dancing. It was three times as thick as a person's finger, and it was several hundred meters long. It straightened out into the sky, then. It arced in the air before it attacked a certain point in the ground. It shook as it dug into the earth. The chain of the earth dragon was like an earth dragon. It was capable of freely moving through the earth. It was capable of killing any monsters that were called out by the defensive magic, and at the same time, it could create a tunnel for its allies. Soon, darkness poured out of the large hole in the ground. It possessed an incredible amount of magical energy, and one could see monsters forming within it. These monsters looked familiar and unfamiliar at the same time. Azel spoke. Well, let's go. His words were like a starting bell. Azel's party started fighting the unknown monsters. All the immortal beings, who had lost to Atain, possessed abilities that transcended the logic of this world. They possessed extreme power. They all believed that their power was meant to change the world. It was true that the world was a mess so they wanted to change the world into something they considered to be right. The undead king wanted to change everyone into an undead, so the world would no longer suffer from death and illness. The steel king wanted to change everyone into living metal. No one would have to suffer from death or decline in health. Then there was the tree god. I have to bring peace to the world. The god of trees wanted a world without war. He wanted peace. Was nature, which was unsullied by humans, peaceful. It wasn't. All beings of nature fought desperately to live. Every being fought to live, and they tried to leave behind their progenies. This was the case for animals and plants. Even small creatures like bugs followed the laws of nature. It was the survival of the fittest. Would covering the whole world with trees bring peace? At the very least, the god of the trees believed that. There weren't that many existence in nature that possessed wisdom. Aside from humans and the dragon demon race, the number was extremely low. However, they were all the source of the disorder in this world. When strong desire and wisdom mixed, irrational results occurred. Humans were able to imagine and carry out irrational deeds. They were also able to have emotions. They destroyed other species to build up their civilization, and they perverted the laws of magic. They even changed the laws of nature that had existed since the birth of the world. For example, the relationship between the humans and the dragons had been changed. Both the dragons and humans had overwhelming greed, but they now possessed the wisdom and power to carry out their greed. 
This was why he was going to turn the beings of desire into trees. Trees loved peace and harmony. If he changed every being into trees, everything under the laws of nature would become peaceful. Attain. The tree god remembered the being that had defeated him. The time he spent sealed was like a dream to him. He had become part of the great darkness, and the fragments of thoughts from other beings brushed by his consciousness. It had been a very peaceful sleep. It was a sleep where he had forgotten all about his desires, humiliation and anger. He hadn't even had the motivation to wake up. This was why he had been asleep in this place for a very long time. When he realized this truth, his anger burned. The ground shook. The trees on the surface responded to his will. He could accelerate the growth of trees accelerated by several thousand folds. The trees under his control could move faster and stronger than animals. The god of trees ascended to the surface using the big hole that had been created. It happened at that moment. A sword made out of blue lightning pierced him. In a flash, the sword left an ugly scar on the ground, and it flew back up into the sky. It was a devastating lightning attack. His body was broken into pieces. However, it was useless. Who are you? The god of trees queried his attacker. A young human male with red hair was glaring at him. He held a blue sword that was surrounded by lightning. Shit. He is called the god of trees. It seems he is fine after having his body destroyed. The red-haired young man mumbled to himself. The tree god's body had been unbelievably easy to destroy. However, tree roots gathered from all directions, and they coalesced to form the tree god's body again. He was a tree that had taken on the form of a human. His whole body was made out of wood, and there were many branches, leaves, grass and moss covering him. He was a strange sight to behold. Urin mumbled. It seems we were prudent in removing most of the trees here. I'm glad our work wasn't in vain. Leticia sounded tired as she spoke. This location had been overgrown with trees. However, an earthquake and a storm had swept through this region. The destruction had reached a radius of several kilometers. It was a mess. Azul's party had done this. The party focused on destroying their surrounding as they fought the monsters summoned by Atine's defensive magic. The tree god possessed the ability to freely control trees. There were many trees nearby, so this location would allow him to maximize his power if they hadn't done anything. The tree god tilted his head in puzzlement. You aren't Atain. Instead of speech, the tree god spoke through mental waves. He looked at his surrounding as he spoke. Who the hell are you? Why are they running away? Azel was about 50 meters away as he faced off against the god of trees. His comrades had run away as soon as they saw the god of trees had regenerated from Azel's attack. They were acting as if a monster was chomping at their heels. Azel grumbled. If you had come out a little bit later, I would have ended you for good. You are making this more complicated than it has to be. He had been fighting a Tyne's defensive magic, so he hadn't been able to prepare his sun lightsaber. However, they had used their fight to destroy the forest. They were successful in destroying most of the trees that could be used by the tree god. The tree god spoke. You are quite smart. Are you related to Atain? You seem to know a lot about me. Azel didn't answer him. He didn't plan on wasting his words on the tree god. He had to destroy the tree god as soon as possible, and he had to exit this region. This was why he focused on his senses. I see. It seems he does have a real body. The tree god had his body completely destroyed, yet the had regenerated himself through the roots of the trees. This alerted Azel to something. He possessed an attack called extreme extermination, but he wouldn't be able to destroy his enemy if he didn't know where to direct his attack. If the tree god didn't have a weak point, it would be an absolute disaster. However, when Azel concentrated, he was able to find the nuclei of the tree god. It was moving along the tree god's blood vessels like blood. Very small marbles holding his power was circulating through his body at high speeds. I can kill him. When his body was destroyed a moment ago, the tree god had moved the nuclei into various parts of his destroyed body. Then he called the leftover trees to reconstruct his body. When Azel became aware of this process, he became sure that he would be able to kill the tree god. Come dragon weapons. Unyielding Fortress. 
Earth Dragon's Chain. Master of Raging Waves. He summoned his dragon weapons in succession, and his body was divided into several dozen clones. He had used the Dance of the Shadows, and his clones were identical to him. Each of them possessed a presence. They all ran through the air. The tree god titled his head in puzzlement. What an interesting trick. A human is capable of doing such a feat. Atain was capable of using incarnation, and the tree god had fought against Atain. It seemed the tree god had been sealed for a very long time. It must have been a period in history when Atain hadn't been able to use incarnation yet. Maybe, they had fought before the technique called incarnation was created. The earth dragon's chain swept over the region. A massive amount of soil surrounded the tree god, and it attacked like a tsunami. This is child's play. The mental wave being emitted by the tree god was cut short. The sight in front of the tree god's eyes became distorted, and he felt a terrifying amount of pressure shake him violently. It was as if his body and mind was being assaulted by a wave. It felt as if he was being tossed by the sea. It was an attack from the dragon weapon called the Master of Raging Waves. The current created by the dragon weapon was able to attack physically and it was capable of blowing away the flow of magical energy. It was capable of putting pressure on the spirit. Azel shot above the soil. He pointed towards the sky as he spoke. I don't know if you know this. It was truly a gesture full of meaning. So the tree god looked upwards. His eyes widened. A part of the sky was being distorted in a strange way. It was as if an enormous drop of water was floating in the air. What is that? By looking at your reaction, you know nothing. Your body will soon find out what it is. Azel snorted as his body dissolved into light. It had been his clone. Then, the enormous dimensional distortion floating in the sky changed shape. The sunlight had been gathered from the heavens and it became an attack that couldn't be avoided. The attack poured down on the tree god.